The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. I saw this like on. Be one of us. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell them my name. Hello and welcome to the podcast on Haunted Hill, episode 87. 1987 was the year I actually got into hip-hop. Did you know that? 1987. So this 87 87 episodes, wow. Uh, I am your host, Gav. I'm with another co-host, Dan. We're also with another co-host. Yay. Who's that, Dan? Hello, Kate. Hi. Um, So we've got Kate on this episode, Kate Pollock, um, who is one of our friends and one of my colleagues and one of our listeners. And... Uh, we've got her on because the theme of this episode, Gavin, is is uh, it's women, isn't it? It's all women delayed. In horror. Uh, yeah, every month of the year. If you do not know this, you probably should do. Or if you listen to this show, I'm sure you do. Um, February is generally Women in Horror Month <clears throat> uh, each year, where we celebrate women. In the workplace of uh, film books, <laughs> workplace. Well, well, well. Like, is in like the film industry. I mean, is in like um, uh, women were always kind of a little bit. Not nowadays. I'm glad in the last you know ten, fifteen years it got better. But obviously, women were very much um, uh, like uh, you can't be a filmmaker. You can't, yeah. you know, or, or you can you can be in our film because you got big tits. Uh, but when you get to thirty, you're out. You know, yeah. um, luckily we've got better than that in the world, and people like Harvey Weinstein are going down, and he got coronavirus, didn't yeah. he? <laughs> he did get coronavirus, Gab. Your prediction was correct. Yeah, I said I hope he gets coronavirus in prison. So there we go. Um, anyway, Can you uh, for like a million pounds because that would be so great. <laughs> Can you? <laughs> I don't know if all of Gab's predictions are going to come true, but um... I'll try and predict some cool stuff today. Um, uh, so uh, yeah so we're talking uh, women and so we got what films have we got Dan we are doing uh, the 2018 version of Suspiria Um, and we are also because that is an all female cast pretty much Um, and we are also looking at The Descent which is another all female cast Uh, very good creepy uh, horror movie there Um, so that's what we're going to be covering Um, so before we get into it, before we catch up, um, two things we should probably address. One of them is Kate. Hello, Kate. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, I kind of shoehorned my way into it, I'm not going <laughs> to lie, but um, I sort of cornered down at work and I was like, this is going to happen. No, I didn't. Not that bad. Yeah, well, I mean, um, you, you did suggest both. Well, you suggested to Spirit. Yeah, um, because and I'd, that completely had slipped my mind that I just how female centric that, that movie is, um, mm-hmm. uh, and and all the sort of the symbolism in it and stuff as well. So yeah, no, you definitely yeah. did, and and I know that you really love that movie. Uh, I really and, do. And you know your stuff when it comes to women, obviously being one, but also horror uh, and women in horror. So we figured let's get a female voice on. Yeah, I, I actually before. had to look up what feminism was in the dictionary um because i i didn't really know because you used to have that term thrown around oh god she's a feminist i was just like oh i was like oh what is that then and now i looked up and it's like it's a woman that wants equal rights like oh there really shouldn't be a word feminism there should just be equal rights there shouldn't be a thing why do we even need a f- uh, women in horror month really women should just be in horror all year round it shouldn't be even a thing that's well, yeah but it's always like as well with like why do we need a pride festival why do we need because unfortunately there still is a lot of i um, I, under, I totally understand why we need them so we still have to say to people look <laughs> you know it's here um i understand why it's just ridiculous that we do need it because of these people but anyway um yeah that's quite funny so what else is going on people what have you been doing because there's something going on in the world we don't like to time stamp it but well, you know, there's been a worldwide pandemic shutting the world down. So this has been quite strange. There's been lots more 
podcast or less podcast there's been lots more of these celebrities doing things at home i did i did a live dj gig the other night here which i've never done before um yeah what's going on in the world well the coronavirus has hit um which all of our listeners will know about i'm sure because it's literally the biggest thing to happen probably since the war uh and it's not great uh it's meant yeah, it's like you say, Gav, a lot of people are doing more things online. We're very lucky to live in um, a world and a generation where we can do so much online with the technology we've got. It has meant that I am particularly busy now with work. I'm classed as a key worker, supporting vulnerable adults. So it does mean that my job has got about five times busier, uh, which is why we haven't put out more podcasts. I would love to have actually been able to, you know, take advantage of a terrible situation and put out more episodes but i've just been so snowed under the last couple of weeks yeah and i've been, been homeschooling really... three children so exactly but and, and yeah. kate kate you've been in um self-isolation haven't you how did you find yeah. that yeah um well i am yeah i was in such a, just so you guys are not concerned i'm fine um, I just <laughs> off. um but um yeah so i was yeah i was in self-isolation it was hard because it was before the lockdown so like not that I, not that I go out tons being a mother, um, but to have that kind of option just removed from me completely, not even being able to go to the shop or anything like that, um, was really quite hard because um, you know I don't know um, Dan how much experience you have with staying with kids all the time, but Gav, I'm sure you know like you know staying in the house with an infant 24/7, it's tiring. I can imagine. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and not having like really the option of escape and um, without like my partner taking over um it was just sort of like you know i couldn't just be like oh let's go out to the park or let's pop to the shops um luckily we do have a, a quite a big back garden so I've been so fortunate with that um but yeah it was it was hard but you know just caught up on podcasts watched some movies had some like i, I you know i enjoyed my time with my kid and just took advantage of that um and you know tried not to go insane with it <laughs> yeah, yeah totally. my, my house has got painted five times quicker which has been quite good <laughs> and i think yeah. that's it we're, we're very, very lucky to be able to take advantage of a terrible situation in such a way you know i think the for me what will come out of this is i think you're going to see a lot of people's mental health be affected probably just as greatly it's, as people's physical health it's, yeah. a, it's a traumatic event which um uh for you got to think of the people have already got anxiety and depression anyway yeah. um uh being locked in is gonna fuck them up um some like my daughter who's almost 13 she she's just happy as anything so like, i don't want to go out yes i was like you can have an hour of sunshine i don't want to go out i'd rather stay inside <laughs> so like there you go so you have got the side of people who are quite happy doing this and yeah. there is going to be positives that do come from it you are gonna have a lot of work for saying to their bosses look we can work from home i don't need to sit in london traffic or whatever you do um, yeah. We can just stay at home. Why don't we do that? Because that saves you renting out uh, buildings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are going to have a massive change in the world. Um, the entertainment business and like, as in like sports, films, musical, that's going to have a massive knock-on effect uh, with a delayed. Ec- well, it's already an uh, economic impact, but it's going to be a delayed economic impact, which is going to last longer. Which is funny because I wonder what we're going to have. Are we all of a sudden then in a year's time have a massive splurge of new films and music or or not mm-hmm. music as much but movies and like we can go back to cinema all of a sudden it's like oh shit look at the listings or what's it going to be or we can have a knock on effect yeah. but we won't have movies for a few years you know well don't forget that although movies specifically are getting delayed they're also not being made it's not like they're all being made are they being backed yeah. up because a lot of them are being cancelled or, or put on hiatus so I just think everything's going to be there's going to be this gap of maybe six months um, yeah. where there's just going to be nothing and then all those movies will come out so it'll be like the, the lost six months where nothing really happens yeah did you guys um, hear about that uh, filmmaker who made this real B budget, low sort of yeah, uh, low mud, um, budget movie called, about coronavirus, and he cracked it out in about two months and put it online. Oh my god! Um, no. Yeah, um, I can't remember what it was called. I saw an article about it, and like, you just think there's just going to be such a wave of these kind of movies coming out. I know, um, that's why I'm not starting to write a bloody movie about <laughs> virus. It's like, oh God, who's going to want us? Everyone's going to like, yeah, we lived that, we knew that. Yes, yes, it's a movie about We're being stuck get, in like, your house. Uh, 28 you know. days later, 
the lockdown. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Oh, but um, I heard about Jared Leto. Uh, he was in a, a like a, a retreat where he was like not speaking to a single person, uh, not having communication with the outside world. Oh, well, then he came back to it. Medit- meditating and all of that stuff. And then after two weeks of not saying a word out loud and feeling fantastic and everything, he sort of drove back into civilization and there was just no one around. And he was like, what the fuck is going what? on? And what? he didn't know about any of this. Well, how about oh those? How about the German Big Brother house? That's ah, fucking amazing. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that. Uh, German Big Brother house. Um, uh, the people were already in there. They did have two extra people when it first kicked off. They had two extra people who went in there, but they said, oh, just don't tell them about the virus. It'll be fine. You know, it's still in China. Then they went in there. Then loads of public were saying, you've got to let them know. And they were in the house going, la, la, la. And then they found out and they were crying and they were in shock and stuff like that. Because oh they would have thought... They thought I'm it was a joke. They would have, yeah, they would have thought it's one of the tasks, you know, yeah. let's pretend that the world outside's ended. No, 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 we're serious, guys. There's a pandemic across the world. <laughs> the world is locked down. Uh, two-thirds of the school members are out of school, you know. It's hilarious. Crazy. It's, you, oh, wouldn't know. you wouldn't believe it. It's it's just so crazy. Like, I mean, I went to Tesco's on, like, my first day out of self-isolation. I'm going to shops, and I... Because I hadn't seen it for two weeks, there was this like massive just surge of people suddenly taking it seriously compared to when I initially had to go home, um, and then when I came out again, and like we were all having to you know queue with like space like space of like two meters between us. Um, everyone was wearing gloves and those masks, yeah. and you know we weren't allowed to go to certain areas of the shop. We had to all space out. I. Oh my goodness, I had this like psychosomatic kind of scenario where I just kept needing to cough. And every time I just, <laughs> I was trying to like repress it because people Don't were just like, so alarmed just because I cleared my fucking throat. Um, and of course, it just kept happening because I was so aware of it. Um, and, it and I was just looking around, and I was like, this is literally like something out of like some dystopian movie. Like, I want, I want to watch these movies, I want to read these books, I do not want to live it. Yeah. yeah. Everyone said that to me initially. Oh, Dan, you must be loving this. You get to stay and watch horror movies, and it's just like all your favourite zombie movies, isn't it? And I'm like, look, exactly what you just said, Kate. I fucking love those movies. And I always say, oh, yeah, join a zombie epidemic. I'll be all right. I don't actually want to be in a fucking zombie epidemic. I don't no. want to be in the end of the world. No, when, uh, <laughs> so, so I always get it once in a while. Someone send me, like, a really disgusting, like, thing. Someone's hurt themselves, a video. Look at that, Gav. Look at his pictures. I, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see someone's head chopped off. Like, I like it in a movie. <laughs> I don't want it in real- Reality. This is why I like the movies. Do people not understand this? There is that difference. It's not like we're psychopaths no. because we like to watch people getting killed for entertainment. I like artistically really? these things, not, yeah. not like Jesus Christ. So yeah, like two weeks ago, I was up at Sarah's. The uh, uh, last time we sort of saw each other until we still haven't until this lockdown sort of eases. And it was a bit like looking at news coming in. It wasn't like every day. It was like every hour. You refresh your news, and it's like shit. This is just amped up, 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 up. And the media didn't help at all. But up and up. So you oh, have to find, you have to find your your sources. I found Twitter to be quite reliable, actually, for news. Anyway, uh, and it goes up and up and up and up and up and up. And uh, it was just like, oh my god, this is actually like, like I don't know when we can see each other again. And there's actual fear, like you had like a serial killer was out there or something, and it could kill you at any moment. It was yeah. just like, what the fuck? And the the that must. It was a whole world I mean, consciousness it is. It's like of Michael it. Michael Myers looking around the head, and you, you don't know, know where it is, and if it's going to get you. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, is. Okay. Invisible killer. Uh, yeah, cool. absolutely insane. So it's luckily we've we're sort of we're not getting ahead yet. It's still on a steep up. We've got to flatten that curve, but we will get there. But anyway. <laughs> Let's get off talking about it, I think. Well, I just yeah. wanted to very, have a very quick, uh, honestly, and, and you know, heartfelt from, from us three to, to everybody listening and, and all of our, all of your friends and families and everybody. I just, we just wish you all safety. And yeah. don't, if you haven't heard already, stay the fuck inside. Yeah. Stay just don't go out. Home. Please look after yourselves because it's crazy, crazy times. Well, there we go. Dan, Dan <laughs> said, "If Dan said, any listeners that stay in, if you message him privately, he will send you pictures of himself. I don't know what those pictures are. I'm just yeah, throwing it out there. It could be any sort. It might be like 
your, your raffle or bingo, you put your hand in your box, you pull out a picture. Oh, is it Dan in his pants? Is it Dan in without pants? So you're not going to know what you're going to... So if you could stay inside, prove options. yourself you stayed inside, Dan will send you pictures of himself, okay? Just send him send him messages, gonna... guys, all right? Brilliant. <laughs> right, so, Kate, very quickly, Kate, why do you love horror? You know, how do you get into it? Just very okay. quickly, give us a shout about, you know, you and horror and what it is you love about horror. Um, so I cannot really remember a time in my life where horror wasn't part of it in some kind of fashion. My uncle is basically to blame. Um, my so is my uncle. Kid. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> um, yes, it's those, those crazy uncles that, you know, corrupt you. But, oh, God, that sounded... That sounded <laughs> awful. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no! Oh, God. Not like that. Um, no, no, no. He uh, he just he didn't have any kids of his own. So and I've put, got something like, to show you, Billy. Come here, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Pete. Um, but no, the, uh, he doesn't have any kids, and because and he, he didn't want any kids, so he kind of he kind of put all of the stuff if he was going to have kids, he definitely would have watched this stuff with them. So he kind of put it all on me. Um, so he got me into. Like we were watching like monster movies and like, like stuff like Jurassic Park and um, the the Blob and all of this kind of stuff from a very young age, much to my mother's horror. Um, and then so when um, I really started to kind of get a bit older, sort of like eight nine years old, and I had like started to kind of get a concept of what I liked and not just stuff that people were showing me. Um, a, an advert for a little TV show you may have heard of it, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah, I knew you were going to mention this. <laughs> came up. Well, I mean, how can I not? Um, it might pop up a little bit later on as well. Um, but yeah, so I think I was about nine when that came out. And that for me was just, wow, like nothing else I'd ever really seen. Like I'd seen some stuff, but like I wasn't old enough for things like um, Lost Boys or like, you know, from Dust or Dawn or anything like that. Um, so vampires are still quite a new mythology for me and so i basically grew up with that law from then on um me and my mum would sit down and watch it together you know bbc2 6 p.m on a thursday night my dad would come in for work we'd just shut him out and be like no dinner's in the oven bugger off um and then as i got older um i well actually when i was about that same age actually i watched my first horror movie like proper horror uh was scream yeah scared me shitless uh I should not have watched it. <laughs> I was of a very sensitive disposition. How, when I was how old? How old are you? Because like eight. Oh, okay. Oh, Jesus Christ! Yeah, because yeah, I'm with Jasmine. Like she's um she's 13 soon, and like tonight she's always said to me, "Can we watch a horror movie?" And I'm like, "Yeah." So I've been fucking loving watching horror movies with her, which you will have as well. And I can't um, uh, and it's good to know what ages you were, but because uh, she's 13, I'm still going through what I can let her watch. I'm letting her watch 15s, but I'm not doing the 18s yet, even though I could watch anything, not you. But you're, you were eight with Scream. I was eight, yeah. So um, it was I was at a friend's sleepover and her older sister had rented it with her friend. Gosh. And we all crept downstairs. It was like 11 p.m. Everyone had gone to bed apart from the two older girls. And we crept downstairs and they're like, right, not allowed to tell mum. Can't tell mum. We're like, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. We all shut a fucking brick. Um, yeah. And I couldn't sleep without the light on for an embarrassingly long amount of time afterwards. I think like two weeks or something afterwards. Um, but from then I was just like, give it to me. You know, yeah. like I was obsessed and it's just it's kind of just gone on from there and like i was very because i think that was my because that was my first introduction like i just kind of stuck with slashes for a while and then as i've gotten older and i've got like more of a an appreciation i took film studies at college um and um we looked at a little bit into horror there um and from then on my, my kind of uh, sensibilities on it has just sort of expanded and i'm you know, these last kind of like few five years, I've just kind of got really into art house, um, been getting into Jallo and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's just sort of grown, but I can't wait to start doing all this with Ava. I mean, you guys have probably seen I've posted like of taking her to baby screens of things like Mandy and the news this year. <laughs> <I> <laughs> and she's just like, like we have like I have these movies on at home, and like she's just like playing with her 
The well, you, you've only got you've only got a, a few years. You can do that until she becomes more conscious, obviously, and then you can't yeah. because I then you have wary. to have a massive gap of her not until you can start get, talk about makeup and stuff, and that's then you get into the behind yeah. the scenes. Um, Jay mm. used to have to watch uh, yeah. the making ofs on movies after she watched a movie to make it feel better for herself. Yeah, I get that totally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I t- if it's too screamy, then I don't put it on. But if it's more about like body horror, she doesn't really know what she's looking at yet, so yeah, I can get away with, with that still. Yeah, totally. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So that's all about me. Cool. Uh, glad you like Sweet. horror. We all like horror, don't we? We do. That's why we do the podcast. I like it. Um, yeah. Shall we? What do you want to do? There's no. I don't see. We could reel off a fucking million lists of everything we've watched because it could be fucking. Is there anything? Anybody watch anything which is because you know me. I forget everything I watch. I watched something yesterday and I forget <laughs> what it is. Um, has anybody watched anything specifically which is like one or two things which is like you've got to check this out if you're in isolation? Uh, I'm just gonna very quickly remind myself. Don't go myself, through the whole think, thing because it'd be forever. Yeah, no, I'm not. I did watch Dracula. I finally caught up on that because I know that was something what, everyone was oh, yeah. watching. What, what Dracula? Ago. Oh, the TV show. Yeah. Yeah, um, the I thought BBC it was one, fucking yeah. terrible. The, well, the first two episodes are amazing. Third episode rubbish. Yeah. I don't think the first episode was that good. I actually thought the second episode. <laughs> was second, the second on the boat episode. was yeah, the boat one. That was really good. And that was an isolation I was episode. Happy with the first two. The uh, the first the third one. Yeah, I mean, it shut the bed, but um, <laughs> the, the first two, I could watch the first two and just stop it there. Yeah, you yeah, know, like... yeah. I said that to Dan, but as he said, well, you know me, I, I like to go follow through with it all. So it's like, well, yeah. I like to follow through. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, oh, I've really got to well, pick to. Thinks I'm in these in, that's not going to happen. I'm just as bad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've not watched anything new. To be honest with you, it's just been pretty manic here. Um, have you guys seen anything brand I, new? I've watched loads of stuff, but I've been watching lots of different things. I've been watching comedies and all sorts. Um, funny enough, I managed to sort out all my DVDs and all my books and everything, and I've got a massive pile over there of movies where I'm like, shit, that's in my collection. <laughs> I've still not even seen that. Corona? Have you got the Corona? Oh, God. She's got the <laughs> Corona! <laughs> Got to try That's what my kids keep saying. As soon as I cough, they go, Corona, don't get near me. It's like, oh, for God's sake. Did you hear about those twins in India that have been called Corona yes. and COVID? Oh, it's my so God. mean. It's that, just... That, why would you want them to be named after... Because, it's so because social media will give you some likes. That's why. I said to Alice, imagine if I had a son and I said, oh, have you met my son, Luke? Oh, what's... Oh, Luke, come here. His full name's Leukemia. <laughs> I you thought you'd say Skywalker. You? Yeah, I was thinking Skywalker. Leukemia Skywalker. Kima. Kimia. That's a strange middle name. What's your first name? Luke. Luke. I Kimia. always um I always thought that stuff I always thought like a venereal disease that sounded like names, like chlamydia. Yeah, chlamydia, uh, chlamydia does. Chlamydia does, like does yeah, yeah. Uh and stuff like that. Couldn't I do it with my surname though, could Gloria. you? Chlam- chlamydia whore. Couldn't do that, no. could you? Oh, oh, oh no. <laughs> no. Gonorrhea and chlamydia, come downstairs and have dinner right now. Gonorrhea. Yeah. <laughs> in the park. Just shouting. Yeah. Herpes. Herpes. <laughs> Come here. My dog, Herpes. Oh, that's a good name for a dog, actually, Herpes, isn't it? Herpes. herpes. Here, Herpes. <laughs> Oh, hey, come here! Give me herpes a sec. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, shall, shall we in that case then get on with this this show? Yeah. So yeah. should we, uh, we take a little break? When we come back, we're just going to have a very quick freestyle chat about women in horror, women's place in horror, and Kate's perspective as a woman on women in horror. So let's have a little break. We'll um, be back we'll in a minute. It's your old pal Rick Morgan, 
and I want to welcome you to the House of Wax podcast. I cover the greatest horror movies ever made, and I also share with you what it is in these movies that make these classics. So how is this pod any different from the other thousands of horror podcasts? Well, first, you can actually see the episodes on my YouTube channel with all the bells and whistles you crave. And it's also a podcast, so it can travel with you. Two formats that work great together. And with upcoming side episodes filled with interviews, contests, and movie commentaries, it's sure to keep the blood pumping. So join us and become a horror maniac at the House of Wax. That's Wax. W-H-A-C-K-S. A proud member of Legion Podcast. Catch us everywhere you listen to pods. So it's time you give it a listen. Let's go. And we're back again, ladies and gentlemen, guys and ghouls. Um, here we are. We're going to now talk about women in horror. I'm not really going to talk about it. I'm going to sit back and listen and be an audience member like you, audience lovely members. Members. <laughs> I've just said the word members. Right. Oh, listen, I'll take over here, guys. <laughs> yeah. You just think about numbers. Uh, so we're just going to have a, a quick chat now about women's role in, in horror, um, Kate, as a, as a woman's perspective, um, and how women in horror and that role has changed mm. right from when horror started out. Maybe, you know, we're not, we haven't got all the details, but, you know, we can definitely see from exploitative movies all the way through to now there's movies where women are like you've got your sarah connors and stuff like that so i just thought it'd be pretty cool to to chat about that for a little bit seeing as though this is our women in horror special so kate like off the bat like what how for, as a woman what watching horror movies do you do you notice like the difference in how women are treated because i do obviously gav does but what's your take on it and throughout the decades for example yeah do you know so um i think obviously like recently there's been like this huge surge for making um women more prominent um and that's not even just in front of the camera behind the camera as well um and that has been really noticeable for me um as someone who does follow cinema um you know and growing up it was just you know, you kind of joke, you go, oh yeah, of course she's tripped over. Oh yeah, of course she's got giant boobs. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and it's and it's fine because you it's well it's not fine. It it was kind of sad actually because you just accept that as the norm. And like, oh okay, so this is a horror movie, so it's gonna have like the final girl and it's, she's gonna do this and she's gonna do that. Um but when I was like growing up, it I think that's one of the reasons actually why Buffy really spoke to me just because there was this really strong character. It flipped gender stereotypes. It flipped everything that you kind of expected from a horror movie um, and did something different with it. You know, the whole basis of it was that, you know, the blonde girl walking down the alley turns around and kicks the, the attacker's ass. Yeah. Um, and that was just, especially as I grew up and, you know, it started to notice these tropes within the horror movies. It was really refreshing to have that different side of things. But then, as you say, you know, you've got people like, you've got characters like Ripley and Sarah Connor and, um, you know, these really strong women. Um, so I think that those movies, apart from the obvious stuff, why they're important, like are really important for that side of stuff, because you know, you have, without that, you know, you don't have, well, you might do now because obviously it was, it was released fairly on, but, you know, characters like Furiosa from Mad Max and mm. things like that, you know, are starting to be much more prominent. Um, but then, you know, even as you look at, so when I was looking into this, like, you know, you have a lot of um, roles obviously behind the camera, which are rarely taken up by women. Mm -hmm. um, that has, massively increased over the last like even the since the 2000s that's been like a massive kind of increase um but maybe you would have like one or two female directors make one or two movies per decade yeah up until like the 70s um which we're is seeing a insane. huge surge in female directors now and oh, sure. female directors and horror as well um and they've got such a, a particular eye um it and I think we need so much more of that, not well, just in horror. But... We, we only really had Catherine Bigelow 
um, as a yeah. prominent uh, female director. And I only really feel like, I think she probably, she is good on her own as she is, but uh, she kind of had James Cameron as another half. Obviously, he mm-hmm. had a lot, he uh, has a lot of power in the industry. Um, I'd like to think it's probably, not saying that he helps out because she can do stuff by herself, but I'm saying because of that connection, it probably did help yeah. her. I'm not saying that um, in a drugs <laughs> way. I'm just saying that probably did help her. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Back so then, like, otherwise, we, yeah, yeah. Back then, otherwise we would have had. I'd like to think you know more, more female directors. You know, sometimes. it's quite funny because um, you, you know, talk about the eighties and things. That was I noticed that there was actually a real peak of female directors in the eighties. You know, you've got Deborah Brock, Catherine Bigelow. Um, you know, films like um, Slumber Party Massacre, which is quite funny considering because I actually only watched that recently, um, and it's quite funny considering like how. It does fall into a lot of those sort of tropes of like women being naked and didn't getting like slumber party. Didn't the producer come in slumber party massacre and film some more derogative stuff afterwards? Oh, is that what? Oh, okay, yeah. I've got a feeling that um, that happened and uh, the director wasn't too happy with some of the additional stuff shot. Is that why she didn't come back for number two then? Because that might be. I don't know. I don't know that movie that well. I've got a copy over there on VHS actually, but um, I don't. I mean, it's a fun movie. It's um, it's good fun. It's just yeah, you know, you have like the classic, you know, phallic knife penetrating and. But interesting. But of- interesting. A uh, 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 lady director would come in to do the movie of that type in that era. Yeah. Because that yeah. was all about the woman being the one who's with big breasts is killed straight mm-hmm. away. Yeah. Um, I mean, it might just been the fact that you know she just. I mean, I don't know, but you can surmise that. Uh, maybe that she just wanted to direct something yeah. and that's what was maybe given to her yeah. and she was like do you know what it gets my name out there and all the rest of it because I'd say she didn't come back for the second one Deborah Brock did but, the second one but you say that you say there was a few <clears throat> female directors and stuff at a certain point then yeah so it kind of it was a very kind of like steady sort of as I say maybe a couple of year of female directors I didn't look into producers and then it's just sort of literally been there all night but um so I just sort of focused on directors but um then in the 80s yeah that was like this real kind of surge especially around like the later so from 88 to 89 well um, funny enough just to jump in very quickly and it's not horror but one of my favorite movies from that era is big with Tom Hanks and that was directed by Penny Marshall yeah and I, I was surprised a few years ago to find out that it was directed by I don't know why surprised to find out it was directed by a woman it's always nice when that when you find out it's been a woman that's directed yeah. it because that's quite a blokey boyish but at no film, point you know? at no point watching that film did you yeah it is it is a, like a, a boy's coming to age journey but at no point in that film <laughs> did you sway male or female in any way of watching it did you you just watched no. it as a film and that's as a great that's... feel good movie what feminism yeah. is, feminism is, is, feminism is. Um, yeah, do you know, actually, one thing that really did surprise me, which it, I think is very common knowledge, but it was one of those things like, why didn't I know this? Um, but just because of the nature of the movie, is American Psycho. I had no idea that that was a female director. Yeah. Um, and neither did I till now. There, there you go. go. More you know. Um, but yeah, um, this lady called Mary Har- Harron and. Um, it's such a male-centric plot. It's a it's, male-driven movie, yeah. It's so male-driven, and it's in this very kind of masculine, sort of toxic masculine... Oh, yeah, of wealth. Oh, of yeah, absolutely. Market, yeah. You know, all of this. Um, and it's directed by women. I mean, like, you know, and it's written by a man, and, it, you know, a lot of um, his books are very kind of male-driven and stuff. And, yeah, so that kind of blew my mind, but in a good way, because I was just like... You, you know, it's because this is the thing. You can have like female directors and stuff, but you know they get handed movies that are just like you know romance, romantic comedies, or you know just yeah. very quote unquote girly. Like, I hate that oh, story, here's the latest I mean? Drew Barrymore movie. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Like um, but to be given a movie that is like really about toxic masculinity and about like this man who is just everything wrong um with with men in that kind of environment um to be done by a woman is just actually really professional like yeah we can do this shit too you know this is what we've been telling well, you the, the, what it comes down to is that the reason a lot of this is is the fact that what sells tickets to get people to watch these films mm. uh 
a, a more attractive, larger-breasted lady is going to get more people in the seats than a yeah. non-attractive, more lesser-breasted lady. It, unfortunately, that is the way that logic runs. That's but like you say, yeah. there's no reason why a woman director could not do that herself and still put an attractive mm-hmm. woman in. Maybe not specifically for big boobs. It's hard because you've got that cliche, the big boob, big boobs, attractive woman, and that's always going to be the thing which you're going to try and get away from because that is the key mm. which makes it like this yeah. is sexist to draw. That is the thing. At the same time, and that sells us tickets. And there are people who are getting, putting the money across to make these films, giving you all the money. Yeah. They do need to look at it as in a business sense. There is that unfortunate yeah. thing. So, what do you think about that? Well, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's funny that you say that actually, because I think going forward, we're going to see much less of that stereotype because people are becoming like more aware and more conscious of that. Actually, you no know, female characters and um, you know female-driven plots and things can actually be interesting as well as sexually tantalising, um, and we don't need to worry so much. People Agreed. have like progressed intellectually more, um, you know, that we don't need to have some woman just, you know walking around the house in her underwear because I'm, I'm not gonna i'm not gonna pull any punches guys and i'm sorry to burst your bubble women don't do that like, rarely we don't have pillow fights in our underwear at <laughs> me and dan have pillow fights in our underwear oh, i told yeah. that to my, this guy in my class at school when i was a teenager and he was legit heartbroken he thought we Aww. actually did that. i felt kind of bad but then i was like no fuck you um <laughs> but um but then but yes exactly what you were saying though gab it is what sells so there was this so a lot of the reason why you'll have um you know the the lead in a horror film or a, a lot of movies thrillers and adventure and whatever that they are like a more meek and and um more of the victim is because the the men who were going it tapped into, into the cinema and buying these tickets um tapped it tapped into that kind of protector instinct um it tapped into this sort of like yeah damsel in distress and it makes me feel good because i'm a man and i can save her and all of that sort of mentality because there was a very archaic um uh, sort of world, obviously in the fifties, sixties, and seventies as well. Obviously in the sixties, you had like quite a a bit of a progression when it comes to you know the swinging sixties and sexual liberation and all of this. And and then you had in the seventies, you know, there was a very kind of big women's movement, burning of bras, and you know we don't have to listen to men and we're going to go to the workforce and all that. And then so women around that time started to go to the cinema as well, and it would be okay. Well, we need to appeal to this demographic now and so this, this is where the final girls started to come in where the lead female character it wasn't just they were there as you know eye candy and there to fall over and be saved they were like no fuck you i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna fight the serial killer i'm gonna win because um, around around that time is where like in the 80s is where you started seeing that all the, the blokes in those movies are generally just uh, knife fodder they're just there ooh. to be killed and you know yeah straight away you single out which girl you think well it's probably going to be her that's going to see this through that all the blokes Mm -hmm. in this movie are just stupid stoners um you know wanting to get laid and it's actually the girl that's usually the cleverest and that's why she outwits everyone there is still a bit of a stigma even in that period though because sex was very much of not a concern but it was at the forefront obviously of people's minds and you know and there was still this kind of stigma that girls had to be a good girl and they had to you know this is why you know like the rules that they say in scream if you have sex then you're going to die because it's a lesson to be learned like you know you need to stay chaste you need to stay pure and so this is why the final girl up until i believe scream was the one of the first ones to do that where the main girl lost her virginity and she didn't die (laughs) Um, but (laughs) i think we're safe for scream um but yeah like so this is why again like but you have these rules come into play where it, um, the final girl will always still she'll retain her virginity and her purity, and that's her reward. She gets to survive because she stays pure. She doesn't drink. She's fairly straight laced. You look at characters like Laurie Strode, um, for example. You know she's the good girl next door, a babysitter. She um, doesn't party. She doesn't have loads of sex, and and she survives. You know there's these examples that run all through the 70s and 80s. And as I say, it's only really when you get to the 90s and things have lapsed a lot in that, that sort of time frame for women and the, and the roles that women are expected to play. Um, I mean, like in the world, not just in movies. Um, you know, they, that's where actually, no, it's okay. You can you can have sex and still not be a bad I person. Think, uh, 
I think like the nineties was a good, definitely a turning point well, because so, they had that classic yeah. era of Scream, the yeah, Craft, all these movies that we talked about. Williamson scripts though, which broke the mould. And, yeah. and made that broke the fourth wall and ex- said that we realise that we're in a parody of all these movies that come first. And so that was also a ignish- ignition to break the mould of the female being that person and the males as well because yeah. Scream and completely course, flipped that for and Buff, everything. Buffy was, oh, sure. And Buffy yeah. came out there and as well and all that exactly, kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, it came out a year later. Um, yeah, like it was a real kind of... Um, also, uh, revelation. you would have had the other point I was saying earlier about uh, that sells tickets. You also had the point where the female became more respected in the working role in general. Yeah. So they were making more money and sometimes more than or just as much as the man who would be originally buying the tickets because the woman had the big breast of cinema. So if the women then are able to buy the tickets, then they need to make that demograph, like you are saying earlier, more yeah. flatlined. So uh, is uh, equal for everyone, really. Yeah, exactly. And then again, this is where you start having because they had to appease both. So you still had like the bimbo and like the silly girl, um, but she would be more in like the if we're going to go by cabin in the uh, cabin in the woods terminology, more like the whore. So she's not the main <sighs> character anymore. She's the side character that gets iced because she's had sex. So you still have this kind of exploitation. I think side slut, thing. slut. Would, um, she's a slut, isn't she? She's not the whore. I was going. I was going by cabin in the woods, um, <laughs> but yeah, you're right. So yeah, so she, you know, she, so you still have that exploitive kind of thing for, um, you know, for the male the males who are going. But you know, opposed to that, you then have the. I say the strong character. I don't mean that women who have sex or who are promiscuous aren't strong, because that's obviously not true. But like, you know, in within that context of the movie, you have, you know, you have the straight laced strong woman who survives to the end to appease to the women who are now going to see these movies what is your final thoughts on fem- feminism if if <laughs> there should be a female rapper called feminem shouldn't there <laughs> anyway yeah. oh anyway God, so anyway um what is your final thoughts on it as we are in 2020 with weinstein going down etc etc what are you thinking now I'm excited, um, primarily. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see if it's next decade. You know, you've got all of these powerful, not all of them, but a lot of these powerful men who are making the decisions who obviously have a real aggression towards women um, now not in power, now not making these movies, and you're getting a real surge of female directors being hired and female producers and all the rest of it being hired. And I just think that we're going to see... And that's not necessarily to say, like, everything's going to be under... Like, starring tons and tons of women, but just to have a bit more of a balance. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you were saying earlier about feminism, it's not, you know, it's not um, about women being in, in control. It's about equal rights. Um, you know, it's very important to understand that. Yes, that's why we can't tip the balance. We've got to make sure it comes up to the level where it's just, we are all equal. Yeah, feminists aren't about, you know, you have male feminists, it's not about women suddenly being in in charge of everything. It's just like, hell, hey, can we just have the same stuff as what you guys got? Like, we want that too. Um, So I think, like, you know, it's not going to be like a massive women-dominant sort of all, all the time on screen it's just going to be like a bit more balanced and the women that are being represented are going to be intelligent and they're going to be full fully formed characters with you know full development going on there and i think that it's just going to make movies generally just so much more interesting at and it's the, interesting oh sorry gav uh all right at the oscars and stuff you have like best female director we we won't do we have that is that a thing it is no but just best director but you'll have best lead actress best lead co-actress whatever so yeah. that shouldn't be a thing either it should just be best actress best co uh, a- actor should be just the yeah. right name best actor yeah. best co-actor and that'd be it not yeah. we shouldn't have any of these things there should not be any sections it should all be everybody yeah. if you if everyone wants to fight on the same level boom let's do mm-hmm. this everybody let's mm-hmm. fucking have it yeah. You, don't, you don't have best black actor, do you? Exactly. Or, well, yeah, exactly. You know I mean? and, and, you know, we, there shouldn't be anything at all. Everybody is like, that's the same thing. It's like when you make a film and you get a million pound budget, then you get the 10,000 pound budget and you put them up against each other and you get a review of the film and you get someone saying, well, I knew it wasn't 
as much money as less money so i'm going to give it a bit more no 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 if you want to come up and make a movie you're competing against the war uh, disney movie and stuff you need to be on the same level and making music everything everybody needs to be on the same level and compete at one level and we all are in unison with that and that's how it should be and hopefully we will see that like you say absolutely yeah i mean there's i mean i've, I've read quite um i said quite a few like a couple of articles that literally say that like it shouldn't have this separate category for men and women it should no. just be Good. director yeah. actor let's let's, uh, 100%. let's hope it goes that way dan what are you gonna say yeah. sorry then then I've... then let's get off this and get on with the film Yes, indeed. I was just going to say, Kate, it's interesting um, when you were chatting about your sort of journey through horror and one of the um, genres that you're quite into, late, only lately, really, and that's Jalo. And women in Jalo are quite often portrayed as very beautiful, quite often mm. nude, but they're very often sliced and diced in terrible ways. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts are on, on Jalo. I, I love them. Just a bit. Sorry. I love them. I mean, them. They, are, they are fantastic movies. <laughs> no, they're, they're so pleasant I to think, die, but... um... Yeah, I mean, I think you also, you know, whenever you watch a movie from back then, I think you do have to sort of understand the time period in which it was made yeah. um, and and understand that, I mean, if you think about it, you know, you've got Argento's daughter, Asia, being one of the forefront of the Me Too movement, you know, um, and obviously her father was one of the pioneers for the Jello. So um, you have to kind of understand that, it's it is that of that time but then you ha also have you know like movies where it does demonstrate female strength um in good ways and bad ways i suppose but like you know look at the, the bird with the crystal plumage for example um you know that has uh, can i spoil are we all right to spoil for something yeah, like yeah, yeah. um yeah so obviously like the it, the protagonist is a female and the whole through the whole way through you're thinking you're assuming it's a male um and actually it turns out that it's this red-haired vixen who um not only is she a killer she relishes it and that i think was really progressive for its time you know it's not um something that in 1970 you necessarily had like a lot it wasn't groundbreaking but it wasn't very common um and you know and, and although um suspiria the original isn't a jello but you know you have like characters like susie and things and a very female centric cast and um you know so i think i think that it, it's not it's not very progressive in terms of all the stuff that you were saying but you know for the time i think they were still aware guess, that women yeah. were more than just knife fodder they were more than just big boobs women but but obviously they still had that demographic to appease and italian cinema specifically for exploitation is just rife with it and you, you know if you go in watching these movies you kind of just have to understand that same as you do for like you know slashes around that time or, or like anything it. like benny hill for example yeah yeah uh, there should have been penny hill where it's a female running around chasing men <laughs> yeah <laughs> right well that like is that. That was amazing. A really that fascinating a conversation, actually, and just to just Thank to you, hear an insight into that, because obviously it's me and Dan doing this, men in our pants in a cave, back, <laughs> bashing on the wall making music. Um, so it's good to uh, to know that, and yeah, I hope we continue and go forward in the world, which is going to change, which has changed. The world is changing as we speak right now, but we go yeah. forward in a massive positive way with everything and every what actually this this disease is this virus is actually going to make things more equal you're going to appreciate everybody on the same level that's because mm -hmm. we are all oh, just we've nice. all got hearts and blood and brains and they all stop and start the same as everyone else so yeah uh, we should appreciate everybody and you know um yeah there you go there's there's my there final word shall we okay. get on with the film should we have a little trailer and then come back and let's talk about Suspiria then, yeah? Yeah! All right. Cool. Bye. At the beginning, she gave me things. Perfect balance. Perfect sleep. Oh, she wants to get inside of me. I can feel her. When you dance the dance of another, you make yourself in the image of its creator. I feel 
like I'm not even here yet. The <laughs> damn black's incredible. One, two, three. The way she transmits her work. You have to decide. What is it you want to be for this company? There's more in that building than what you can see, Doctor. You are living with dangerous people. Three muscles. Three God. Three Devil. Muscle Tenebrarum. Muscle Lacrimarum. Mother Suspirium. Darkness. Tears. <laughs> and sighs. You're making some kind of deal with them. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. company, one that will engulf the artistic director, an ambitious young dancer, and a grieving psychotherapist. Some will succumb to the nightmare, others will finally wake up. <sighs> <laughs> we did that in unison, Dan. We did. Suspiria. Uh, this is, this is obviously... Who directed this? I don't, yeah, who's the director? Uh, <laughs> make me pronounce it. Okay, so yeah. this is probably not pronounced correctly. I apologise in advance. Uh, so it's Luca. I think it's Guadagnino. Guadagnino. Say it again, Kate. Say it again, Kate. What's the say? Guadagnino. Say it again, Kate. What's it? Say it again. Like he's being a wally. Are you? Oh, don't do that. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is obviously Suspiria. Um, when this, um, I'm a massive uh, original fan of the movie. I watched it in a church last year um, oh, yeah. or two years ago, and um, <clears throat> that I love that film. I love the uh, the central uh, uh, thing going on with the, 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 the color scheme and the sounds, and it's been so in your face. It's a fucking proper Euro horror movie of all you know, mm. just the way it is. Um, I really like that. When they when I heard they're remaking this, my first thought, the same as everybody generally remakes, is what's the point? And from watching it, uh, I've watched it twice now. Um, I still think don't see a point of making remaking this. Um, but I guess it is. A different film from the original in some in a lot of respects the, you've got yeah, a different okay. plot lines going along with it and different things going on it's a more drama driven film i feel mm -hmm. than the original yeah. which is more yeah. of the time of the the giallo almost uh, well no it's not even the giallo it's it's, it's a hyper giallo uh uh, uh the original superiors and um have you guys seen the other like Mother of Tears and the the, the trilogy. I haven't seen Mother of Tears, but I did watch Inferno recently. Finally got it out of the strength app on my shelf. Um, and yeah, I thought that was an awesome piece of work. Like it was, um, is it that, was quite different to Suspiria. Is um, that the one where the woman swims down at the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like yeah. that. That's good seeing that. Yeah, I bet you like that. <laughs> <laughs> Like so for those who haven't seen it, there's a lot of boobage. Yes, uh, yes, it goes back to those films we were speaking about. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you've seen those. Okay, cool. Have you seen them, Dan? Uh, yeah, I have, yeah. I saw Mother of Tears with um, Dario Argento in the cinema, actually. What? Well, yeah, indeed, yes. How did you manage to do that? It wasn't just like me and him. It was like, uh, <laughs> uh, he was just, he, they were just, Fright Fest in London uh, just did a Saturday showing of one of his films, so we went along. Did, oh, I gave him gave him a yeah. CD of some of my music and chatted to him for a little bit. Yeah, it's cool. Did he, uh, wow. did he offer you some of his popcorn that was on his lap? Uh, <laughs> no, he said he's, he said You would have taken it, though. He said his dick's in it. Oh, I'd have taken it. Oh. <laughs> would you like, um, uh, would you like some of the popcorn? <laughs> Uh, but I, I thought the movie was a bit rubbish, uh, which was a shame <laughs> when you're in the. Yeah, that's not, I, it's not, not like a great it. thing. I've not seen it, but. Um, uh, um, 
I've also done Texas Chainsaw Massacre with Toby Hooper and also American Wealth in London with John Landis as well. That's kind of cool. And he was commenting all right through it because his le- voice is so loud. <laughs> uh, John Landis. What's, hap- what's happened to Max Chinese, Landis, mate. by the way? You are. What's happened to Max Landis? Is he st- is he kind of gone a bit under oh, the radar? Kind of... He was always up to some sketchy stuff, wasn't he? They've been accused yeah. of being like uh, someone keeping women tied up and tortured or something. Yeah, it's all gone off the radar. I was just going to say very quickly. Sorry. We are I'm, veering off topic. I'm doing um, it again. I did watch uh, Shanghai Noon with Jackie Chan. So that's my little, I was in the cinema with the celebrity. Ah, brilliant. I was thinking, what has that got to do with anything of this? Um, no. So and yes. it was just me and him. And yes, I did eat his popcorn. I bet you really? did. But you ate each other's popcorn. I, uh, I haven't seen any movies with anyone famous. Sorry. <laughs> you can watch you can watch a movie me and Dan if you like. We're we're famous, aren't we? Infamous. Um so back to Suspiria, this film. Um yes, again, I didn't know why there was a point of making it, but yes, it is a different type of film. So let's go through the film. Unless you guys what is your first uh, have you well, seen it? Uh, I've seen it twice. Well, what we saw you... it together. Yeah. Kate, was that the first time you'd seen it when we saw it together? When I saw it with you, yeah, that was my first time. Okay, great. And we so we'd I was at like 1.5 glasses of red wine so it was a good level relax um it really you know it blew me away um yeah. just because i was at at the right level i think you know of being relaxed it was quite exciting there'd been been a lot of hype about it and the original is such a, a favorite it's probably in my top five horrors of all time um uh, and I was nervous. We were both nervous that it wouldn't live up to it as well. Mm-hmm. And I know, and I know, it's very, it's really split critics. Yeah. Like Gav, Gav, you've said you know you're not really that much of a fan of it. You don't see bit, the point in bit it. Pretentious. Yeah, and I can see that. It, you know, I can definitely see there is pretentious elements to it, or people might think that. But but also there was just something about it. It just it felt like a, a smash in the face, just over and over mm-hmm. and over again. Um, all the way through until that fucking end scene where I was just like Jesus fucking Christ when is this going to end I need this to be ending yeah, ah! yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah we, we really enjoyed it and Kate then you took Ava your daughter to see it <laughs> yeah like two days later there was a baby screening I was like fuck it I'm going to go um, and yeah I saw it at baby screening and actually the, because yeah you're right Dan, Like the first time you watch it um, there's so much to it um as i, was I had saying, to take it all in really wasn't it yeah i mean as, as i said before we were recording like there is i mean it's it's like to use a phrase there's an onion of a movie like there is subtext for days and mm. um you know it's difficult to t- it's definitely one you have to kind of watch a couple of times if you're going to re- if you're going to appreciate it, you have to watch it a couple of times um because the first time it's just a lot of it kind of went over my head um and um I was completely enthralled by the performances, um, the visual style, the, there's these two key gore scenes that just blew my mind. Um, it was one of the most like unsettling cinematic experiences I've ever had. I agree um, with you. It. I agree. It was definitely um, one of the weirdest cinema, or probably as close to being traumatized as I could be. Yeah. I'm quite desensitized these days, but I felt particularly with the scene in the in the mirror room yeah 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 that was quite hard to watch really um, difficult and um you know there and it's like test screening and stuff like you know you hear these like sensationalist kind of um headlines of like people were throwing up and people like yeah. were passing out like people i don't think they did that but they were leaving because they just couldn't handle it um and um it was yeah it was just i hadn't seen anything like that at the cinema i know that year that we had movies like um a quiet place and we had hereditary which was supposed to be like set type of the cinema i unfortunately did not get to see them at the cinema i was just had a baby and we had no family around to babysit so i had to be very selective about what movies i went um and saw at the cinema um just because i couldn't leave her for very very long um so i unfortunately I didn't get to see those but for me just that um that scene in particular was just it just blew my mind um and then the second time i saw it this at um the baby screening because it was a baby screening they have the um the sound put down a little bit um so they put the subtitles on and because i wasn't missing any of the information really like that, i still didn't get everything from it because i say it does take a couple of times and i don't know that much about german wartime history um when it comes to things like the german autumn which I'll, i'm not going to go into massive detail on um as i said i'm going to Focus more on the feminist sides of things, just because, and the and the women um, uh, sort of themes within that, um, just because that's obviously the focus of the episode. But there are 
a lot of things to do with like the post-war German divide and all of this kind of stuff. So um, I don't know a lot about that. So there's still some stuff that went over my head, but I got so much more. And in fact, I messaged you, Dan, didn't I? And I said, right, here's what I got from the second viewing. God, and it was a very long message. Um, <laughs> and, um, and you just came back to me about three hours later gone, wow, okay. Um, <laughs> Um, and yeah, and so like every time I watch it, I get something new and I get something different and I notice something else. And for me, that is what makes a fantastic movie. Um, I love movies that are just kind of one dimensional. Like I love them as well. Like I can get a lot of enjoyment from it. But if you're going to really stick with me, like I need to I need to have something that has got a lot to kind of say or, or represents a lot. So for me, I, I think it's a phenomenal movie. It's one of, it's one of my favorites. Saying like Suspiria is one of your top five. This is one of my top five. Okay. That's awesome. What it's do you so think, really Dan? Cool. Did you say what you thought? Yeah, I did. I was going to say uh, very quickly. I um. It was that long ago. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say very quickly that uh, I I just threw out that comment. Oh, it's very pretentious. I only feel it gets pretentious after a certain point. We will get to as we go through the movie. I don't feel that the whole time. <laughs> Funny enough, listening to you guys speak about it, you're bringing back certain points in my mind where I'm like, yeah, that's a good part of the movie. The the dance death scene. Uh, the, yeah. You know, the, uh, and different parts and the. The side story with the uh, the terrorists. Um, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, the, not uh, not the royal uh, uh, royal air force, the uh, red um, red army faction. I think. Oh, and I thought it was the royal air force because I thought this was. I, I see. I didn't know when it's setting. So when when you guys talk about, it, I realise I there's the stuff in this film I enjoyed. Now I think I think my issue is is its length. of play um i feel that you probably have to do that a little bit if you're going into this these two sort of storylines um but mm-hmm. i feel like it should be two hours maximum and it should be chopped yeah. a bit tighter um i think i might have been with it more i don't know why see see listening to you guys discuss it it's like when you listen, <laughs> this to, a pod- listen to someone on a podcast talk man you go oh, i want to watch that movie again but then you watch the movie but then you're like i'm um, just i don't know no, yeah, but it's not. It's not gonna. It's the. It is as Dan said. Like it, it is a very divisive movie, and there, uh, Luca. I'm gonna call him Luca. I'm not gonna call him his full name because I'll stop eleven <laughs> time and offend somebody in from Italy probably. Um, but um, so Luca ha- like was he would knew going in. It was because Suspir- the original Suspiria is one of his favorite movies. Dario Argento is not only a friend of his, but his, his all time favorite director, and he knew the feet of reimagining this story this you know um and he knew that it was going to be very kind of marmite and he was like that's fine though because people will talk about it Mm. um and that was for him like it didn't matter so much whether people were loving it or hating it he knew that there would be an audience for it and he also knew that there were going to be people who didn't like it but he was like but you know it's going to it should be an interesting enough movie that people talk about it and for me i feel like it's one of these movies that you could you could study for forever and it will be part of like film study curriculum and stuff there's a lot, uh, in, lot the going on like you said there's a lot of layers to it um and it's not a remake like psycho got remade and no. was pointless could, or, could you know. put in a wank scene just to differentiate <laughs> yeah it's uh I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you could actually just have made this film and just not called it Suspiria. Well, I think that because it doesn't really, you know, it's... You and have, just like, class it as a homage. The director would be like, oh, obviously it's like Suspiria. And you go, yeah, I love that film. It's a total you know, homage to it. I don't know that you could because it has all the lore of the three mothers. It does have and that. And that is so prominent. And it'd be too and much so, touching upon it. It'd be too much, almost like you're just stealing it, I guess. Yeah, it would just, if you tried to, you know, I think the fact that he owns it, it's like, no, this is a reimagining um, and, you know, very vocal about it. And it is, but it's so different that I think, you know, Daniel right, it's not as if it's just like a carbon copy where if it was, it just, what is the point? Um, it's not going to be as good. It's, there's no reason for it. But because it changed a lot about it, but still kept that core plot, um, you know, an American dancer coming over to a, a German dance school that's run by witches, um, it was enough and then they really explored the three mothers um folklore about it which um you know is the kind of key to it so i think i don't think you could without it just being flat out plagiarism and i think it's better to just own it and to me, like, but we're doing something different it was like one of those join the dots books where the original suspiria is like a head 
like an animal's head and then all the dots are there and you know you get them people that join them up and turn it into a completely different picture and yeah. really uh, uh, make it blossom into something that it wasn't originally it's kind yeah. of like that it's like it took it taken to Suspiria which is still the better movie in my opinion the original um, because there, there isn't so much going on it is it's easier to just mm. be in that moment but they've taken Suspiria and then they've just let every element grow out into this yeah. crazy creature. You could almost have made this a Suspiria movie. Maybe they could have made this into a TV series. Oh my god. Yeah, like potentially. Instead of that I movie, mean, they didn't have to made it longer. Uh, yeah, made it longer and have that drama of the war going on as uh, you know. That yeah. Didn't... Right, let's get into it. Um... I just wanted to quickly touch on Tom York as well. I was going to say, okay. it, I was excited to find out he was doing a soundtrack. I wasn't excited when I heard the soundtrack. Ah, no, that's one of the things that... this Because this is my second watch, um, unfortunately. But that was one of the things that I had forgotten, actually. it was I quite enjoyed. I really liked the score, especially in certain places. The score is quite good. I, quite need, I need to hear it in isolation, well, it which is, I am. Oh, you are in isolation. I think it has um, this real kind of, like, ethereal vibe to it, which really, I think, is in keeping with the at least the supernatural side of the story. Um, this very kind of dream. Like, there's loads of dream sequences in it, and there's loads of, um, you know, ethereal sort of imagery. And I think... So a bit of trivia for you. Um, I believe that Tom York actually wrote the music before they shot the film. Really? Um, so he was basically just given some notes of the kind of thing that Luca wanted and was like, how about it? Um, and then Oops. they placed it all in later. That's what um, I did. Yeah. So um, I think I think sometimes... I think I can understand because a lot of people kind of go, oh, sometimes the music sort of doesn't really quite fit or it kind of pulls me out of it and stuff. Um, and I think with Tom York, especially when he's singing it, he's such a unique known voice. It's difficult to not go, ah, Tom York. Um, but um, I think that they did, I think it does kind of fit in with that ethereal side. It's, of things, the, it's the bit which makes me go, okay, it's stuck up his own arse now, is after, in that big scene at the end, and you got that bit when there's some death, it all of a sudden goes into the crappiest music video ever. <laughs> You're talking about the sort of slow motion. How do you want to die? I want, how do you want to be, I want to die. Yeah. Oh, da, da. It's like, fuck off. That was, oh, that was, that was the bit we'll which just... Talk, we'll talk about that, because yeah, that's we will. Got, like, a lot of, yeah. I mean, basically, Gav, like, I, I'm just going to be like, yes, but this is why this has happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Educate me, you know. Um, right, let's but get like, on, let's would, get on it. I would say... I think, though, that I'm just shutting you down or that, like, you know, I think I know best or anything like that. I don't want you to think that, because well, like, obviously, you know, everyone has their opinions and well, it would be really boring. You, if you say what you like. I edit the podcast. I could just cut you out. <laughs> <laughs> That's very I would true. say, guys, before we start talking about it, then is very quickly we must touch on the cast because part of the reason that Kate suggested this movie, obviously, guys, this is our Women in Horror episode. Um, so we're looking at this movie specifically. There's a lot of nudity because... in it. Sorry, lot, there's a lot of nudity. Lot of la- ladies oh, naked in it. Oh, oh, right. There is some old man cock, isn't there? Old man's cock, Gav. Old man cock. Yeah, it's been a while since we've had some old man cock. Oh, um, that's be part of the conversation. <laughs> but it is an all-female cast, apart from yeah. a couple of guys. Um, yeah. Even spoiler alert, but even the doctor, what's his mm-hmm. name? Clemperer. Uh, Joseph Clemperer. He is turned is played by. Um, uh, yeah, Tilda, who has three roles in this movie. Um, does. What is she, yeah. fucking Eddie Murphy? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, so with that, there's um, actually a really interesting theory about, which I'll, I'll, I may as well just briefly touch on it now, and I won't go into massive detail. What I might do is actually just put the link up on the Facebook page, so if anyone is interested in the psychology side of things, then they can read it for themselves. But um, there's this sort of, like, there's this online theory about how like she has so psychology but obviously the character of Klemperer is um, a psychologist and there are these books that they focus on on his desk and one of them is by a guy called Young I think that's how you pronounce it Um, and he was a psychoanalyst and psychotherapist um, and um, there's also and there was like all of this imagery and theory about Uh, dreams and stuff but he also worked very closely with the kind of Freudian theories and one of Freud's theories is um the you have the id that is all impulse and you just you know you want it you have it you have like the super ego which is kind of like a a balance of the two and then you have the ego which is sort of very calm and very kind of you know rational and all this kind of stuff and all of that works within your psyche and that's 
this theory that Freud has. And it's and this theory online is that she plays each one, that each character represents one of like so Madame Marcos oh. is the id. She's very impulsive, she's overzealous when it comes to choosing her vessel, that's why it fails so many times. You have the psychiatrist who is the super ego, who is a bit who is a bit of sort of bit of both and then you have Madame Blanc who is very calm she's very focused she's very you know sure of herself and there's there's this whole thing of you know that and obviously it's tying in with like the three mothers the three egos the three ah. you know the three comes up a lot um and so in interviews till this instant basically just goes now we thought it'd be fun but if you look into it there is actually a lot of ways that actually it, it makes sense apart from the fact that it does mean that it literally the lead cast is all female and that's really yeah. great you say all these things that's really fascinating but that only really works for the actor actress actor whatever you say actor uh doing the the role itself to help them get into the uh, uh, uh train of thought it doesn't uh, for, as an audience member you don't see that and it doesn't uh, change that's your true. view in any, any way what did you think then of her playing Clampera? Like what did you think? Like, were you convinced by it? Or did you know in advance? Hang on, what was so she? She's obviously the the doctor. She's obviously the dance teacher, the one who's in red at the end, towards the end. And what was the other role? She did so, Madame Blanc, the Which, main, the big blobby naked. Ah, slug woman. Oh, and Madame Marcos. Sorry, yeah, Madame Marcos is the one at the end. Well, she did four. Is, no, no, just those three. Oh, so she's so, slug woman, dance teacher. <laughs> yeah, and old man's old, man. old man's cock. She's oh, not old man's cock, cock but she's old man. Well, she man. does, because that's to make a well, prosthetic wore, body for her. she wore all the time. She wore that old man's cock all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this does kind of beg to, why. I know it'd be fun, but that's going to cost a lot of money I... to make a prosthetic suit for the whole thing. And the, uh, the effort of doing that, why don't you just get an, uh, a man to do that? Is it another uh, reason where it's like more empowering to women to play a man? It, yeah, or... I, think, I think there's what? that. I think it's so that they can, a lot of it is so that they can have But again, all... the, the lame person that like, goes to cinema is not even going to notice that as Tilda Swinton. And when they come home, someone says that to them, they go, oh, was it? Okay, cool. And then that's they've forgotten about it. It doesn't make it any more powerful or anything, does it? No, but I just think like having having that knowledge though that it is literally, and also as well like you have it's interesting. It, it's that kind of empowering thing though of like a woman can even in this day play a man. She can do all the things that men. I like can. I like that fear all theory to it. What you just said then, I think that's a really cool thing. Yeah, I don't think it has to be anything more complicated. Tilda, that about, Tilda Swinton oh, look, uh, played <laughs> da- Tilda Swinton played David Bowie, didn't she? She did. Yeah, David Bowie. And that is quite <laughs> this. Ground um, control to major sub. <laughs> but yeah, he had that um, album that released in 1977 to do with all the German stuff. So okay. that's quite interesting that, yeah, that was all tied in. Hmm. But anyway. But yes, I imagine this film really, when you look at it and go through it, we could be like, yeah, that's really fascinating. That's really interesting. That. But at the time I'm watching, I'm like, fucking hell, two and a half hours, fucking hell. See, this yeah. is what I love about movies, though, is I love finding out about all this stuff and creating theories and things like that. So I'll try and hold off too much of that. Can, can, can we crack on with it? Otherwise, we're going to yeah. be here all day. All day? Sure. Not that we've cool. got anything to do, mm. but yeah. Well, let's let's go through the story then. Uh, so oh. it's very similar. You know, we've got our American student arriving. Um, and like I said earlier, at its core, it is the original Suspiria. You know, uh, what they've done, though, is and it's going to be quite hard to talk about because there are so many side stories um, and dream sequences, really. Um, I don't know if it's easier just to talk about some of the key scenes and then chat about those. What do you guys want to do? Do you want to go through go through the story uh, uh, you, you, we, we can't I don't think you specifically go through the story we need to kind of do it as in could, maybe we can do it in the acts because it goes through as in was it six acts they yeah there's in. six acts in could, we, could we go through acts maybe yeah we could do yeah. Uh, yeah. I, can't, I can't specifically say when each act happens though so uh, that might be That's a bit right, I've got okay well, what is the first, the first what's the first act ladies and gentlemen so the first act um, is Act one, obviously. And it is, uh, it's a, a lady goes to a doctor, doesn't she? And she says, like, Patricia. she says they want to eat my cunt on a plate and stuff like this. Uh, yeah, the witch's word. Um, I love so the subtitle it, colours. Yeah, so it's it's red for German and blue for French. Which yeah. is kind of cool. the reason for it, but I liked it. It was funky. Yeah, it's just a kind of nice little touch to differentiate. Okay, so she goes to the doctor. So for our first uh, introduction is this doctor who, it's kind of your Van Helsing, it feels like. Yeah, yeah. I suppose. they basically just took that. Oh, that was enthusiastic, Dan. Yeah, I suppose. Oh no, I'm I'm enjoying. What are you fucking enjoying. poo bear? Yeah, right. I suppose. 
Oh, no, it's not Pooh Bear. Who's, who's that? That's Eeyore. 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 Yes, I suppose it is. That's better. Carry on. <laughs> That's better. Um, but yeah, they took that role of the psychiatrist of the original that comes in very briefly and actually was done as a bit of an afterthought and they, they completely expanded it out. So yeah, so this is Patricia. She goes uh, she goes to see this doctor who I don't think it's their first time at all, um, this meeting. She's very comfortable in his office, throws her bags down and all this. She is... Obviously, she's you know she's very upset about something. And she's, she's been through of, something traumatic, hasn't she? Yeah, she's kind of singing to herself. And he's uh, a straight psychiatrist, isn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's not anything weird. He's just he's just a psycho, uh, psycho, a psy- psycho. He's just a psycho. He's, he's just right. a psycho. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so she's and she's flitting around the office, and she's very kind of um, um, what's the word where you just can't think of the word now, but she just. Um, it's she very... speaks in different languages to him um, yeah. as well. She says things like Gav, like you said, like she says, they want to meet my cunts on a plate, which yeah. is a strange thing to say. And she also says quite a disturbing sentence, which is, they groomed me, they're grooming me. Oh, um, she says that and you think straight away, you're thinking, right, OK, well, that's never a good word to hear. Like, what, no. what what's going on here? Um, yeah. And how does how does he react to it? Or he's just sort of he just yeah he kind of puts it down to delusion. He puts it down to um, she's just a very upset lady, and there's more there's more grounded in reality. She's kind of just off on one. He's furiously scribbling this down, isn't he as well? Yeah. So um, yeah, and then she she has a bit of a freak out. Um, she she talks about how. Um, they're watching her they watch her all the time they they've and part of the grooming is that they've they give her things they give her gifts um like perfect balance perfect um form all of this kind of stuff but then they take things so they've taken her urine and they at one point say she's take they've taken my eyes um and you obviously i think that's metaphorical not physical she still very much has her eyes on her head but i think from that she just she goes because then she goes on to say how they're, they're watching her and she freaks out because she sees the um uh this book which has the eye of um the freemasons on it and um and she freaks out she turns it down then she sees the picture of his wife Anka, and turns that down so she thinks they can see her through any other eyes that are around yeah that's how they're watching it her all the time extreme paranoia and again all it does is fuel his theory that she's just you know she's not well um i'm gonna enjoy this definitely. movie more from you telling me what's going on in there <laughs> i might it send does... you my notes after this gab it'd be an interesting movie for you i would say to you i gab, won't send you uh, mine it might be worth watching it revisit it once more uh, not straight away but no. in a year or so's time maybe again. one day maybe yeah. one day yeah. there is a lot to it and i know but anyway yeah well <laughs> So what happens with this girl? What's going on? Well, she she said this stuff. She's paranoid, and she, then she yeah. leaves. Does she she, just she runs off. off. So yeah, so she runs off. Um, she what we've established basically from this scene is that there are witches. So this is quite interesting because obviously in the original, they leave that. They don't confirm that until like the last scene. Whereas in this one, it's the first scene. Boom, witches. Witches that's yeah. revealed already. So you think right? Okay, so that was the big reveal of the first one. Where are they going to go with this? Mm. Um, and then they, she mentions other names like Sarah and Olga. She's worried for them. Like Olga thinks that um, she's been kind of cottoning on and she's worried for her safety. Um, and the bit you say, you know, they say they'll hollow me out and eat my cunt on a plate. Sorry. It's really shocking. Yeah. Like it was. It's our first example of swearing, and it's said in German, so you have it. I know. Written on that's the screen. What, I've never seen that word in subtitles. And it, <laughs> it really pops out at you. All that you sentence know. ever. Yeah. And I think yeah, it's a really harrowing sentence, and I think the fact that you are you're forced to read it, not only just hear it, you're forced to read it, and it's it's really shocking. And I'm not one to be shy away from any swearing, so. Um, you know, for me to be kind of shocked by the word cunt is, um, I think it says something. Yeah, well, I looked at you in the cinema, Kate, and I said, oh, okay, wow. Yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. thinking, actually, that that's the first scene, and she's saying that. I hope we yeah. don't actually get, I said, I think I, don't know if I said it to yeah, you. Yeah, I don't want to visualise that. I hope we that. don't get to see it. Don't see no. it. Um, <laughs> I actually think of you every single time that bit comes up. I've watched this film <laughs> probably about seven or eight times since, and um, I think of you every single time. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I think of you when I see the word cunt. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kate. You're welcome. So continuing on, guys. <laughs> Uh, huh? So continuing on, so what is um, going on now? 
So next we, we shoot to um, what we find out is Ohio, Amish country. And there, we, this is where we first start to hear really Tom York's score come in um, as we kind of get this image of, of what's going on at this farmhouse where there are these women all hushed, they're all obviously Amish, you can tell from the decor, the way that they are dressed and the way that they move and there's Bibles everywhere. And there's this woman in bed on death's door, basically. She just looks skeletal and pasty. And she's, uh, she's snoring, isn't she? You hear her breathing. She's like and it the original. Like, yeah, it's the original, like isn't it? Adam Marcos, yeah. Um, who we find out, obviously, is, is, is in the original, we find out is Mother Superiorum. So I feel like with the reveal later on down the line, the fact that this is Susie's mother is quite it's almost like a clue yeah i felt that know? as well um that whole ending bit is that that's supposed to be like some big twist i am mother but it's a bit like oh it's like it's not really a great re- revelation as such it's it is and it isn't do you know what i mean that whole yeah. big thing at the end it's kind of like well I, that seems like it should be more of a thing but isn't really i think it's actually i mean when i first watched it because i think i, I don't was know if they so needed tough. it almost is like, well, i suppose they do but i don't know well, yeah, you do for plot, but I think yeah. like when I first watched it, I didn't really piece anything together because I don't like to do that because I don't like to I don't like to guess what happens. Oh, I, I like love happen. I love murder right. mysteries, so so I'm I'm always like looking into yeah. these sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. See, I don't like to do that. I prefer to just kind of go along. For the yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel um, it impacts me more. But then when you watch it again, knowing that yeah, yeah, yeah of course, yeah, it's it's like yeah. How do you not get that? Like mm. it, it isn't. But I think for the characters and obviously like. It is still, even if you've worked it out, still a bit of an oh shit kind of moment because yeah. Madam Marcus, well, you're fucked, didn't you? Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but more interesting um, watching it a second time, knowing that. Yeah, it does. We, we, and we can get to that because there are points in this where you're like, oh, does she know yet? Is she, yeah, of you know? course. Okay. Um, so, yeah, no, she's. So, this is this woman, she's raspy and ragged, wheezing breath. And yeah, I mean, she's basically just on death's door. I am. So yeah, and a um, little bit of a fun fact: uh, Dakota Johnson, who plays Zuzi, is also plays one of the girls there who, um, in the in IMDb, is, says is, she's called Naomi, and she plays like her twin sister. So it's quite funny. That she's quite ah, funny. lots of multiple. Um, but you don't ever uh, see her. Yeah, you don't ever see her face with just like side profiles or the back of her head and stuff. But yeah, that's that's her. Be good if ah. Eddie Murphy had been in this. I think that would have taken us out a bit, wouldn't it? Really. Uh, <laughs> If he just came into it all of a sudden. Yeah. Who? Like, Sorry, I missed that. Eddie, Eddie Murphy. Murphy. Oh, God. Jesus. Just playing loads of different what? characters. He's like a butler. <laughs> He's like, you know. It'd be quite a different movie, I think. Come on, man. Come inside, man. Come inside the school. <laughs> Come on, man. How about if Eddie Murphy played everyone? This chick's dancing in here. It's crazy. He's crazy, man. <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. I kind of want to see that movie now. Um, we, we see the school next, don't we? So Susie arrives in Berlin. It's a, um, it's a school which doesn't charge. They, they do it for free. But they're very exclusive, yeah. aren't they? I, I watched yeah, it very, very quickly. I, the first time I watched this, I watched this with my friend Rachel Deadman. A shout out, Rachel. She's a big fan of the show. Uh, we watched this, and she's a dance teacher. Yeah. So that was quite interesting to watch with a dance teacher. And she's, I think she said the dancing they're doing was like an, uh, seemed, looked like an old school Russian uh, style. I think she said, I should have asked her before doing this, but I think that's what she said. But she said it was very interesting to watch. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so with the dancing, um, so um, Dakota Johnson is a trained dancer. She did a lot growing up but more, normally in um sort of dance steps it's like one two, it's a count of one two three four one two three four initial note it's um some of it is a four count but a lot of it is a three count so she had to so she she was in intense training dance training for about a year before oh no it was no six months before she was doing bits of training but she was filming elsewhere so she couldn't train loads but then the last six months before filming she intensely trained but she had to undo all of her muscle memory of like a four oh. count to adjust it to a three count um and i, I don't think she does excellently well she does all of her own dancing apart from two bits where she does the massive leap and then the the back kind of contortion stuff i don't think is her either um but yeah otherwise she does it all that's amazing. cool she's, she's amazing um <clears throat> So I'm going to try and not gush over to Kurt Johnson because I do love her. Um, but yeah, so um, what's quite cool though as well, just 
putting back in the scene just very quickly is that the Suspiria, rather than having it as like a title on screen, it's actually the sign that on the underground. Yeah. As though it's I like a, a destination. Um, it's very subtle, and um, I thought it was kind of cool. Yeah, I spotted that. Um, the school in this is very different <laughs> to the school in um, the original. It's not because in the original it's kind of out in the middle of the woods almost mm -hmm. very almost like a fairy tale this is just very yeah. um it's just in a city there's loads going on obviously we've got all these sort of the acts of the terrorist stuff that's going on and stuff yeah. so it's just like this building this big brain building and it's, but inside it's obviously very grand well yeah um and also as well it's really interesting is that they place it right in front of the Berlin Wall. So there is this real um, sense of um, divide throughout the movie, um, not just um, because of the war and, and, and the Berlin divide, but also the split between Marcos supporters and blank supporters and um, the sort of imagery of young versus old and all of this kind of stuff. So that's really interesting. They placed it literally right there. So it's literally at the forefront. And it really is just a constant reminder of this underlying subplot of the um, red action, uh, red army faction, and the hijackers and stuff, um, mm -hmm. which is commentated on literally with a radio all the way through. Um, but what I thought was quite cool in the inside, although obviously the cinematography between the old and the new is very different, the old and new Suspiria is very different. There's a lot that actually throws back to it. So in the original, um, you guys probably know Argento actually wanted to originally cast children, yeah, but was told he couldn't because of the content. So what he did is he made everything oversized to give the impression of people having to reach up for doorknobs and all of this kind of stuff to give the impression that they were younger. And in this, they don't quite do that, but as you say, it's very grandiose and there's a lot, the, the, the entrance doors to the Tans building are massive. Massive doors, yeah, um, huge. And they have a lot of geometric shapes and a lot of like, and like arrows pointing you in particular directions and stuff, which does, again, it kind of throws back. Um, to the original so although it's still very dull palette and um, it's um, you know it's very kind of of the 70s sort of cinematography and it's there's there's still bits in there that show love for the original I think yeah well inside um, she gets introduced to um, Miss Tanner mm -hmm. who then introduces her to very quickly introduces her to several people uh, including Madame Blanc or oh, Madame Blanc, and um, she has to give an audition straight away. She's been invited. It's very exclusive. Well, she's been invited. She, no, she ha well, she kind of has. She's. It reveals later that she's insisted. So, uh, and yes, of course. She's insisted, and then Miss Tanner actually says, like, I tried to rearrange because today is not a good day with obviously Patricia going missing and stuff. Um, and they're quite blasé of her, but but Madame Blanc senses her. And there's, again, it's all these little clues as to who she is. Mm -hmm. Madame Blanc senses her when she dances and she comes down and all of the other matrons are really quite like, oh shit, like who is this? Why have you got Madame Blanc's attention and stuff? Um, because her dancing is like, I mean, I, I know a bit about dance. I don't know tons about dance. And I, for one, had never seen dancing like this. Um, and I think they were all quite like, surprised by this you know this Amish girl who's come all the way from Ohio and like what can she do oh yeah. shit she can oh, yeah she can dance um so she kind of blows them all away um so for, kind of cool. so for me um my <laughs> theory which I think I might have chatted about before is as you say she she is mother Suspiria and or she has that inside her and yeah. anytime she does a dance first firstly anytime there's any dancing my theory is that that's some kind of a spell they're it doing is, a spell yeah. uh, and secondly whenever there there's any sort of touching that's a transference or they're almost like giving you a power boost you know or taking somebody else's um jumps and giving you their jumps or taking yeah. somebody else's i don't know let's say i, I was a shit I couldn't spin round very well. You take Gav's spinning around ability and give it to me, and, and you're yeah, basically yeah. you're basically building this. You don't want my dance. spinning around. It's, it's exactly, yeah, and this is exactly what Patricia's talking about. She's talking about grooming because what they do is that they choose a girl to be a vessel for Madame Marcos to yeah. like rebirth herself, basically, and they groom you to be this perfect vessel. And to do that, you have to perform this dance, which is a ritual, um, yep. as you say, a spell. Um, to to do 
do that. So you have to be at a certain level of dancing to be able to be strong enough to withstand this this and to perform uh, this ritual. So this is exactly what Patricia was talking about because Patricia was the last person they tried this with. Um, and you see what happens when it fails later on. Um, and so, yeah, and so, yeah, the abs you got that absolutely on the nose, Dan, um, with this whole transference thing. And again, just throw back to that scene with Patricia, one of the psychiatrists that there's books about talks about transference of energy in that book. Um, oh, I did, yeah. I looked it up and stuff because I'm a big nerd. Um, so, but it's, yeah, so it's absolutely that. It's a big ruse then, uh, Dakota. What's her name in this? What's her? Susie. Susie, Susie. <clears throat> of course it is. Um, Susie knows that she's this. She's just... I don't know she does. No, I don't. Okay, no, otherwise it's just a bit like, it. what's the fucking point? Are you doing this for your own uh, uh, humour, you know? I well, think she, she comes yeah. to that um, understanding she is, at so that point in the film. It's a, yeah. a, a, a reborn in, a rebirth in of such, yes. Exactly, yeah. So I don't exactly know how it works, and I think that's kind of cool. You're sort of left to surmise yourself. But I think she's had Mother Suspiriorum in her since birth. Later on, her mother talks about how she's her, how Susie is her greatest sin. So you mean it's in Bloodline? Maybe. I don't know. Um, but I think she's kind of like dormant in her. And then it kind of, as, her, as Susie's skills grow and she starts performing these spells, regardless of whether she knows she's doing it or not, it kind of awakens Mother Suspiriorum in her. But I think Mother Suspiriorum is in some ways, like it's very convenient that she manages to turn up just as, you know, they're needing someone. Magda Marcos is going to die soon. They need someone there. It has to be now. So I think that M Mother Suspiriorum does have this kind of an element of control, but she can't bring herself forward yet because Susie as a vessel has to be ready and she has to be willing. And so when you have these scenes later where she's, you know, having these transference of energy and these talents, that is all steps. And then at some point there's this dream sequence where she wakes up and she screams, I know who I am, I know who I am. It's that yeah. point where we see this turn in Susie where she's, you know, her dancing is extremely erotic. She becomes very confident in herself. She does she understands her place in that's all of her this. awakening and that's her awakening yeah um so i i don't think she knows but you know it's never confirmed so you know if you think about these scenes especially with the the room of mirrors the hall of mirrors um scene if she does know i mean that's fucked up isn't it well let's talk about that scene then if we just push <laughs> push on to that scene really yeah. <clears throat> so Patricia, this is Patricia. Um, is it Patricia in this scene? No, it's Olga, isn't it? No, Olga. Olga, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So Olga is is upset because Patricia is missing, and she is sort of rebelling a bit. Runs off and gets yeah. locked in this Bruce Lee Enter the Dragon Room of Mirrors. <laughs> um, yeah. And all while that's going on, this is the first time that we really get a good dance from Sarah, isn't it? Uh, from Susie. Okay. Um, yeah. So she's almost like being a puppet master because every yeah. move she does makes Olga do that move, but yeah. in such an incredibly painful way. Oh, visceral. So this scene was a contortionist. 99% uh, mm -hmm. of this scene was uh, just a contortionist there was a couple of cgi moments but yeah pretty impressive and incredibly painful looking gab what did you think of the this mirror scene um uh, i actually um when i first watched it i went on youtube and there's a little bit of a making of how they did it and it was yeah, really it was really cool. fascinating to watch um i thought it was really cool uh, i liked it as like this invisible force and she's almost it's almost like they're in the same room having a battle of it, and she's yeah, just sort of going, Hoo -ah, yeah. Street Fighter, Hoo -ah, yeah, yeah, and pushing because her against time, things with force. Every time you see Susie, it's, it's mirrored, more extreme which, is, dance. which is funny because it's in a room of mirrors, so obviously that must be the, the reflection is what they're saying, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's really cool because obviously, you know, trying to film in a hall of mirrors is difficult. They had to green screen all of the mirrors and then CGI all of oh, them God. later. Because otherwise you just see cameras everywhere and people would be like that. Um, but I don't, you can't tell. Like, I, I'd never look at that and go, oh, that's CGI, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, but, they, cool. that, but, but it's not, a lot of it, it was actually practical and the woman doing it, but then obviously... No, no, they're obviously, dancing, yeah. Yeah, obviously the, the, the stuff, where the, the stuff, the jaw and that sort of stuff, that's obviously <laughs> CGI, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, the jaw and the, the ribs... 
um, jutting out. Yeah, um, stuff like that. But yeah, it was it like was a false arm at one point. Yeah, but, like, it was. That is all her. Yeah, and that's great because that's a very good example of uh, using CGI correctly. You know. Uh, sure. Yeah, totally. Which we do kind of seem to get right nowadays a lot more. Actually, it's not really a divide so much. Uh, yeah, yes, we, it's we, good. It's a good so scene. It's horrific. So it's what so you want in a horror movie. Is, and this is her punishment. This is what happens when you try and rebel against the witches. Yeah. They get one of the other witches to fuck you up in yeah. a big and horrible way. And we yeah. find out later on that they get locked downstairs in a terrible place. Um, at the, I'd forgotten about the scene with the hooks, Kate. I messaged you about that scene. Oh, yeah. When they just pick her up. At first, I was like, what are they doing? P- prodding her. And then I was like, oh, that's how they just pick her up. It was They come in with these butcher hooks and oh, they all God. pick a, a bit, limb It's each. a bit Texas Chainsaw Massacre, isn't it? Yeah. And the then they just pick her up and thing. carry her out. It's yeah. Just... And you, with that one, you have... So you, the, the dance contortionist scene, it just doesn't end. It goes on and on and on, and it's just, and then not in a bad way. You're not like, oh, come on, hurry up. Yeah, you think it's going to finish and just keeps going and going. You're like, oh my God. And you get a cutaway scene to Clamperer, um, and it's a very kind of like nondescript scene, but you kind of, oh, thank God for that. Oh no, it's not finished. And so when they come in with the hooks and like, and you hear that music creep in, it's really eerie. And then you, and oh God, and you hit the hooks, and it's it's like, oh, why is this not over yet? Even just showing her piss herself in the middle of yeah. that. Of course, she would piss yourself in the middle of that. Of course like, she it's just that, and then that just adds to it. Like, you've got yeah. blood, you've got piss, you've got yeah. a girl literally rolled up in a ball, and really? then, and then, yeah, she's dribbling everywhere as well. It's the most terrible thing. And then, of course, the hooks and um, picked up and carried out like a piece of oh. meat. Yeah, and it's interesting that you pick up on the on the urine bit because I thought um, it was Luca... dribbling because at first she's dribbling from her mouth and there's a lot coming out. Yeah. So then it cuts to it and you're like, oh, what is that? The first time I oh, thought it was piss, and the second time I thought it wasn't, so I wasn't sure. Or mixture, no, yeah, a mixture of Luca... bodily fluids. <laughs> Ew, yeah, gross. Um, but Luca is actually very much in his other films. Um, he very much doesn't stray away from like the sort of more hidden side of life. You know. Like, he doesn't shy away from body parts. He doesn't shy away from like, you know, toiletry habits or anything like that. And that is very apparent. Like later on, you see Susie having a way to give a urine sample. You probably don't need to see that, but yeah. it just adds that extra bit of realism. I was confused at that <laughs> scene because she kept her pants on, but she just pulled them to the side. Yeah. Um, is that something that girls do? I, uh, it seems I a bit. Mean, it seems no. a bit lazy. <laughs> um, it seems a little bit risky as well. Like, what yeah, you're, you're going to get. There is a good chance. Yeah, exactly. There's a good chance you're going to get some wet Oh knickers. no! Do you know what it'll be? It'll probably be that she's in a leotard. Oh, uh, right. so it's um, easier to yeah, then like, take like, it off. Yeah, because I tell you yeah. what, places it's on a night out. Oh my god, they're a nightmare. I've only dressed um, as a woman once, and I, I, I remember going to the <laughs> toilet, and oh my god, the the hassle of pulling my skirt up, getting my tights down. And I, I ended up sitting down because I was going full Monty with the whole. Uh, I wasn't going naked. I mean, I was in full Monty in my female costume. I, I went as Princess yeah. Die because I went for a bad taste party. Oh my god! Yeah, that, <laughs> I was going to wear a tie around my neck, and I thought that's really fucking bad. Should probably the only that, time I? I ever dressed up as a woman um, was for Halloween about fifteen years ago. Um, I dressed up as Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah. <laughs> Were you sexy? Well, I dress up as a woman every day. So. Were you a sexy Buffy? <laughs> I was very disturbed because I, I had shaved all my beard off back then. And, did you uh, shave your chest? Um, no, no, I didn't. But I did have my then girlfriend's mum's blouse and bra on with balloons in them. Balloons. Uh, balloons. And by the end of the evening, as the popped. older blokes were getting more and more drunk, they'd be like grabbing my butt, going, "Here she is!" Knowing it was me. As men like, do in general. So you were just getting the yeah. you were just getting the the, the, the felt... woman experience. I felt, yeah, exactly. I felt like a piece of meat by the end of it. And I was like, I'm ready oh, to take this off. Us. I know, I know. And that's the only, it's never going to, I'm never going to have a real, real insight, you know, but um, that was as close as I got to feeling what it must be like in some ways. It was weird. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not always, yeah. I mean, I won't go into it, but it's not always, it's not always women, but yeah, we get a lot of it. So yeah, that's quite good. That you, well, not good, but it's. I just wanted to be a badass vampire slayer. Yeah, we just want to be badass women all the time. We don't need to get our asses scraped every two seconds. I made a wooden stake and everything. Oh, that's awesome. I need to see a picture of that. Oh, God. I don't know if I've got one. It's terrifying. But anyway, enough about anyway, drag. Yeah. <laughs> I quite, I, I've got um, to admit that I quite enjoyed being a woman. I, I thought it was all right, actually. Just saying. Did you get free drinks? Because that's the plus side, is that you get a lot of free drinks. I was at a house party. So. Oh, well, they were all free then. 
Yeah, can't remember, yeah. so probably. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, also as well, I just want to just go throwing back now to the, the movie, but um, every time I hear the Volk dance, something inside my chest tightens because I only associate it with horrific, yeah, <laughs> horrific imagery. And that's the bit I... I said earlier, you know, that I re- re- didn't realise how good the score was personally until the second time around. And when I hear that, I'm like, oh shit, this is, you know. Yeah. So and, um, m- moving yeah. on, let's let's keep going. Let's keep the directory <laughs> going. Whereabouts? Uh, what's the what's the next key scenes? Where are we going to the next act? So we've we. Well, we're, just, we're already in the next act. We're in Act Two. Um, so the next they want to find oh, out they, they, there's, there's a mystery element to the film where they're trying to find out what happened to uh, what's she called? Patricia Patricia Yeah. So, so this is actually probably one of the next key scenes is that we're in Clemper's office and he's reading Patricia's diary so we get a massive kind of info dump here um, because she is writing essentially all about the spells the way that the coven works with the school and it, the three mothers theory it reminds um, me of uh, Twin Peaks yeah. Very much oh, yeah. talking to yeah. Jacoby. Is yeah. Dr. Jacoby, is that I think? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and Laura Palmer's chatting the way to him. And he's got her diary and keeps it and he's reading it over and stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. it also reminds me a little bit of the Necronomicon, just with her little drawings and symbols and she's sort of drawn, yeah. you know, all these dance. It's very, she's drawn like um, movement, like uh, uh, stick figures doing different yeah, movements really and symbols. So when I was watching this, I, I won't, read it all out but just for my own I um I paused it and I wrote down everything that you were seeing um and the main things in there that really stick out to you are the three mothers names written yeah. in full um the yeah the the sort of many pointers star like a pentagram but they didn't want to do pentagrams because they thought that was a bit too on the nose so they just made these like overlapping star shapes and each of them have names attached so for it, they and they get more and more elaborate so initially it's just madame marcos madame blanc and a few people and then there's all of the matrons and then this last one is like a full page spread and it's not only all the matrons but also a lot of the students so you have sarah's name in there patricia's written me um you've got olga you've got caroline and a lot of the other girls so you can see how it's this sort of source of spells and powers how it incorporates everyone regardless of whether they know about it or not um and as you say they've got a lot of these sort of like weird grotesque imagery of like bodies through like walls and floors and twisted and all this kind of stuff so that's really kind of cool and he um this is when he kind of because he also there's also notes in there about her involvement with the raf and the and the hijackers and her support of it um because that's kind of like the underlying thing is like is she a terrorist or not and um, and that's the excuse that Madame Blanc says, you know, she's obviously yeah. rather be in a basement making petrol bombs. So let's yeah, get about like, her and move on, you know. Yeah, exactly. That, that's her choice. And that's, you know, what we're going to. So, um, so yeah, so at this point, Clemper actually starts to take these kinds of things seriously. Like not, he doesn't fully believe in witches and stuff yet, but he's like, what if this is actually, the school is a ruse for something else. And he thinks it's potentially, it's a ruse for terrorist involvement. So this is when he goes to the police station and he reports Patricia missing. See, see, you're all saying this so much more clearer than when I watched it. Uh, I watched it and it was so sort of long and drawn out that I started to not be going on with what's going on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And you were saying it's so much more like an interesting film. (laughs) <laughs> we'll, do a, we'll do a watch party and we'll watch it together and by the end of it you're gonna love it i swear to god or can you just or can you just re-edit it for me enough. can you just re-edit it for me yeah <laughs> give um, me the tools and give me some tech know-how and maybe you got, so we got i want to talk about the next scene sorry it, gav well is this might be what you're about to say is this where they go looking for some information and they get their man with his penis oh i was just i was about to say you not yet you get a proper scene now where Madame Blanc and Susie have a proper heart to heart now, and this yeah. is where they they she gets them to find out about Susie's background. And there's a very yeah. interesting um, sentence. That Susie, I know what you're going to say. Yeah, Susie says to her, she said, "How do you feel doing that dance?" Really, because they transferred a bit of power to her already, and she's yeah. already getting addicted to this. Yeah, she's realizing there's more, you know. Mm. Um, and she says, "How did I feel? It felt like I was fucking an fucking animal." An animal. Yeah. But like, David, yeah, do you imagine what it would be like to fuck because she's a virgin? Yeah. But, but an not a human, an animal. And that's not kind of wild. Like, yeah. I was, weird. Bit, I, I was really into that. Um, I, I... <laughs> Fucking hell. 
Loves a bit of bestiality, me. <laughs> no, let me finish. I was into it. I film a lot of dance. Uh, I film a hell of a lot of dance. I've spent hours and hours and hours in the past couple of years filming dance and watching dancers and their performances and how they get into it and stuff like that. So I found that really fascinating and interesting, and I could, I could. Uh, I could understand that, and if I was to shut my eyes, I could almost see a, a dance, uh, uh, animalistic type raw yeah. dance. So I, yeah. I completely understood that, and it's... I, I really appreciated that line actually. No, the kidding, dance, it's that's right. to Kate, you touched on it earlier, but it's now the and, and touching onto that gap as well. The dance does start getting very erotic and sexual now, doesn't it? There's a lot of butts sticking up in the air and. A lot, a lot of sort of breathing and it's just it's getting very sectional and even yes. folk sounds to me like fuck the way they pronounce it sometimes mm-hmm. they're like fuck and it's almost like they're saying fuck will you dance yeah. the fuck and it's almost like they're saying that well, da- um, yeah, well dance sure. is a form of body movement and, and sex is a form of body movement they're very much a, a parallel as in like the movements change a lot and it's a very natural thing. You don't know what's it almost going to be at times. So, you know, and obviously dance is, is routine to set out, but you've got a lot of more freestyle dance. And, I, and this is more in that category. So Yeah. Well, they let Susie do a lot of freestyle, which is where we see her. And it's like, so not only does it sort of represent her growth as a character in terms of she's becoming more in tune with her body and herself, now she's away from this Amish background. But also it makes sense that it's sexualized because if you think about what this is all preparing for, it's preparing for a birth. Mm-hmm. How do you get there? Yeah. Oh, sex. So, you know, it's um, it, it makes sense that it's very sexualized, and um, you know, Dakota's prime for that. Let's be honest. <laughs> and she'd just come out of filming Fifty Shades, so she was like ready to go. Um, but yeah, like um, it, it's a really kind of interesting scene because you really start to see that bond forming between the two of them. You know, Madame Blanc, she is this very kind of matriarchal. Um, character she's very calm very kind i cannot help but feel safe with tilda swinton i know it sounds a weird thing i don't normally like her but but (laughs) modern blanc there is something about her that's so in hypnotizing and even just the way she's always quite handsy and she's always you know she she doesn't touch at one point she does yeah. that back of the a, head. She, yeah, yeah, she, she does she fits this world uh, as a, a key member very very easily for sure, yeah, and she—I mean, she greets everyone with a kiss in the morning. It's very maternal, and yeah, you, and yeah, you just—you feel very safe. And obviously, Susie is learning and all this, and you know, oh, she's they, a proper artist as well. Um, yeah. The way she really is like, okay, no, we're going to do this today. And the way she's uh, changing, she's changing. And uh, funny enough, though, I've actually uh, uh, watched many different dance teachers and all different types. I've watched full on strong, hardcore to uh, very mold and easy. Yeah, just do what you want type thing. And it, it's yeah. interesting. And she, she, she really does that role very well she based it on real choreographers yeah, um, her yeah, yeah. Look you can see that is on real choreographers. Oh, okay um, so yeah she gets um, what she wants, doesn't she? She's like, no music for this one, or this one, I want this music. You know? yeah. And all, all of her teachers are very, all of her staff are very, they just do everything she says. I'm thinking, of, uh, like... I'm thinking of Danny DeVito in It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, where he dresses as uh, uh, the art critic, and he's got a little white uh, wig on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't think of Danny like DeVito that. when I looked at this, but sure. <laughs> can, we, can we do Suspiria with Eddie Murphy and Danny DeVito? Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. no, I, I want to see I that. Would... Be Fred Rowan for that As one. we go along, it we're going to come up with the new version Suspiria of Suspiria. Suspiria to Big Mother's House. Big Mother's Suspiria. Oh, Suspiria. Big Mother's it's Suspiria. Oh, Big Mother's oh, Suspiria. Boom. 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 That's me. double fist, guys. Double fist to you both. Uh, I'm, I'm no, fisting. don't say that. Love a fist. <laughs> oh, you know. You're going to cut that out for the copy that goes to my dad, right? <laughs> Well, I didn't think um, anything of it. I was both giving you just double fists, so that's it. Carry on. Um, well, this um, is so the, the detectives bit now, Gav. So this is the bit that you were talking about earlier, where we, the two detectives come um, to speak to them at the school, isn't it? it it's, is a, that... it's a strange yeah, well, we moment. Have, we actually have a dream sequence first. Just oh, like, yeah, yeah. That's weird. That. Um, so she's had this meeting with Madame Blanc and then all of a sudden, like, she has these dreams and um, it reveals that it's very common for these dreams to occur when you first join. Um, but what we find out is it's actually the matrons and Madame Blanc giving you nightmares. Um, 
and it's all these re and a lot, it was quite what I thought was quite cool about the marketing of this movie is that a lot of the sequences they put in there were from these dreams and it gave the impression of more jump scares and more you know um like more sort of traditional sand, horror tra yeah traditional horror so when you go into watching the movie it's like oh it's not like that at all which I think I love, but I don't know if everyone would. Um, but yeah, so then she has these really, really fucked up dreams with like she thinks of her mum and, and her mum abusing her as a child. Um, she, doesn't she get um, her hand crushed with an with, iron? Yeah, is that because and she was touching herself? Is no, that... she was hiding in a wardrobe, and I think possibly it's what... I thought she was masturbating in the wardrobe. That's oh, what really? I, that's what I got from that, but oh, I don't know. I thought it was because she had because she had seen the Volk performance in New York three times, and she had she had like escaped almost and and did it behind her mum's back. But every time she came back, obviously she would be punished. And I thought yeah. because she was having that conversation about it with Madame Blanc just now, that it was like re-emerging in her dreams. Oh, maybe she is. Maybe maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe I just read too much. No, into no, that. I. I it could, again, like this film is open to so much interpretation. I think like it, any of it could be right. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, so now yeah, now we have the police officers and they come to the school in light of Klemperer's, um So this is a scene now. That I, as soon as I see a scene like this, I think Gab's going to be happy in this scene. There's a couple of older cops turning up, looking into you know what's in trying to investigate, it, especially in a, like a European film. I don't know, Gav, you just love that kind of shit. Do you know what I mean? Like, this. here we go, let's, let's try and figure out what's going on. So I, like, I like mysteries, I like investigations, I like detectives, yeah, I like that shit. You like Jalo, they've got that kind of cop from a Jalo movie vibe about them, do you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely Jalo throwbacks in this movie. And this is, this is where one from wanders off and just finds finds some of the other women and with a, a man just with his trousers, his top half of his clothes is dressed, but his other stuff's hanging out and he's getting prodded with a... Yeah, so Thing. Sarah and Susie, well, Sarah mainly, she's just dragging sort of Susie along, but Sarah is starting to get worried about where Tr Tr Patricia is. She's not heard from her. So she tries to find her file to see if there's any information there. While she's doing that, Susie gets distracted by this giggling. And so she kind of peers through the stacks into the office. And yeah, these two policemen are, you know, drop towel, penises out, and they're getting prodded by the hooks that we previously saw. Oh, oh, I was worried when I first saw it that he was going to get. They're, they're not. They're just. They're just getting prodded at. They're just getting laughed at getting for laughed their at, yeah. for their sizes of and their penis. They're conscious as well. They're they're kind of um, paralysed, but they're kind of conscious and they yeah, like they're hypnotised. Yeah. And this and is the quite... power that these women have. They they exactly. You know, if and you if you think of... fuck with their right. school, they're gonna. They're going to come poke you in the willy. Well, I guess it's looking at society. <laughs> what would be the most thing you could do to show power? Taking your force, which forces you to stop doing things, taking them and humiliating them. But they're doing it for their own pleasure. They don't know anyone else is there. So it's for yeah. themselves and their egos. Yeah, and if you think about actually, it's a kind of a role reversal because normally it's women who get ridiculed and mocked yeah. for their appearances, especially yeah. their sexual attributes. Um, and so it's a very you know, strong. Time, it's, it's them taking the power back and so going, well, you know what? We don't like it. You don't like it either. It's really Tough. putting out there a very strong female film, isn't it? Yeah, and to demas like um, demasculate men like that. I mean, men totally. penises are, are, men are so guarded on it, and to be completely like ridiculed in that way is very powerful. And Susie starts giggling before she leaves back as well. And of course, um, it's, 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 it's a good thing for us because we do love a bit of old man cock on this show. Oh, um, oh so God. it's it's great when that does pop up, if you pardon the pun. So um, they don't no, normally, no. unless you've got Viagra. <laughs> That's very true. Um, so dance practice now. Uh, yeah. This next piece is going to be about rebirths. Now, says, uh, at this point, though, we're an hour into the film. I actually was getting a little bored. Now, I'm wondering how I'd like this film to be a little bit tighter. I'm wondering if this first hour we've seen could have been a bit tighter. I don't know. Is that it, or am I just like, no, you're both not in agreement of that? Uh, I mean, you can always improve things, but I'm quite happy. To be honest yeah. with you, with the pace yeah, so maybe, far. maybe I was being impatient because now, oh, as soon as I wrote that, I remember thinking, as soon as I wrote that, we started going into some other stuff that's more fantasy, dreamscape type stuff, and yeah. more, yeah. almost more horror comes into it at this point, which is fine. I'm happy for a slow burn. I don't know. Maybe I was just being impatient. She yeah, says, um, she says yeah. Susie's going to improvise this dance, and she's, she says this piece of music is called 
open again, doesn't she? Is that right? Yeah, so it's uh, Vida Ufnen, um, which, oh, sorry, Vida Ufnen, um, which means open again. So again, that's very much, I mean... Vaginal the, rebirth. Vagina, yeah, rebirth. It's all very, I mean, motherhood and, and rebirth are like the two driving forces behind this movie. And there is just imagery of that throughout. Um, but yeah, so she says that you guys, like, she says to everyone, right, you will do the piece that we we performed and Susie will improvise and she specifically says that she wants to so she says that um they sh they, they shut all the mirrors and they shut the windows um and and she states that they're to turn their instincts inwards no music um and she says about rebirth the inevitable the inevitable pull that they exert and our efforts to escape them um and she instructs um, Susie to improvise freely because she's very interested in her instincts. So this is basically her and the matron scoping out Susie to see, right, when you're left to your own devices, how do you respond? How do you um, mm -hmm. move? And where are you kind of, what is your driving force? And they're basically saying, is she going to be, is she going to make a vessel? There's already discussion about how natural she is, but they need to see whether that is a natural instinct for this kind of thing and whether she'll be suitable for a vessel. And that's basically what the scene is for. And of course, with this dance, she does indeed prove to them that she, she can do it. She is it because we do see the first glimpse of a rotting hand. Yeah. Um, Marcos. And she's basically... I don't know. I initially thought, is she bringing her to life? But obviously she is already alive, living in the basement downstairs. But she's based, that's her first connection with her, perhaps. Mm. Like Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's this pull, this, this pull towards each other and why Susie feels that she needs to be drawn to the ground, um, even countering Madame Blanc's instruction later on. She just feels this pull because Madame Marcos is there and she's, yeah, she's scoping her out, basically. She says to Sarah afterwards, um, I felt something in, in me, someone or something, mm. when I was doing that dance. So she felt the presence. And that's, a, in turn, she's, she's feeling quite sexualised by it. Yeah. Even though she's a virgin, she hasn't had sex. She's feeling, and she's talked about sex a couple of times now, and she's starting mm. to change, like you said, Kate, she's changing her attitude. She's much more confident, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, her dancing's getting more crazy and erotic and sure and sarah makes a really interesting sort of point it's quite important is that patricia she said oh that's funny because patricia would say that kind of yeah. thing too indicating that patricia was a previous potential vessel um and there's some more dream sequences um yeah we um, have um the late the teachers go out don't they they uh, do they go for a dinner now this bit really tricked me the first time i saw it, and i'd forgotten it the second time because there's that moment where they're all chatting but then you realize they're not actually chatting they are doing it telepathically they and it, it takes me it took me about 30 seconds to realize no one's mouths were moving and i was like oh hang on a minute they're not actually talking out loud they're doing this in their head and they've got this clever thing they can do which i don't think i really seen in another movie where they can have a normal conversation out loud yeah but secretly they're internally having this telepathic conversation so it's anyone seeing them just thinks they're chatting about what wine to order but actually they're yeah. like it's like a glamour do. isn't it yeah it's um, amazing it kind of reminds me dan you're sorry gav um more buffy but you know that scene in buffy in season seven where willow speaks to them telepathically but then you go back to the scene you don't realize at first that there's this uh, kind of right. mental communication going on and then um and there's this, this sort of like it kind of reminded me of that okay um, yeah, yeah. Also, also though it's um uh, I think we might have missed it, but there's this really important scene where they vote for who's going to be in charge. Oh, yes. Do, um, yeah. Just to touch on that, because it is very plot-driven. But um, so they they vote and have, and it comes out Marcos is the winner by three three counts. Um, and um, but what's really interesting is literally like this. You, it's so subtle, you don't realise, but they're not talking. Yeah. They're all milling about, and it's this pan shot that goes around the room, um, but none of them are talking, but they're having this vote and a little bit of dialogue about, you know, the vote. Um, and it's only sort of like, it's very, it doesn't force feed at you at all. Like, you have to be paying attention to notice, oh my gosh, none of them are talking. They're all speaking tele telepathically. Um, so that's kind of cool. And yeah, and Madame Blanc is, is sort of, not is she's not voted as the and that comes into play later why that's so important i would rather uh that shot uh coming from a filmmaker point of view i would rather there'd been a, a couple of close-ups to establish that than 
oh, cut really? back to the wide because I didn't. Uh, it took me a moment, and I was like, "Oh, okay, that's what's going on." Um, I'd enjoyed it more going into that scene, set the set the establishing shot, go a tighter shot to show that and have a conversation between two of them and that just to show that that's what's going on then pull back and have the rest of it i, mean, so I like the fact that it's subtle and it, I, that it doesn't yeah I, uh, that's that's what that's obviously the whole film is in, in i think what works for likeness, me is that it was subtitled but, so you're reading it and you're not and then you realize actually no one's saying well no because uh, yeah i was i was getting conflicting yeah, I think that's why it takes on. you a minute because you're reading the subtitles and not 100 percent focused on them. And that's but just, again, I quite like that. That's just me, uh, small-minded <laughs> and impatient. No, that's all right. <laughs> because I am. We get um, some more visions of, and I've written on my notes here. We get more visions of death, orgasms, pain, snoring, yeah. dancing, and maggots. Lots of, yeah, so that's another throwback to the original. Yeah. <laughs> No raining maggots in this no, one. No raining maggots, but they do have maggots in dreams. And, um, yeah, there is this horrible shot of this woman naked with her legs spread and one of those hooks again yeah. about to... Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, I, oh, I just... Oh. Um, so, <laughs> and there's lots of this kind of stuff. Um, it's all very visceral and all really gross, but it, it does also kind of tell a story. It kind of talks about, it looks at her mum again. Um, and um, there's all of this really distorted screaming and howling and stuff. Um, but it's this point, I think, let me just scroll down on my notes. Yeah, it's after this dream that Susie wakes up screaming, I know who I am. Yeah, I know who and I am now. What, yeah, and this is what Sarah causes Sarah to come into her room to sort of comfort her. And they have this really lovely little moment where Sarah gets into bed with her and they spoon. And Susie says, I've never slept in the bed with anyone but my sister. And Sarah goes, well, we're sisters now. And from this moment, you see this real closeness, this real yeah, kind of friendship that's formed. And it, it's really lovely. Um, it's really cute. Um, but we're in Act 4 now, Taking. So we're about to give um, Susie opens up to speak to them. He speaks to Sarah, Sarah about Patricia um, and the notebook, and they discuss that. And Sarah, Sarah gets very annoyed with him. Yeah, um, she's really upset. She says, "We are only a dance school, nothing more." Yeah, she, this is her home. This is her family and her livelihood. And he's making these really like. And he says, "He's like, I, I and this is where he sort of says like." I don't, it's not that he believes in witches, although Patricia clearly seems to think that, um, but what it might be is that, it, you know, there's still um, a lot of similarities here between sort of, you know, far right groups of people in power where you have, you know, symbology being used um, to um, denote fear and you have all of this stuff where it could be actually, maybe that they're, they're actually something else. There's something else going on here, but to do with more terrorism rather than witchcraft and this is all just a code that patricia's using mm. um but even that because obviously patricia was still sarah's friends and sarah's very worried about her it's still like and it comes from a place of concern which sarah acknowledges but she's still like no that's not true i live there don't be ridiculous i'm off see you later um, um yeah a, a woman totally. shanks herself oh that teacher yeah yeah what did you guys think on what because i this is one of the things that i don't have like a lot of understanding about like what was your guys thoughts of why she does this uh, um, uh, i don't uh, i don't know i was gonna ask you guys that as well i she has I, a, she has in 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 she has inner turmoil uh you can see it through the film yeah uh as it goes along because she she looks kind of like um uh a bit like um woody allen <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! Oh, 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 I don't know about oh, this. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. And uh, and so she's she uh, she has, you can see it on her face, and it occasionally cuts to her. She just, I I'm looking at it. She's just not liking what's going on. And I, she's I'm like, assuming, I I need to end this. I'm assuming that Simple she's that. jealous because. Oh, uh, okay. It's gonna. She sees because these girls are immortal. These women are immortal. She sees her replacement is coming now, and she potentially. She could be moved down the tiers, or she might even be replaced. Yeah. And I think she's just had enough. They've done enough terrible things. Yeah. Her human side is <laughs> seeped through a little bit, and she thinks, "Oh, I've had enough of this." Grabs a knife, and like you said, stabs herself in the neck. It's quite a out of nowhere scene because they're just having a nice breakfast, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, um, they're just, yeah. They're just sat having food and chatting and whatever, and she just sort of sets herself apart. And yeah, you're absolutely right, Gab. Like the 
you can see that in a turmoil on her face. There's several scenes where she's clearly like not feeling good about whatever's going on. Yeah, and I wonder as well if maybe she can sense Susie's power and sense that there's something else going on because she voted Marcos. Mm. Um, and with the sort of this understand, so they they talk about how Mad, um, yeah, Madame Marcos is, they call her mother and she's kind of claimed that she is Mother Suspiriorum and that, um, and that's a, a, the driving force behind why a lot of the matrons vote for her because they feel like she is the bigger power. And I wonder if like, she has a sense, like not necessarily that Susie is actually Mother Suspiriorum, but just has a sense that there's something brewing, like there's another power coming into play. But again, though, in this style of film like it is, you're not going to find out because it's that sort of film. No. Yeah, and again, it's kind of, kind of cool. That's why I want to hear your oh, best hello. theory on it. This is my impatient side coming out again. Oh, <laughs> waving well, my fist. Oh. Well, I really like where, we, where the film heads next, which is where it really feels a bit more like the original Suspiria uh, uh, now where she discovers, she counts the steps just like in the original and yeah. she discovers a, a secret room through the mirror and down the staircase and there's that strange yeah. portrait is it covered in hair? Is that what that is all over that portrait? Yeah, it seems it's probably like, pubic kind of, hair, isn't it? like skin and head hair, like head it's... hair, not pubes, but head hair <laughs> Um, no, I thought pubes maybe because of being it could be pubes though. Yeah, I thought it could have been pubes because of uh, just them being witches Yeah, I mean maybe they would have um, some very long pubes, so real long, long and straight. Oh, it's good. Um, but yeah, it's it's this. Oh, it's really grotesque. But when you first see it, it looks like just some sort of like Art Deco ornate. Like when I was writing notes, because I'd forgotten what it actually looked like. When I was writing notes, I actually initially wrote, "Oh, covered in gold," because I thought it was this very ornate piece. And then we got, I was like, "Oh no!" And I got rid of that note because I was like, "That ain't gold." <laughs> Um, that's gross. And there's lots of weird sculptures and sounds that we hear coming from this mm. corridor. Um, does she make it to the end? I, th I think she runs back, doesn't she? Is that? No, she. she well, she goes. So um, she goes through, and there's all of these like statues um, and um, uh, sort of artwork of like vaginas and breasts and things like very female-driven um, uh, imagery. And she hears this kind of this. Co co um, commotion, which is the staff room because Miss Griffith has just shanked herself, mm. um, and she kind of peeks in, and and then she and then she flees because the, she hears this like screaming, I think, oh, and it sort of jolts her, and she's like, "No, fuck this!" But she on the way out, she grabs one of the hooks. Yeah. Um. So yeah. And then she then she goes and speaks to Klemper again, doesn't she? Now, right, in, a, yeah. in a cafe, and this time she's a bit more. She chats to it because they basically have like a flat out conversation like, are they witches? And she actually gives him the hook, almost mm -hmm. like evidence, you know. Yeah. Look yeah. at this fucking thing. What do you think? They talk about the three mothers. They tell, they say, they talk about their names, darkness. Is it darkness, tears and sighs? Is that That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And they talk about them. And so we know now and he knows that there's fucking witches. There are witches here. Um She's being watched though outside. Um, I don't know. I can't remember which teacher it is. It's, uh, it's Miss Tanner. She's oh, that's right. She's outside watching her. Um, and, and meanwhile, like a, but it's quite funny because there's like a a flurry of protesters followed by police that kind of disrupt her view of of Miss Tanner. And then all of a sudden, it's just this little old lady dressed in black with a black hat, not her classic, black hat. It's classic Jason Bourne. Wait for a train to go by. Yeah, yeah. And then no. you vanish. It's classic. Um, and you kind of. She's obviously shaken, but you're like, you, you know, as an audience, yes, that was Miss Tanner. But as a character, she's like, did I just see that? And she starts to kind of question her. You can see on her face, she kind of is really confused and starts to question things. Now, we're amping up for the final performance here now, aren't we? So we get a nice haircut for Susie. Um, so, yeah, so you were saying about the cutting your hair. There is just one, because obviously most people don't have to cut their hair for a performance, like for a yeah. girl's performance. And what I sort of like established from that is that in um, the Amish and Mennonite society, women's hair is considered to be something that's quite vain um, and promiscuous. And so it's usually hidden under a hat or pinned back. But also they tend not to cut it though, because that's considered a shame. Um, it can happen, but it doesn't happen often. So the fact that they cut Susie's hair, notice how they don't cut anybody else's hair. Mm. They only cut Susie's hair. And so that to me is a sign that it's it, she's sort of further turning her back on the community that she came from and embracing her new life and identity and her, her self-realization and becoming who she's supposed to be. 
and we get the costumes. We see the red ribbon costumes, don't we? Yeah. Um, and they're pretty weird. Um, they look like they don't need much of the imagination, but obviously they are wearing like flesh coloured stuff underneath them. But they kind of, it's very, it's just very striking visual stuff here going for on. For sure. And for me, that's so, um, uh, that one, that to me sort of like, there's a couple of things. Like, one is there's this whole thing of um, Germany's guilt and this passive witness of letting this, these awful things happening. And although you agree things are awful, you don't do anything about it. And it's, it's, there's a, um, a symmetry with it sort of representing the blood on their hands if you think about what Volk the dance is about mm-hmm. um, but also as well just this whole imagery of um, you know feminism and being bound and tied and repressed um, and how in the dance a lot of them they'll lean on each other and things and they still although it's quite a jerky dance there's still a lot of sensuality to it and so even though when you are um, sort of confined by these rigid societal um expectations you still find a way to be feminine um and and obviously as well if you think about rebirth and and blood with that and that kind of thing like it Mm -hmm. all it it says so many things this one very simple rope red costume you know Did, did you guys mention about the doctor finding his mysterious wife uh, that comes up in a bit. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Sorry, because I thought we were on about the end, ba- uh, end no, battle. Yeah, no, end, no. End, end scene. We're end. coming up to that. It is almost yeah. a battle at the end, isn't it? Um, we while that's while they're getting ready and all that stuff. Sarah goes back to the hidden room, doesn't she? Um, and she finds Patricia. She actually finds her. Yeah. And she's a, a, a corpse almost, isn't she? Oh, it's um, awful. Yeah. And, and there's also a limbless body in there as well. Um, and you have Marcos there. I don't know if you guys, it's very quick and you miss it, um, but she sat there and what's really cool, which is someone, this is one of the things that I picked up on the last time I was watching, is that all over there are these, I mean, they basically look like webs, these hanging off the walls and and, yeah, the ceiling. and Madame Marcos's goggles that she wears always reminds me of like an insect and it's like she's the spider Mm -hmm. um and the the girls who are the previous vessels that have failed and she sort of sucks all their energy and they they disintegrate basically as a result of this failure and they're like the flies that she's just continually drawing their life force from she just sits in there waiting she's she's basically got a collection of all the bodies of the that have yeah. ever wronged her just in this room it's fucking weird um so weird. uh when they're getting ready for the dance the girls all chant don't they marcos 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 and that's again that reminded me a bit of um goblin score from the the first yeah uh, as well. um and there's a diagram on the floor as they all enter this room to do the dance and this is one of the diagrams that i'm i'm guessing was in in the notebook from earlier and that's right this, this is where you're really aware that there's going to be a spell or ritual some kind of power is going to be created here when i watched all the dances and and this is both times i've watched it i do feel a sense of um power like there, there is like an energy about it the dance it feels doesn't it yeah, it's very well done. I'm not really someone who considers into dance. I don't know anything about it, but there was something about these dance routines, or not routines, um, where it was, I don't know, you could just feel it. It's a bit scary. A bit, I've never been scared by a dance, but these were a bit scary. Yeah, it's really <laughs> kind of rhythmic and hypnotic. I mean, I just feel the whole thing completely mesmerising. And every time I've watched it, I, for, I always forget about the movie. I'm so taken in by these movements and, and there's music to it, but I mean, all the way through, there are sighs, there's sighs. And if you put on if you put on the uh, subtitles, it's hilarious because every other scene is like <laughs> panting, breathing, heavy breathing, <laughs> wheezing, sighing. Um, and that was a deliberate move on Lucas' part because he, obviously it's all about the mother of sighs. And even, you know, um, Susie's, speech her her voice is very soft and it's it's almost like she just sighs with every breath um and dakota johnson's voice is kind of like that anyway um but it's this sort of theme and there's this like panting and breathing and again it's a bit sexual as well isn't it you know um, or or it sounds like labor at the same time because you have to do a lot of breathing with labor so yeah exactly and also as well there's like um uh, it almost sounds as well to me a little again sort of tying into the the German history of it. It kind of sounds like the Nazi sort of chants, you know, ha, hi, ha, like that kind mm, of stuff. Yeah. 
Um, but Gab, yeah, sure. this is a, probably a part of the now, Gav, where I'm guessing this is probably where you're wanting the, the, the film to kind of start wrapping up now, isn't it? This is why you wanted, you'd rather see a tighter cut of it, because all of this, I'm sure you would, you would rather skip through a little bit to get to the main meat of it, as it were. When it gets to the main meat, uh, I was just like, yeah, nice horror <laughs> movie. Woo-hoo! Yeah. I really enjoy it. <laughs> Did you get, because obviously there's this body horror moment here now with Sarah. She yeah, when they find the bodies, yeah, yeah. So they, they open up these holes. You see them opening up, like, um, and she falls through one. And, um, oh, it is horrible. Like, her leg bone sticks out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and they, they heal, the matrons go down and they heal her. And they basically, they hypnotise they put her under a spell so she finishes the dance because the dance has started without her her eyes look different don't they you can tell she's under a spell well yeah. Susie's and her eyes switch so Susie's ah, eyes right. are blue and they're now brown and vice versa ah, and yeah. again it's one of these things that I don't really have a clear answer for and I couldn't find anything online but it's almost like um, they've had to transfer some of Susie's energy into her to replace the fact that Sarah's not really there Mm. Um, and to continue to dance and bring forth that power sort of thing. So it's, yeah, it's re- again, it's quite subtle, but it's it's a cool effect. And they're doing all of this in front of an audience, these witches. So to me, they're flaunting. They're, they're yeah. showing off. They're like, look, we can do this right under your noses. We're doing this huge spell. This is really important to us as a coven. And you're just thinking it's a dance, you stupid mortals. That's what I get from it. Yeah, and they've specifically kind of, got Klemperer there in Patricia's diary he finds the um sort of advertisement for the dance and so he goes and they they lead him to his seat they they pick up on that he's there they had pre-decided he was going to be their witness Mm -hmm. um and that it was it was going to be a man and it was going to be him because essentially I guess revenge for um sending the coppers their way um and and so they they notice these and they lead him to his seat to make sure he is the most prominent seat there yes. center um so that's quite quite cool that they do that um and all the way through and then when obviously sarah breaks they she breaks through the spell or well susie said this is again so susie says that she derails the um the dance the, the ritual and i'm not entirely sure why yeah i didn't um, get that bit but Sarah, is, it does. And I, this is, again, why I think maybe they transferred some of her energy into Sarah because it looks to me more like Sarah derailed it. Mm. Um, and then when Clemperer sees her in pain, she's screaming and screaming and screaming. That's where he kind of freaks out and he kind of like, there is something really wrong here. Um, Susie goes out to dinner with the teachers. Um, in fact, I think all the, do all the students go out with the they teachers? They all go, yeah. So this must be special if the students and the teachers are all out together. Um, and they have more telepathic talking. And we get to the bit that Gav was talking about now, where Klemper meets his old flame, uh, played by Jessica Harper. But this from is the original an- oh, nice. I didn't know that. Uh, so this is just yeah. a spell, though. She's not actually there. No. no. And it's heartbreaking, really. Yeah, because you think, oh, that's really great for him. And then I thought, oh, how's that going to work with he, her? If she's so, just sort of darted a new life and all that stuff. And I was really drawn into it as actually a thing happening. Bless him. See, because he goes to this little cottage where they used to live or eat. Yeah, it's or their something. country home. Yeah, and he, he has a little sandwich all on his own because he misses her. And he just her. remembers her. And they have, oh, it's so cute. They've, like, See, scratched out a heart with their initials. Yeah. This is why this should be a house. TV show, not a movie. There's too much going on. Yeah. Um, no, I don't, yeah, it would, be, it would work well as a TV show, I think. Um, and, yeah, and so... Um, so they all they get hammered that, now. They get hammered. They all get absolutely hammered. Um, and, yeah, and... Uh, was oh, what very so quickly just fun fact trivia. Uh, Jessica Harper spoke German. She didn't, um, and she had to have a very intense course in German to make sure <laughs> her pronunciations and everything were right because they just speak in German the whole time of the scene. Yeah. And she wanted in on it, and so she was like, "Yeah, I, I, I can speak German. So it's what." Um, and she couldn't. Uh, it's kind of cool that they got her to come back and and, and do this. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. I wondered if she was going to be like a link, like this was going to be a sequel, or. Uh, but they didn't obviously go down that route, and I'm glad they didn't. But yeah, it was cool. It was I really think cool. It's nice. Um, so yeah, so uh, then we have a um, we have the scene where they all go and get absolutely plastered. And I don't know if you guys picked this up. Did you sort of pick up a kind of 
again, it kind of goes into this grooming and predatory kind of um, vibe where the matrons seem to kind of be a bit too close for comfort with some yeah. of the students. Yeah. Um, and they're not very comfortable with it. You can see that a couple of them kind of like lean back and are a little bit like, oh, okay. It got a bit um, Weinstein y, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but what's kind of cool is that you have, so first off, a note Susie is very much aware of her power and she takes a seat at the head of the table opposite Madame Blanc. Yeah, I know, right? Then they, then they eyeball Always. each other. Yeah, and you can tell that they're doing a t- telepathic conversation. Oh, yeah. but we can't see what it is, though. No, because beforehand they've spoken telepathically together, much to Madame Blanc's surprise, um, after the dance. And um, they basically, she basically says, look, we have to do this ritual. It has to be um, perfect and you cannot derail it again. Sort of scolds a little bit. And then, yeah, so they have this conversation now across the table, but you're not privy to it. And I always kind of wonder, wonder what they're, what they're saying. I think they're having sex. You, I think well, there's I like a her. sexual thing going on there i get that's what i pick up on but then i always pick up on sex i think it's a power play (laughs) i think it's a power play and until the swinton's character doesn't understand what's going on here and she's a bit scared by at the end when they go towards this ending bit this big battle thing and she's like no it's not right something's wrong in the room like david bowie would if he was there and um (laughs) and uh uh yeah that's that's where she's just going, oh, shit, she's got the power. She's got the power. And Poor old Klemper, while all this is going on, he's been... He comes out of his spell, doesn't he, and realises he's in front of the school. And yeah. they run at him screaming and drag Ooh, him inside. This yeah. reminds me of Texas Chainsaw Massacre um, and Leatherface dragging the woman, uh, uh, the exactly, guy away. Yeah, or the woman, yeah. uh, no, the woman, <laughs> he puts his arms around the woman drags away. It's exactly like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, horrific in the way it is yeah. uh, uh, a uh, uh, attack on the senses of the poor guy who's old and frail and these high pitched, loud women ah! coming yes. at him. God, I'd be scared. There's this really great line, um, which you don't miss because it's in subtitles, where one of them who's, who's grabbed him, um, they. Hold on, is that where I've lost it now? Um, like they say that um, when women tell you the truth, you don't pity them, you tell them they have delusions, um, which sort of alludes to sort of, you know, um, gaslight, the term gaslighting, which yeah. makes someone feel like they're, they're not, they're going nuts and, oh, don't be stupid and all that, knowing full well um, that they're actually right. Um, assault victims not being believed and you having to go through ridiculous amounts to get validation for something that is awful that happened to you. Um, mm. And it's, it's it's kind of, as well, it alludes to how he viewed Patricia. You know, she, she he said she's delusional and she's crazy and all of this, when actually she's 100% right. Um, and it's only when it's too late does he actually come to this realisation and he's literally forced, he's forced to bear witness to this witchcraft um, does he realise that, oh gosh, no, Patricia was right all the time. And it's the it's often the way with um, with domestic violence and things, like people aren't believed until it's too late and, well, it's too late. Um, yeah. And then also it does, not again, it, it has um, a reference to the German guilt and this passive witness style of like, they know what's going on, but they don't do anything. And it's and it's only when actually that men give it credence and 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 validate it is it then taken seriously. It's like so many things in women's lives are only supported or given any kind of credibility once a man okay's it. Um, and it's just this one sentence, and it's so kind of flyaway, but it just says so much. It also demonstrates um, that they're, they've been around for a long time because they've seen oh, yeah. women's roles, you know, changing throughout the, the ages as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, so um, Sarah, Susie goes into the hidden room now and we've got the sort of the main attraction, as it were. She walks down yeah. and every, everybody is stark, bollock naked, um, including poor old Clemperer who's crying, lying there, all naked and so, old. I <laughs> totally loved it now. I was straight back in with, great, this is the horror movie I want to watch. Not because it's just lots of naked people, but because it was just the, uh, I loved the fucking what was going on, just like the formation of the, uh, the women and... Uh, the pattern of it and the, the way it was all set up, and then you got, yeah. then you got Jabba the uh, Hutt's Jabba the Hutt's little mate slug woman there hanging out as well, <laughs> uh, with arms hanging off her arms, and it's just been like, what the hell's going on? And I, I love this bit. Um, I yeah. really enjoyed it until, like I said, it goes into the shit music video in a bit. There's a scene no no where they gut um, uh, Sarah. Is it Sarah? Sarah, isn't it? They yeah. and they just pull her guts out, and it's. 
oh it's fucking it's done really well mm. um yeah uh yeah, all it's... this is going on and and susie t- quite scarily now says i'm ready madam i'm ready and yeah. she is ready to just become what she is really um my my notes say marcos looks fucking rank <laughs> um she blank madame blank is really unsure of this now you can tell now yeah. suddenly she's like fuck this isn't going well yeah well, um, all the way through she's had this kind of this hesitance to to rush through things she's like no because of what's happened before with the failed vessels and it destroying these girls she's like I will decide when Susie is ready. I will do. It's not down to Madame Marcos. We need to be careful. And then, but, and even though Susie is obviously ready, like she says it herself, like even there, but she's still unsure because she is, this is it. This, she's the ego. She is calm and she sees things. She doesn't rush. Whereas Marcos is the id and she just is overzealous with it and just wants yes. it done now, now, now. Um, and then, yeah, and then so Susie says, like, I, I am ready. And Sorry. Sorry. poor old, no, no, poor old uh, Blanc uh, gets her head ripped off pretty much, doesn't she? She's like a Pez dispenser. Yeah, she does. And I, in fact, we find out later on, she's actually barely still alive. Was it, That didn't even kill her. Well, this is, I have... I, Which I have, is like, a bit weird. Is that, bit, is that because like, she's got magic powers and shit? And she's a witch, well, isn't you it? Would think that, you would think that Marcos would know about this, right? If like, she would know what kills her, um, and I wonder if um, it was because of her bond with her. I wonder if it's Mother Superiorum, because all of the matrons are really surprised that she's still alive. You have a shot of Madame Tanner, and she looks shit scared because yeah. obviously she's a big Marcos supporter. That's because most of her fro- it, throat's ripped o- open. I'd yeah, be surprised well, as if, well. If that was, yeah, but if that had, if you had. If you knew that that wasn't going to kill her, if that was something that you could come back from, you wouldn't be surprised. You'd be like, oh, yeah, no, she's just rejuvenated herself. It's all good. Yeah, but, yeah. like, Miss Hannah looks shit scared. Miss Marks, who's the one who finds her, shrieks with delight. What, what, um, what's the point of her still being alive? What does that tell us in the story? I think it's so she can witness it all, uh, see it all happening, uh, maybe as some kind of a punishment. I don't know. I didn't see a point of it. Or I think like maybe um, his mother's spirit brings her back because they have this bond, and it's just because she and she just continues to guide the school, um, or you know, or like something with, you know, it, it just never ends. There's just this continual cycle of rebirth and repeat, wash, wash rinse, repeat kind of thing. Um, but again, it's one of these things that are never clarified, and it's kind of it's kind of nice to have your own interpretations. Uh, she, then, then it goes into this. Then it goes into her wandering around the room, saying to people, "What do you want to do? Yeah, I want to die." And she kills him, doesn't she? She yeah, says, well, "Reject your mother. Death to any other mother." Um, and a demon does. Uh, first of all, that we get this demon. Oh, this demon comes death. out. That's kind of cool. I like the demon coming out the drains. That's all right. So or that is death, hole. and that, funnily enough, is played by the same woman who plays Susie's mother. Okay. Oh. So it's quite not it's Eddie quite Murphy. Lovely. No, Eddie Murphy. So again, like it's these like re- repeat actors. But what's quite funny is how she plays both Susie's mother, who was birthed, who was helped birth Superiorum. She has to die in order for Mother Superiorum to be rebirthed, mm. and then the same actress plays Death, who then wipes everybody out who wasn't supportive of Blanc and who supported the false idol of, of Madame Marcos. Um, so it's again, it's all of this kind of symbology and, and stuff, which I just I cannot get enough of. Sorry, Gav. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the, the this is the the scanner scene now, isn't it? This the is a shit scene. music video scene. Um, I, I must admit, I kind of agree with Gav in that I didn't really get the whole angle, slow motion, juddery. But I know it was supposed to be quite a jarring, weird scene, but I, I don't. I don't. I quite don't, would have liked this scene maybe to just play out a bit more smoother. Yeah. Um, There's no. I don't see any point of it. Because it's horrific enough with all the heads exploding. Maybe it was their way yeah. of doing it so they didn't have to show the effect so much. Because it juddered a bit. Uh, I, I don't know. I've don't shown loads of stuff already, so that's not a reason. I don't yeah, know. No, it's a strange. It's a strange um, choice. Yeah, um, I mean, she. Yeah, so she. Yeah, I we have this whole thing where death goes round and kills them all. And then Susie goes down and she grants mercy to Sarah, Olga and Patricia. Um, and she just gives them a peaceful death. She gives them what they ask for. Mm. Um, and it, it sort of just shows that witchcraft doesn't have to be evil. Women in power does. It's not just about 
and it creates this balance of all the people who abused their power, Marcos and her followers who abused this power, um, how they get, you know, they get their heads exploded, done, done. But, um, but the, the supporters or the people who were innocent in this, um, she grants them mercy. And it's about, again, it's all finding this balance. It's not about one way or the other. It's just making sure it's balanced. Um, in regards to the, the music video, sort of asked that, I, I can't tell you. I don't, I don't know why. It's on the <laughs> but um, it's, but what's quite cool is that um, the song is uh, the Tom York song over the um, the top is called Unmade. And again, it will kind of ties in with that like rebirth stuff. Um, but um, it's like it's like a lullaby. It's very contrasting. Yeah, to what's that's happening weird. On the scene. And again, it sort of relates to motherhood. And um, yeah, and there's even this lyric, which is quite obvious as you listen it, it says come under my wings little bird so again it's all ties in with this sort of like maternity sort of feel um but i don't know maybe luca just liked the effect maybe yeah maybe susie gets uh, almost a chest vagina now yes she does um which is terrifying and very cgi <laughs> as well yeah yeah it did look um, a bit cgi yeah well, it was it was a practical effect. It was like a thing that was put on her, but then there was additional CGI put over the top to create that movement. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that again is all about rebirth. She births herself, so it's natural. Yeah. Well, I mean, saying natural is not natural, but like, you know, she is quite. Well, yeah, she would have a vagina opening out that she pulls open to rebirth yeah. herself. <laughs> you know, all kind of. She makes says, sense. "I I am the mother," doesn't she? She um... says, "I am she." Because yeah. she she calls Marcos out. It's such fuck. This is what I mean. It's like it's not necessarily a big reveal of like, oh shit, like oh I didn't see that coming. It's kind of like oh shit, Marcos, you are fucked. Because like she calls Mother Marcos out. She goes like, okay, so so sorry, who are you again? Oh, of the three mothers, which one do you say you are? Oh, your mother's. Is, oh well, shit. Well, guess what? I am, bitch. You know that is yeah. that kind of. You've just admitted that you are a false idol. You've just admitted that you have been lying and um, disrespectful and, and abusing your power. Um, and guess what? I'm here to take you out. I am she. Um, and that just, for me, is just like, oh, dang, girl. You know, that kind of thing of it. And, but... and, and that's where she goes around and kills the other yeah. students now. Yeah. Um, and and then... she, kills, she kills the three because she grants them mercy. The Sorry, other students, yeah. the students aren't actually... Uh, oh, no, they are. They're... Um, but she doesn't kill them. She just kills the matrons that were supporting Marcos and not. And then uh, this kind of scene kind of ends, and then it's morning, and it's kind of like when you're walking home at five in the morning. From I thought the movie was going to end here. I, I, I thought the film was going to end here. It's like yes. Well, Klemper is shown out of the school, looking a bit worse for wear. He's obviously he's yeah. seen some terrible things, and he sort of wanders off. Uh, he doesn't really know what he's getting what he's, way he's yeah going. he's literally oh, it's yeah. like you're coming out of a house party or a club at four in the morning you're just like what where am i what the fuck am i doing how do i get home what's quite cool though is that miss marks is very tender with him but she sings a song and she sings brahms lullaby yeah. which we find out so if you don't know it's, it's again it's one of these things that unless you know like you don't know but brahm is one of the composers that was there at Anka, his wife's birthday that he took her to spice, which was her last memory. So it's almost like she's taunting him further. Mm. Um, which I just kind of, again, it's just one of these little things that I thought was I knew it was cool. the same song. Um, yeah. That's interesting. And we, we see now, this is one of those behind the scenes that they never show you in horror movies, where they're like trying to clean up now the, the, the <laughs> cellar a bit. This is what happens after the, the credits have rolled. All right, we better yeah. clean up this bloody place. It's covered in guts and everything else. And this is where yeah. Madame Blanc's actually just about alive, um, yeah. which is kind of weird. Um, I can't remember what happens actually to her. Nothing really. She just they just find her and that's and that's kind of it. You're left to sort of wonder. But then again, so there was talk, depending on like how this was um how this did and stuff, talk of making it a trilogy. Um oh. so like to like with the original Argento movies ultimately being a trilogy. Um so it maybe it's one of those open ended things that they were gonna continue on in another film, whether we have it or not, we don't know. But again, that kind of relates to the post credit bit with Susie, Mother's of Spiriorum, um, you know, is there going to be more with that? And I, I don't she know. goes to visit Klemper and she says, I regret what my daughters did to you. Yeah. Um, it's an Amazon film. So I predict that I, I'm actually going to go over TV series. I'll put it out there. Do you reckon? Yeah. Yeah. I'm putting it out there. See if they, see if they jump Noted. on that. There we go. Another one of Gab's predictions, everybody. Cause they can do yeah. it. It's Amazon studio. <laughs> so they could easily do it. 
I will take that over the million pounds because that is far more likely to happen than my sudden riches. So I will, uh, I'll happily have your, right. um, it's a spirit TV <laughs> show. Of that. Yeah. Rather than you granting me a million pounds and by your premonitions. Susie, um, wipes his memory, doesn't she? Very nicely. She sort of, it's another mercy that she's granted. Like what you said earlier, Kate, um, yeah. she tells him all about his wife so that he knows where she is. And then she, but then she kind of takes it all away at the same time. Um, wipes his memory. Yeah. So this is kind of this is one of these moments where it it does it's created a divide with people who watched it. So yeah, she she tells him about his wife. She gives him that closure um, because this is the thing he never knew what happened to his wife, and he was looking for her ever since. This is like forty years, um, and she wipes him his memory of not only because she says that she's going to wipe it of of his wife of Patricia, of Sarah, of all the horrible things that he's witnessed. They, you know, done the ritual and although, yes, he was being punished and this is, again, it ties into the German history about him being a passive witness. He doesn't do anything um, to help Patricia. She's flat out telling him what happens and he doesn't believe her. And so this is almost his punishment. But then actually, she's because she says, uh, we need guilt, doctor, and shame, but not yours. Yeah. Um, you know, she's like, you're not a bad person and I'm going to grant you mercy. Um, but then at the same time, though, she doesn't just wipe those memories. He doesn't recognize his aid anymore. And you think she wiped his entire memory. And so because where this whole position of abusive power comes in and how Mother Superior is supposed to create a balance, it then almost contradicts it because she's she takes something away from him that he doesn't ask for. She takes, she gives him this information and then takes it away just as quickly. He would have probably been okay with having that closure of what happened. It's a lovely memory that, um, there's a lovely, sorry, anecdote of, well, not anecdote, but telling of what happened to her. It's like, yes, yeah. she was in a camp, but she wasn't alone. She remembered you. She loved you. And that would have been really good closure for him, but she doesn't let him have it. So she take um, the piss out of him. So, yeah. Yeah, there's an argument. So I've just written here. Um, cause what I a dickhead. Eloquent, a bit more eloquent than me now, probably. Um, but it says so. This is often discussed as a point of abuse. She seems to be acting with good intention, but really, she takes something from him without his consent, leaving him in a potentially worse state. She could have left him with the comforting thoughts of Anka's love and the saving graces of her death, and he would have likely have made peace with it. Now he is not left. Uh, so now he's not left wondering. Instead, she not only takes away the bad memories, but also all of the good. And we don't see him. Um, how, afterwards to see how this affects him but it's probably not good if we're to believe that she is a, you know, a good character um, this contradicts the morals of the story that abusers of power should be punished the passive witnesses should be made to remember and the trauma suffered by abuse victims um, you know, should be um, validated so this is obviously done on purpose and um, Luke is, is definitely supportive of these morals um, you know, so maybe um, it's there to provoke the question, actually, how good is Mother Suspiriorum really? And maybe mm. that, again, this might be something that he intends to um, look at with, with additional movies or something, because there's a lot of talk about him wanting to go back into the more about the three mothers before all of this and how they sort of stemmed and came about. So, so yeah, that's kind of like my takeaway on that. So it kind of seems like a good thing, but is it really? Yeah. Is it, is and then we kind of end with a, the final scene of just a shot of the, the A and the J in the heart. Yeah. Um, we speed through time now and we see... Um, it's modern day. Yeah, and... And that's it. Yeah, and it's kind of um, kind of comes full circle because we have this shot of this train, um, and for the first time as well, it's not raining. It's not because all the way through, it's so bleak. Um, and... Until the morning after the the final spell, when he's when he's shown out, it's not raining. It's all nice and clear and calm all... and quiet. Yeah, it's all snow snow everywhere, and it's really quite beautiful. And then we have the sunny day. Um, and it's quite. Um, kind of and then obviously with the train approaching obviously we kind of start off with Susie's journey is at a train station um and what's quite nice is that they have uh this zoom in um of their initials but it's modern day but it's kind of I don't know to me it just sort of things like love will transcend anything time witchcraft yeah. death everything and all you're left with is love that's kind of what I took from that I just thought it's quite nice no, it's uh, yeah yeah that's that's Suspiria. So that's Suspiria 2018. So me and Kate, obviously, big thumbs up from us. Gav, um, you went into this not. I feel I feel like you still feel the same. It's a bit long. Mm -hmm. 
and pretentious. Is that what you're thinking? Um, uh, you guys put my interest again in the in, the, uh, in it when you're speaking beginning. Then then it, then I just I don't know. I kind of just started checking out a bit. No offense to you guys, it wasn't anything your your conversation. It's just the film itself. Uh, maybe it's just not something massively for me. Um, it's a hard one. It's a hard one for me to give it a thumbs up or thumbs down, actually, because it's it's a finely produced film. It's a good story. There's a good there's good stuff there. I think it depends on the per- type of person you are. If you're yeah. the type of person which is like me, then you're probably not going to like it. But if you're a person like you guys, you're going to like it. So I think as a horror fan, you should pr- you should probably do it as a horror fan because it's a Suspiria remake and Suspiria. But, but don't you know? But, but don't go into it thinking it's a Suspiria remake because I really don't think yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm saying as in a horror fan, as in the stuff that we listen to, uh, listen to, we watch and stuff. Uh, Suspiria is one of the big classics. So for that to be remade yeah. as a horror fan, you should really. You know, if you if you got the tattoo of a horror movie on your pride, uh, you know you show your horrorness on your pride. If that makes sense, you know what I'm saying? On your sleeve, yeah, you know, on your sleeve. Yeah, that's the one. Like your horror on your sleeve. <laughs> fucking hell! I was trying my best at that. I was Jesus just fucking that all up. It's anyway, right. I think you think you should watch it, but uh, I'm kind of giving it a little bit of a thumbs down, to be honest. I it's think it's one that people are going to talk about in years to come and think, yeah. oh, that that. That, that, I missed that the first time around, or I didn't enjoy that the first time around, but and I'd, people might come back to it. I'd happily watch the original. Um, yeah, but they are different different films. The very no, different it, films. Uh, it would make a good type of bill, I think, which because it has that same sort of marmite effect on people. You either love it or you don't. Yeah. Um, it's mother, um, and again with all the kind of symbology and stuff, yeah, like, and just true. how crazy it gets. And I think those two, if you can handle it. Oh my in a god! Row, <laughs> don't put me in a double bill, Suspirian mother. Fuck it. <laughs> they have like a lot of sort of. Um, like as, as they kind of shared bedfellows really so it, i think but again that movie is one that splits it and i think those movies are the ones that are really interesting and i absolutely take on board with everything that you're saying gab like not one point that i go well you're like oh that's stupid or anything like that yeah because... and I, I i completely trust and uh, take on what you're saying is in like the correct thing and you perked up very interesting stuff which i don't see because of the way i watch films this is this is an interesting thing you are a very much keen reader yeah. So you're reading into stuff, I'd say. Oh, yeah. no, that's some sort of weird metaphor there. No, I didn't mean no, that. Is that yeah. But I mean, like, I don't read, and that's uh, only just because my own, my own reasoning is in reading. I do, do enjoy it, but I'm very, very impatient. I think I I possibly actually have some sort of form of ADHD, but um, I'm so imp- I'm like da, 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 things move move move. Come on, let's go 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 go. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And um, with this film, it was very much like that. It didn't yeah. go to my. But I appreciated what you're saying and the subtext and in between the lines. That's and in, it, in particular, I liked obviously what this episode is about. That you managed to always tie it in back into women and you know the female anatomy and everything yeah, else that yeah. was going on in this. Um, I think the that's thing, that to me. The that. booty. But, but I think, like, I think you're absolutely right, Gab. And but, I mean, also as well, like, don't forget, I'm an ex-film student. Jesus Christ, I have to find something in everything. <laughs> and I get really frustrated. Can you can't. switch your mind off and uh, just watch films and not do that? I can. Uh, yeah, no, I can. It, 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 if it is a film, that if you watch American Pie, that, you don't go into a bit. Yeah, oh, okay, I see the way he things. fingered that pie there. It was actually. Uh, a metaphor yeah, for yeah, exactly. uh, all of that yeah um the yeah. patriarch and the matriarch no none of that um no i can absolutely watch movies like doing it but if the if the movie i'm watching evokes that and oh it's, god it's yes and, that, and this i will and i can i ever. can watch that film and just go yes that has got a lot of things and if i wanted to i could go into your world yeah. and do it quite easily uh for but my for my own taken in by that then it's very it's not the film for you for but my own put my legs up yeah, banging on Amazon Prime. It's on Amazon Prime, by the way, because it's an Amazon Prime yeah. original. Uh, and just chucking it on it. and just watching it. It, it just it's two and a half hours in the day and age of how much content there is out there. Do you know what I mean? So for me, yeah. I'm not going to rush to see it again. So, but at least you you appreciate the the making of how oh, of it course works and, and oh, all it's, of that. It's, like, it's, I a, think... it's a finely crafted film. It, it's the yeah. look, the look, and the aesthetic is exactly how it's supposed to be. No doubt. And I love Dakota Johnson. Just love her. Um, and should, I just, I think, we... I think, if, I think if you had, um, if you had the kind of attitude of like, oh no, it's just a shit film. Just, I think that's the only time where I think, well, that makes oh, no you can't, sense. Because no, it's not, a shit, no, film, it's it's not a shit film. Not no, it's not a shit film. No, not at all. No, um, exactly. it's, it's, it's a, it's yeah. a film not for me, but it's a film for you guys. And on that note, okay, should yeah. we have a break and come back with? Is it time to? Yeah. 
I'm just warming up the time machine, actually. It's just uh, started up over there because I've, I've had to put a sidecar on it. Uh, you know, like Wallace and Gromit. <clears throat> so I've got a sidecar on it, Kate. Is that for me? Yeah. So it's just a temporary thing. I hope it doesn't fall off when we're in the time zone. Yeah, because we'll be inside but... just oh, waving to you. Yeah, yeah. Who just... do you think I am? <laughs> well, well, I, I've we... never taken anybody well, else. Should we get into just... it then? Should we get Let's in? Let's get in it now. You ready? Okay, right. I'm, I'm going to shut my door. Kate, put right. on your helmet. Let's okay. go. I've got it on. I've got it on. All right, let's do this. Ready, everyone? Whoa! What's this machine? This is my time machine. Your time machine? Yeah. For the next five minutes, we are going to be the time team. The time team! Whoa! What's this? Look at that! Look at that! Well, he's been dead a hundred years. Look at that! Look at that. That's the Statue of Liberty coming out of the sand. Oh, there's a dinosaur! Oh, my God, look at that. It's something else. And here we are. Here we are. Dan, oh, why is it so? What is that smell in here? Oh, Sorry. did you check on Kate? Is she still there? Oh, Kate, okay. are you all right? No, no, I'm here. I'm here. So I just oh, had great. a bit of trouble with my helmet, and yeah, we're fine. Yeah, I had some trouble with my helmet. Was it a bit tight? <laughs> right. Uh, here we are, guys. 1987. Look, look around you. Cool. Coming, up, coming up to the tail end of the 80s now. And like I said, this is the year I learned uh, about hip hop. Did, didn't you? Guess you what, guys? I wasn't even born yet. Oh my wow. god, that's crazy, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's I was a crazy. year away. They had dinosaurs oh. in '87. Did you know that? <laughs> oh my gosh, no way! Let's look. Let's look for one. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, though. Uh, I tell you what did happen this year. There's a show. I've not. I've not really heard of it, to be honest. But a show called um, The Simpsons. Uh, oh, on the Tracy Ullman mm. show. Yeah, oh, came out yeah. on the Tracy Ullman show. So, so the that... Simpsons have been uh, older than you. Yeah, yeah. That is insane. <laughs> that is actually. I'm not even that young. I'm 32. Like I'm not even that, that young. That makes us seem old because that's. All right, so I I got into Run DMC before you were born. That's even weirder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had uh, disposable contact lenses were created for the first time in 1987. Oh, so, for anybody who wears that. those, I do. Cool. They I started I work tried on them. the Channel Tunnel. Oh yeah, yeah. So that was... H- has everyone been on it? I've not Probably. ever been on the Channel Tunnel. Only yeah. the Time Tunnel. Mm, no. Yeah, no. It's it's all right. I went just after the nine eleven attacks. Um, I was supposed to get a flight to uh, America, uh, America on the on the on the day after the nine eleven attacks, which was interesting. Wow. So we decided to uh, do a week in London skating. Then we got the Euro Eurostar to Paris. Then went down to. Uh, Marseille um, on a train but um, anyway um, uh, when we were in there it was, everyone was just like really freaking out because there was like a couple of guys who of a different skin colour and they had all these people going oh, oh, and looking at them because everyone was oh, everyone oh, was totally oh, oh. everyone was totally freaked out kind of like now funny enough sort of thing but everyone yeah. was like thinking there was going to be a terrorist attack everywhere, everywhere you know yeah, even here, I remember there being all that hype and at school because I was in year nine at this point, um, and um, we and we were all like, "Oh my gosh, World War Three, World War Three And there was all this kind of hype about it. Not hype in a good way, but just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a bit un- unknown, like we are now. Yeah. Yep, like yeah. the same name. Um, yes. Uh, so, what's Thank going you. on in '87, please, Daniel? So, uh, a couple of things that happened that weren't very nice. There's the Brugge ferry disaster happened. I don't know even uh, know what that is. Belgium, uh, 190. 190- 193 people died when the ferry capsized in Belgium. It's quite a big disaster that happened in 1987. Mm. Um, Terry Waite was kidnapped in Beirut and then wasn't released until 1991. So, uh, yes, that happened to him as well. Um, And here's a weird fact for you before we look at pop culture. Um, 1987, they shortened it by a second because they wanted to do something with daylight savings so that year is actually a second shorter than any other year i don't what? know how they do that they what? must have used some of my time technology to do it i'm not sure how they did that i would find strange. those scientists and demand some sort of reimbursement for... i i agree with you i yeah. think i should um the michael jackson album bad was released and boy was he ever bad uh well this, this is year. not proven you can't say these accusations uh, <laughs> I reckon we have to be fairly safe in our, our assumptions there. We, we had some good albums this year, actually. We had Tango in the Night by Fleetwood Mac. Whitney Ooh. Houston released um, I Want to Dance with Somebody, uh, the Whitney, Whitney album. 
George Michael had his Faith album come out. Brian Adams had his Into the Fire. <laughs> Banana Rama dropped their album. Uh, U2 as well. It was just all kicking off in the charts. It was brilliant. Um, movie wise, before we get into horror, because obviously we come back in time just to talk about horror, but movie wise, uh, very good year, like I said earlier. Three Men and a Baby. Uh, Ro- Robocop. Yeah. Sweet. Fatal Attraction. Which we've covered. I prefer Boats to Kingslinked. Uh, uh, Beverly Hills got two, so we got our sequel talking of Eddie Murphy earlier. We got our <laughs> sequel here. <laughs> and uh, talking of um, cocaine comedians, uh, Good Morning Vietnam came out with Robin Williams as well. Oh, I miss him so much. Um, one of the best cr- Christmas movies of all time was released in 1987. Yes, I'm talking Lethal Weapon because it is a Christmas movie. It's a good film. We covered that last year. I haven't seen it. My God. I'm so sorry. Why did I bring her back here? I know. I, was gonna say, I let, like, I let I Sarah see it. Uh, I let Sarah watch it because we're covering it. And she thought it was all right, but she preferred the Die Hard series. I, I, I let her watch Die, Die Hard, Hard 1 and 2, series. and she preferred them. So, fair, fair enough. enough. Fair enough. I'll watch it this Christmas. I pro- that'll be my pledge to you guys. This Christmas, I will watch Lethal Weapon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You'll probably enjoy oh, it. Oh, Okay. Um, the one other movie which I'll mention before we um, get into horror, and that is Dirty Dancing, because that is obviously a, a big, big movie. And um, we talked about Patrick yeah. Swayze recently in one of our most recent episodes. So I miss him there too. we go. Miss him too. He's a ghost now. Aww. You knew quite fancy um, him, don't you? Then I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he. Oh, well, I should say he doesn't. Gav, obviously, but um, everyone, everyone's got a soft spot for the Swayze, surely. Yeah, yeah he's all right. <laughs> well, 87 was a pretty good year for horror. Yeah. We had the very first <laughs> Hellraiser movie come out, which Amazing. spawned about 25 sequels. I saw it in cinema. I saw it in cinema three years ago. Did you? Was when it? I was... It's good. I'm sorry, carry on. That's it. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, Kate. When I was a kid, um, my mate's mum um, had Hellraiser on video, and I remember... Um, <laughs> we were I mean literally this is even before I saw Scream or anything we were literally like six seven years old looking God. at this video case and like I don't know like it just kind of spoke to me we, I don't know what that says about me but um, <laughs> I was just completely transfixed by it and we begged her mum to let us watch it obviously we didn't there was no a chance in hell she was going to let us do it but i just had this memory of pinhead on the cover the box on the back and just being really fascinated by it yeah it's really, video covers, I, man. I, I loved watching it again it's such a good film. it's a really good movie actually and two in fact i would say two is good as well yeah i, I, I remember just ordered the arrow box set actually on blu-ray it's come in this cube and stuff i'm excited for that too. Like, I, I remember being a bit disturbed when i was younger just that this woman was going off and taking people back to her house to have sex them in the daytime which for me was like wild that like, you, you can have Uh-oh. sex in a day like what <laughs> you know and then uh, just um just the whole thing so i watched it where i was very young and uh, and just the whole scenario and just killing people just so this thing underneath the floorboards and it's just so yucky and but but an excellent film what re-watching it a couple of years ago it's just like fucking hell it's great right? fantastic yeah. effects as well really fantastic effects mm-hmm. isn't it um, another movie, which a cult movie, which a lot of people love, um, we actually covered it a long time ago. And Evil Dead Two was dr- oh, as well. Yes. Essentially, a remake of the original. Yeah, but... I like the original, but Part Two is Part Two's fun. I need to do it again. It have, so we, have, we co- have we covered Part Two? We covered it. We covered it with um, Cabin I don't in the Woods. Remember. That's right. I remember that. Okay. Yeah. Another movie that came out this year, my favourite vampire movie of all time. The Lost Boys dropped in 1987. Good film. What a movie. What a great movie. I shall not kill. Oh, that's wrong that tune. saxophone guy. I did, the wrong, I did the wrong sax tune, didn't I? <laughs> do, 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 do. I still believe. I that still believe. believe. Yeah. That, that scene God, just makes me happy. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> like oh my God. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3. So we are moving into the third of the series now. Yeah. I don't know if I've seen that one. Meh. Nah. It's, love- it's regarded Jeez. in the uh, fan fan of the uh, uh, series as uh, one of the better ones after part one. I like uh, the homoerotic part two, personally. Me too. Oh. We should cover uh, that, Gav. We should cover that. I think I've only seen the first one, actually, come to think of it. We're just going to have gay puns all the way through it. Cool. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, 
down for that. Brilliant. Um, talking of Catherine Bigelow, 1987, yeah. Near Dark. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't like that. We we did that for our yeah. Western episode. You didn't like that as much. Uh, did you, uh, every time I watched it, being a bit like, meh. Yeah. Well, well, this take... year, this year, 87, just saying about Catherine Bigelow, had four female directors for horror movies, and it is the year in the 80s that had the most female horror directors. Wow. So what were the four films? Do you know? Yeah, I've got them all listed, obviously. So near the um, <laughs> Honestly, after we record, I'm going to show you my notes and you guys are just going to be like, what? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's got Summer Party Massacre 2 by Deborah Brock. Oh, yeah. Blood Diner by Jackie Carter. Oh, yeah, yeah, Blood of course. Oh. Um, and Blood Sisters by Roberta Finley. Oh, um, yeah. So and, and then Near Dark by Catherine Bigelow. So that was your female director. So wow. Um, yeah, Blood Sisters, I've not seen, but I've heard is quite gnarly. I've got Blood Sisters on VHS over I've there. I've never seen that. And is it gnarly? I don't remember it being gnarly. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, I've yeah. only seen Blood Diner and obviously um, Near Dark out of those four, if I'm honest with you. Uh, oh, no, no, I have seen Slumber Party. Um, it's part two, did you say? I've not seen part, part two, two yeah. I've only seen part one. Yeah, I've seen I've seen I've two, seen three of those uh, what else is What else is happening, S- dude? Well, one of the greatest horror children action comedies of all time, The Monster Squad, was oh. that's yeah. a hell of, hell of a movie. Um, gets a lot of love. I think we covered it a long time ago for your birthday, Gav, didn't we? Yeah. We did. And it wasn't time until recently. I'm gutted. It's a great film. Um, unfortunately, it should have been better than it is. That's the trouble, isn't it, from that film we I'll take home. Still got one of the greatest on-screen werewolves of all time. And uh, he's got nods. Mm-hmm. So... Got nods. Um, John Carpenter, 1987, Prince of Darkness. Of course he is. I need to watch it again. Yeah. Great movie. Love that movie. Um, Creep Show 2. Good film. Yeah. Movie. That's on Prime right now. Thanks to the rod lady. <laughs> Thanks to the rod lady. Is that the one with the cake as well? No, that that's the first part one. one. Yeah. We're covering these two soon, aren't we? We are, we are very soon, actually. Have you said it already? I we no, no, we haven't. It, it, yeah, um, this, is a, this is what it's like for me, Kate. I don't have a fucking clue what we've... I'll, I'll message him and say, let's cover that, you guys, we've done it. Uh, okay. Yeah, I was actually having... The, I was like, oh, well, um, like for movies, I was like, oh, no, but they've done that. Oh, no, but they've done that. Yeah. Stephen Dorff debuted on screen in one of my favourite kiddie sort of horrors, The Gate. Isn't that... I love that movie. What's the movie he did which was by um, old uh, pedo director? I don't which know one? if it was that one. Was Where that was that one? Um, he's not anymore. I feel I shouldn't say that because he went to prison and did his time, so I feel he is not... You just say he's not anymore. Well, he is... <laughs> But I don't it, think that's how that works. Is that not how it works? So once you've done prison time, you, you're now you're not that person anymore. Is that not how it works? That's, unfortunately, that your is conscience is clear, works. isn't it? Oh, after you've done your time, surely that's I how mean, it works. I mean, the eyes of the law, sure, sure but um. Uh, yeah, um, he did Jeepers Creepers. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it wasn't him. It wasn't him. Okay. Uh, the, the gate is the one where he finds the gate in the garden, and uh, it's yeah, yeah, no, your... that's a cool movie. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, nice eighties mm. flick. Towards the, towards the end of the eighties, it was kind of cool. Like the eighty-seven time, you did get quite a lot of fun films. Uh, I remember rushing home from my paper round to go home and watch Lost Boys because I'd watch yeah, it. Ev- but... I'd watch it all the time, over and over and over. Um, yeah, eighty-seven was a cool time. We're starting to get towards going into the nineties, where it will go a little shit for a while. The big old thing, but it won't up. be much right until we get to like ninety six. Yeah. The only other one really um, is um, dolls, and I want to mention that because obviously Stuart Gordon, uh, who passed away very recently. Yeah. Mm. Uh, oh yes, rest in peace, Stuart Gordon, <laughs> who once retweeted yeah, uh, me. Wow. He once what? Retweeted me. Could he? Oh, that's yeah. cool. Oh, that's nice. Um terrible movie that came out this year was a return to salem's lot if you've ever seen it oh God, it's yeah. laughable the uh, the effect is just fucking terrible yes not um, needed and that's by larry cohen I, I think directed it oh, you say stuart gordon directed it i thought it was larry cohen yeah. uh dolls he oh sorry i'm thinking of uh, the salem thing uh remake no, uh, no, uh, no. a sequel salem's thing salem's thing salem's thing salem's lot fucking hell let me find out who directed it. I'm talking about a long movie. That's a long movie. What's that? Uh, the so, first oh, one yeah, or the good. second one? But that, but that, was, a, one. that was a TV show, though. Yeah, I know. Larry Cohen. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
Um, the only other movie which I wanted to mention, out of because there are loads and loads of really crap slashers that came out, but another one of our favourite Christmas movies, Gav, Jules the Revenge. Jules came out or like, Jules? Michael Caine. Michael Caine. Ellen. Hello. Get, Ellen, get Hello. off your knickers. Ellen. <laughs> Let me show you something, Ellen, in the bushes. Come on over here. Come on in. Yeah. Every time I eat, you know, freshly cracks me up. <laughs> so that's your 987. Um, I think the take-home ones, really, from that are, are going to be things like, obviously, Hellraiser. Um, I'm a big fan of the Monster Squad, so I, if I could pick two, I'd pick those two, really. Okay. Yeah. But- not, not Jaws Revenge. No, I mean obviously as a Christmas movie, <laughs> two great Christmas <laughs> movies this year: it, *Lethal it, Weapon*, *Jaws: Revenge*. It is, it is a fun film. Uh, got to admit, it was quite a fun film. *Jaws* three, especially that, after watching like the third it. one. Fucking hell, that Jaws third 3, one is just. I had, shit. I've got a DVD downstairs of *Jaws* three, and I don't want it. And Daisy said she wanted it. <laughs> Daisy said she she wanted it, and I was like, fine, just take it. And every time I put it into the kids' movie collection, it always comes back to my my collection. It's like I don't want the fucking film, please. It's one thing you can. Jaws fucking free. But anyway, yes. Um, well, thank you for that. Uh, does that mean we've got to squeeze back in here again? Can we just get Kate in here with us rather than her yeah, on the sidecar? Because if we I'm lose her, where is she going to end up? She could end up in 1925 or 2080, you know. Or even worse, 2020. Yeah, it's probably better <laughs> oh, than being here, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, we got to yeah. go back there now anyway, so. All right, well, let's all squeeze in. You um, ready, guys? Where's my helmet? <laughs> Smile. Do you know, are you sure we're going the right way? I've never been lost in my life. <laughs> There's only one way out of this chamber, and that's down the pipe. I'm stuck! I can't breathe! Okay, Sarah, you have to calm down. I'm coming, I'm coming back, okay? Okay. Okay, move! Now! Now! This is not good, guys. Can we get out of here? Which way? I don't know. Sarah, but she saw someone back there. So what? I don't think I saw someone. I saw someone! No, you heard something and you saw what you wanted to see. It's the dark. It plays tricks on people. A caving expedition goes horribly wrong as the explorers become trapped and ultimately pursued by a strange breed of predators. Ooh. Is Neil, it? Neil Marshall a uh, follow-up, I think, yep. to uh, Dog Soldiers? It was. Yes. Um, two mo- what right. a great two movies to start his career off, really. Yeah. Uh, it cements, of it pretty much cements him as a genre filmmaker. Um, I'm sure he's happy with that, but that put him in the category of horror directors, didn't it? Well, he didn't want to direct this mm. because he didn't be um, tarred with that brush. He said, I don't want to be seen as a, a horror film director, but he ended up getting persuaded to, to do this in the end anyway. Um, he actually he came back to horror. horror. Well, he comes back to horror recently, didn't he, with Hellboy last year? Um, mm. He's done horror type movies then like he did, uh, then he did Doomsday, like a, a Centrium. Yeah, and those t- it's Doomsday and Centrium, I think. And I was just like, nah, not, not. Yeah, it's a shame. I, I really like yeah. those first two films, but then it's been. Mm. As much as I love um, Dog Soldiers, this is the better film. It's so well crafted and shot. I know. Yeah. Gav- 
there is an element that you don't like towards the end, which we'll, we'll get into. But overall, there's a lot going for it. And, and what I like about it is he's obviously he directed the very boisterous dog soldiers it's just six blokes blokey blokes uh, this so is blokes. the reversal of it it's a, a load of chicks but they're not girly girls either they're they're not your typical you know uh, no. they're, they're very out they do a lot more than i i've got the guts to do any of the shit that they're doing oh, Fucking, i can't even swim properly yeah. they're going down white river and water after in and climbing down yeah, holes yeah. I know. It, well, it, for you, about, um, if if this was a movie about Dan and his life, it would be him attempting to get into a swimming pool, and that. Be, <laughs> and no, everyone'd be like, "Is this scary?" It'd be like all these close-up angles of his face going, "Ah, ah," trying to get into um, some water. What were you going to say, Kate? Um, I was going to say the original script actually had a mixture of uh, male and female roles, um, but the I think it was the producer um, said about. Um, making it all female because um, it's not really been done much. It's something you kind of don't really see. Um, and then, so uh, Neil Marshall really quite liked the idea, but to make sure that the characters were fully developed and didn't sort of fall into any stereotypes, literally what you're saying, he um, he spoke to his all of his female friends about you know how women talk to each other and and all of this kind of things. And he was really interested in turning that gender stereotype on its head, um, which is something that kind of comes up a lot in the movies: the way that they fight and the talk, the way they talk to each other, and all this kind of stuff it's it's not what you would classically assume is a female kind of um way of being i guess interestingly of, oh sorry Gav. i was gonna say interestingly i am uh as everybody knows i've said it many times me and dan were in a movie called shadow of death blah 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 i had to actually write this is the first time i wrote a movie that was and i had to write for three female character friends um mm. but i just wrote it as individual people and i didn't actually put sex in it I just mm. wrote it as three yeah, people exactly. and they just had their personalities. I didn't have a male or female. So I wrote three characters and, and what they say in the movie is pretty much to the script what I wrote and it comes across absolutely fine, which is a, an interesting thing. It's only later on after doing that, I realised I'd done that and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. But I just didn't think about it, you know? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Two, two things I would say off the back of that. Firstly, I was going to say the reason I, I think this movie works so well is is a big part of it is the writing for the, the characters. They feel like they have been mm. friends for years. They know each other yeah, really yeah. well. They're very comfortable with each other. And they feel, seem like real girls. Actually, people that you probably just want to be friends with. They seem pretty cool. Oh, um, God, yeah. A bit too crazy maybe for me, but um, cool, uh, you know. But the other thing I was going to say is like talking of like writing for women and that, um, Joss Whedon, you know, wrote Buffy the Vampire Slayer, like, but he's yeah. incredible at writing for women, and yeah. and I think you can it can be the other way around as well. Like, uh, I don't know, we talked about Catherine Bigelow. Maybe the reason why something like Near Dark, people like that, is because and then she didn't she direct um, um, uh, Point Break? Yes. How blokey yeah. is that film? But Catherine Bigelow directed it. Then it's... The Hurt Locker, which you would probably look at as a male-driven film, well, yeah. pretty much is, but you'd think it in your head if you knew the premise. You'd be like, yeah, yeah. that's probably going to be I'll more be men it. than women. Yeah, just mm. you just would. Yeah. It's interesting. But, yeah, um, no, okay, so what's going on with this film? It's, it's these five friends who are very strong, and uh, we, well, we start <laughs> off with a bit of a car crash, don't we? Yeah, so we got a bit of white water raft in, yeah. just to cement that these girls loved they're extreme extreme sport. extreme <laughs> if this was the 90s they'd be drinking pepsi max and doing rollerblading and everything else yeah. um yeah and what i love and this is obviously spoilers guys for if you haven't seen the descent go watch it now but what i love I is it. straight away you get this little bit of between Juno, one mm -hmm. of the girls in it, and Sarah's... Is it Sarah? It's Sarah. Yeah, Sarah's husband. And Sarah's Paul. husband, Paul. You can see there's a little something there. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's quite interesting. He goes to her to help her with her helmet, not his wife. Yeah, and I bet um, she helped him with his helmet, too. I didn't, I didn't even say it. I was like, don't say it. Oh, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, and and she kind of like looks longingly at him and and all of this. I don't like Gino. I'm, this is going to be apparent. Oh, dude. I don't like Gino. I fucking hate Gino. She you is. Know what? She's a cunt. She's up. <laughs> she's up there with the mayor from Jules <laughs> and and Jenny from Forrest Gump. Oh. Those three. Yeah. Hate them all. Jenny. Jenny. Good girl. Jenny. 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 Jenny.
Yeah, so we get this amazing car crash now, which comes out of nowhere. Yeah. And it's immediately... It's so, like... It, you just don't see... And no one does. No one in the scene and no one watching sees that coming. No. So within a, within a couple of minutes of this film playing, Sarah's husband and daughter are both completely dead from this terrible car crash. Yeah. Um, Did you notice the little hand twitch of Paul? Like his hand. I twitch. didn't. No, no, I didn't. Oh, when you go that. back and watch it next, whenever that is, just yeah, it, you can just see it as it zooms out, and yeah, it's his hand. I twitch did notice the. Awesome. I did notice the positioning of the pipes that go through, off the lorry. Ooh, a bit final uh, destination. They miss her, yeah. but they obviously go in at such an angle where they would have gone through him and then obviously the child in the back. Yeah, yeah and yeah. you see oh. the blood come from the back seat as well. <laughs> and obviously oh. the woman oh. wake, wakes up in hospital totally devastated by this and totally in shock, which is understandable. Um, but this cements what's gone on um, with this We get woman. a little a little flash to uh, her dreaming about her daughter's birthday cake, etc. And, that and that's what back. they were discussing at the time of the crash was her birthday party. Oh, okay. Did anyone notice that the, that the birthday... So the birthday cake, I feel, is, is, um, is quite interesting because birthday cakes don't aren't normally red, with red icing, and it has these red... Like, I can't remember... I don't know what the actual... Te- there will be a term for it in cooking terminology, but they're, they're like teardrops... Shape, yeah. going around the edge and it's almost like blood drops it's like a premonition almost mm. um and how everything else is black apart from the light that comes from these candles again like in the cage and neil marshall was very particular there's only a couple of times where they had to bend the rules on this but there was a general rule that the only light source that was allowed was from what would actually happen there with the the neon lights and the torches and stuff so it's quite interesting how she has this birthday that she'll never reach with almost what looks like blood going around the birthday cake and it's all in darkness apart from what the candle lights show. Very interesting. I'd and they, noticed they were, this. They were originally yeah. going to have um, a silhouette of one of the crawlers in the mm. hospital, but, but he thought that would... Gives it away mm, a bit too much. And also people would think, well, they're all in her mind then, because it's kind of at oh, the end. Okay. You yeah. Get to the there's probably two or three endings that you can pick from at the end. There was, a, there was, there was, um, he was sort of looking into that as that being like a legit kind of aspect to it. But he, he, yeah, he, he cut that from the hospital scene because it would essentially, it would tell you that that is what's happening. And he, he quite liked the idea of it not being entirely clear. Like you could draw whatever you wanted from it. Okay. And so we jump to a year later. Yeah. Yeah. And we are in the App- App- Appalachian Mountains in, in good old US of America. Ooh. Yeah, so uh, I have. Sorry to interrupt. So I was really, I'm really excited about this. Um, really? Probably it's not worth yeah. my, yeah. <laughs> probably it's, <laughs> even more so. It's probably not worth all my excitement, but I was really, I had this like light bulb moment. So I have a theory about what the crawlers are. Can I, can you just um, humor me and just let me kind of, um, explain about what I think they are and why. Feel free. A little bit. Absolutely, yeah, go for it. Go on then. So, I think that they're, uh, well, it depends on how you pronounce it, Wendigos or Wendigos, because, right, so IMDb confirms the setting of this in North Carolina in the Appalachian Mountains, okay? That area was originally Native American in origin, and Wendigos come from Native American folklore. Um, they had, North Carolina was um, where about 10 communities lived of Native Americans including Roanoke and Waccamore and this is where um, this is where they were they've set the film this yes? is where they are yeah okay and so Wikipedia states this about Wendigos okay so I love how they have the whole page on it <laughs> so the Wendigo is a mythical man-eating creature or evil spirit from the folklore of the First Nations of something I can't pronounce tribes um based in the northern forest of all these places and it says the wendigo is described as a monster with some characteristics characteristics sorry of a human or as a spirit who has possessed a human um being and made them become monstrous monstrous sorry um its influence is said to evoke acts of murder insatiable greed cannibalism um and the cultural taboos against such behaviors and there was this scholar who um was all like he was a scholar on like native americans and stuff and he describes them as being gone to the point of emaciation it's 
de um, desiccated skin pulled tightly over its bones, um, with its bones pushing out against its skin, its complexion, the ash gray of death, um, and its eyes pushed deep back into its sockets. The Wendigo looks like a gaunt skeleton, um, recently disinterred from the grave. Wow. Um, yeah, um, and it says the Wendigo gave off a strange and eerie odor of decay and decomposition, of death and corruption. And there's this whole kind of thing of um, them representing insatiable gluttony and greed, and they're never satisfied, and they're constantly searching for new victims. Um, and there's this mythology that states that um, people can turn into Wendigos um, through either um, resorting to cannibalism or just being in close proximity. Now, this is supported in the movie. So obviously, yeah. we have these explorers that have been there originally. Um, and what if, right, they were trapped there, resorted to cannibalism, and then became the clan that then kind of continued on. And also, being that there are several, like, there's, it, it alludes a little bit to Sarah, um, uh, sort of becoming a crawler later on again like it could be because she's in such close proximity for it um and these kind of things they turn up in lots of supernatural pet cemetery marvel all this kind of stuff so um anyway that's my theory that they're that because they're ah, like. i've always pictured the wendigo as like a, a sasquatch type big hairy thing but <clears throat> that's interesting yeah. Um, I'm very excited. <laughs> um, I did sort of ponder upon it a little bit, but I just figured it's just like some, I don't know. Weird people decided oh, I'm going to go live down here. I don't know. I think they're they're just a race of humans that we just didn't uh, know just exist. Inbreds and inbreds Ooh, and inbreds, like subterranean. Know. kind of thing. But it's one of those um, films. I like the film. Sometimes you get a movie where you don't actually find out what, why, yeah. or what. It's just the movie. You're just set in a day in that place do you know what i mean and considering yeah, that's my theory it's not like the theory oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm just saying i enjoy not when you don't actually sometimes know why and what yeah. the creature thing is and where it comes from but yeah it's, it's nice to have interpretations and uh i believe in it what you want i don't know i, just, I, don't, I don't i feel like hicks or something are just gone maybe they got thrown out of town they get ran out of town and they went and lived out by themselves. No, because they've been they've evolved over hundreds of thousands yeah. of years. Yeah, 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 they're, yeah, they're yeah. really old. Um, they arrive. The girls are arriving in. By the way, Chattooga National Park. Yeah. Anybody, anybody know where the Chattooga River is? Deliverance. Deliverance. So, oh. um, so there's a little nod there. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. And the girls. There's loads all... of nods to Deliverance in here. Indeed. Ooh. One thing that you guys will like, sorry, that I missed out, the Descent <laughs> title credits, they're the same font as John Carpenter movies, um, Big Trouble in Little China, and also Escape from New York. I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> I get from the commentaries. Amazing. Um, yeah, so the girls all arrive. Uh, it's a year later. Um, basically, mm -hmm. the gist here is that they are trying to get Sarah to get her life back again. She's lost her yeah. husband. She lost her daughter. But... It's time to get back to what she loves doing, and that's getting crazy, going Pepsi Max. Yeah. Going and going. So they arrive at this this cabin. Um, they're all a bit delicate around her because some of them haven't seen her for a while. And obviously there's the tension with Juno, which we get really into much later in the film mm. as well. Um, there's a new girl called Holly. Uh, yeah. Juno's protege. Yeah. Uh, uh, is, um, that, is that the one who's from Kill List? Uh, the Irish girl? No, no. Um, she's the Irish one who has the, the leg injury. Um, Sam is my my Anna Burring from Kill List. Okay. Um, she's one of the sisters who... Yeah. We should talk about this cast, because they're a very <laughs> internet, like worldwide cast, aren't they? We've got Irish, yeah. Swedish. Uh, I think American. one of the girls is Malaysian. They've got American, Hong Kong. There's girls from all over the place, Scottish. Um, yeah. And... They work really, really well, and it makes it just feel. Because I'm the first few times I saw this, I never really noticed that they were in America. I've always thought this might take place. This could take place in, in England or Wales. No, or yeah, obviously when it's in the cave, but when it's actually sort of uh, the, going into the tree line, I actually thought it reminded me of Rambo Country, uh, like First Blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know. Uh, I don't know where First Blood's set. Um, it could even be the same sort of geographical area. I don't know. Um, yeah. It but, was shot in Scotland, though. Was it really? Yeah. yeah, shot between Scotland and Pinewood Studios. Because even though it was woodland, I was kind of under the impression it was American woodland. 
So that's, no, that's, so, inter that. that's so interesting. Yeah. While we're on the subject, can we just take a moment and just acknowledge the stunning choreography and like the 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 scenes shots, like the aerial shots. I mean, yeah. There's so many shots of this movie which I would fucking I just, just frame and just have on my wall. Like mm -hmm. it is gorgeous. Yeah, there's some great overhead shots of the car driving along the road and all these sort of. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they're almost shots. kind of cliched nowadays. You get they come originally like from the Shining intro, you know. No, that, it, whole, that was but... a specific homage to the Shining. That one. Oh, like, was it really? There's oh, okay. So many movie references and homages. Well, lo this, loads of people do that anyway with the homage yeah. with those shots. Um, but I always it's... appreciate those shots anyway. They are. They are. Um, quite nice to get you into that sort of thing and I never look at them yeah. as like oh god what plagiarism or whatever um, uh, they are good shots to do so yeah it is you're right the cinematography was quite good yeah it was really then good ob then obviously they had to go into film like in really tight spaces later on which is like such a, mm -hmm. a such a hard thing to do as well We'd especially just get the sound guy in there girl sound person in there <laughs> as well um, do you know what I mean it's yeah it's, it's so yeah it's uh, hands up hands down hands hands all over the place yeah but well, there are a lot of these shots and i think that is just to get that contrast of you know this wide open space clean fresh air because for 70 percent or more of this movie you are in these tight claustrophobic um tunnels and caves where the air is dusty and it's all mm. so yeah claustrophobic so i think it's quite cool that they have um these massively contrasted like wide open space shots uh, to the tight spaces yeah <clears throat> yeah, it's nice. Um, it's yeah, a nice juxtaposition. We have, so I don't think um, I don't think that. Well, I mean, certainly Sarah doesn't know about Juno and her husband. No, um, but I, I have a suspicion that Beth does. Yeah. Um, in fact, no, she does. In fact, we know this. Um, and I don't know about the others, but it's quite. There's kind of a few things. So, um, for example, like Sarah goes in on her own, and she's greeted so warmly by the group. Um, it's really lovely. Um, and as you say, you get this real sense of friendship and long-standing friendship. And then Beth follows her shortly afterwards, and then Juno is kind of approaches last, and they have this shot where like they've got Juno outside the building, everyone else is inside where it's warm and friendly and lovely. Um and she's just sort of set apart from it and it pans across so you can look th you look through the window at these women all enjoying themselves and Juno is just on her own out literally in the cold. And I wonder if like actually the group does know but they don't tell Sarah in light of what's happened because it would just be so awful. She doesn't need to know at this point. Yeah, but she, they, they she just thinks ostracize her a little. Well, she just thinks that Juno. No, what? Is a no, dick what about the leaving. affair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that I wonder if they do at least. It's, at least I, I wouldn't have thought so. I, I don't think so. Some of those friends seem a lot more like a proper friend. I don't think they would allow that. Yeah. Oh, uh, unless they are trying to be like, oh no, she's just come out of that. We can't give her more trauma. But it was a year ago, so no, I think that she'd have been, she wouldn't have been taken to a place of isolation to be told this unless they're right dickheads, because that'd be oh, horrible. God. Oh no, no, not to necessarily tell her. I don't know if they, if they, if they did know. I don't know if they ever would tell her because there would be no point. He's passed away. It's not gonna. Yeah. But I just wonder, or even just like on a subconscious level, because there's all, there's a lot of shots where it you know it's kind of set apart from the group. I tell you what, though, <clears throat> to to bring this in at the intro, they need to bring in this in more. They don't. They just bring us in towards the end bit. Yeah, there's a few nods at the beginning, but not enough it ties for in. it to be a bit on of a story. Film, you probably wouldn't pick up on. on no, you wouldn't. No, you oh, wouldn't. I did. Oh, really? Yeah, but yeah. The, and they, sorry, Karen. You needed a little bit more though. Just another little bit of a something else in the cabin. Just. Well, whenever they talk about Paul, because there's a point where they do bring him up, and Juno does look very kind of. She does react to things, and later on in the cave, she says, she says to Beth, like, "We all lost something in that crash." Um, and it is kind of, it's, and, and at the hospital, you know, she's sobbing, Juno is sobbing while Sarah and Beth are on the floor kind of holding each other. Um, okay. and, and yeah, you could think like she's crying for her friend, but she's really crying for herself. Bitch. Such um, a bitch. God damn. Great jump scare here. Um, middle of the night. Yeah. Sarah wakes up. Um, she's had a bit of a nightmare and she goes over to the window and all of a sudden boom some pipes come through the window it's American Jesus Ralph in London oh. it is it is American Ralph in London but it got me it got me the first couple of watches to be honest with you I, I kind of have seen this movie enough times to know you know that, that it's, it's coming but it's a good jump scale it's really yeah. good very old school horror uh, um, and the next day though they uh, set out don't they in the two cars to their destination which is 
Yeah. Getting us to the second act of the film. Yes, go on. Can I just talk about how much I hate Juno for a second? Um, I know we've talked about it already, but (laughs) just the way that she goes jogging on her own in the morning is so fucking annoying. She's like, I'm going out. And then she goes in and wakes everybody up. Hey, guys. And she does that leg. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I love how um, I love how Holly like sort of attempts to do it. It's kind of a piss take. Yeah. Um, It makes me laugh. But there's this um, uh, this kind of sort of omeny bit where um, she knocks on the door and there's a horseshoe and then it flips upside down as she opens it. Um, But the actress did actually do morning jogs, so maybe they just put it in for. That big god, yeah, she's so annoying. The jogging, well, the, the jogging's fine. I can, I can appreciate someone who wants to go out and do some jogging. It's coming back to and all that. Yeah, but shit. even that because they've all been on the piss the night before, and then yeah, but everyone's geez. different. Oh, well, I uh, no, I'm with you, Dan. So I'll fuck off, Gino. Yeah, Just, yeah. All right, don't gang up on me. <laughs> <fucking hell. laughs> um, so see these guys now driving along, and they're going to what they call level two caves yeah. these are classed as level two caves but it, but um, they're not the right caves are they spoiler yeah this is so another Juno, reason for you to dislike Juno Dan yeah. so she, here she we throws go. the here guy out here we go oh. wind, let's, wind, yeah. him, let's yeah. wind Dan up let's wind him up I've so, got, I've, I'm going to come back to that later though Dan don't worry there's a whole thing that I have about how Juno did it so Juno basically has tricked them all into going to a cave that no one's ever explored. She claims so that Sarah could name it or something like that. But basically, she's just like a, 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 a adrenaline junkie. And it's just an ego trip, isn't it? She's putting them all at risk. Why are they uh, all friends of her? Surely she's done other stuff like this. Oh, I'll tell you what, though, right? Bit of a serious thing. With toxic friendships, you so rarely see that person it's only when you come out of that situation do you start piecing it all together yeah. like i've been in a couple of toxic friendships and i you just yeah like you don't realize it necessarily if they're kind of like if they're not an outward actual dick um it's quite easy to kind of get sucked in unless it's kind of any abusive relationship do you know what i mean like you is know, that also like cult people. leaders yeah yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> i agree i agree i got out of a toxic friendship uh, with a couple of people years ago i don't know if i've had one because i'm too i'm too naive and innocent i don't know if well, I've had I, one I was or... one and now i look back on it alice says to me why were you friends with them they were so horrible to you they basically yeah. bullied you and bullied you into for basically having anxiety I, and i was like i don't know why i was friends with them oh, never i never understand that. that no i never had that but they didn't do it in a very they did it in a very subtle way. They came they they came in my room and made me do jogging and go down mountain caving and stuff with Juno. That's they, it was very subtle. Real subtle, yeah. yeah. Um also, um just back to so I don't know if you guys know this, but there was a um a name for the girls as a group, uh which um I think this they adopted themselves, but also it was used in like headlines for like movie reviews. Guess what it was? What is it? You know what it was? Chicks with picks. <laughs> nice, I like that. That's all right. That's all right. I thought that. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> um, so they set out in two cars to their destination, um, and they're zooming along the roads like no care in the world. Um, and they, um, we get a very nice bit for the audience here, which is basically is like um, the rules of caving. So yeah. one of the girls. She doesn't need to do it because they should all know these rules. But this is for the audience. So she's like, mm-hmm. if you think it's dark when you turn out the light. It's pitch black down there. Mm-hmm. She talks about the air and the dust and the mm-hmm. caving and the water and light coming off of lime and all this kind of stuff. So she lays out all the rules that they're, they're all going to get fucking broken. Uh, yeah. As, Hello, uh, the, Jay. Go on. But it's a nice it's a little bit for the audience. Hey. Uh, I do want just a disclaimer. Hey. Um, just a, the innuendos are going to come because oh, this is about this is tight fun. dark holes which are a little bit moist at times wet, and wet yeah. holes and moist, and yeah. slipping oh, into them that. i i'm sorry it's not going to no, be no don't apologize because guess what they were called the vagina tunnels on set and um okay. one of neil marshall's mates who played oh god i can't remember her name in it but emma <laughs> Beatty, who was the main chick in dog soldiers yeah she what she read the script and she turned around. She's like, "You just made a horror porn movie." Yeah, okay, like, cool. It's just there's stalic there's phallic Im- imagery everywhere. Oh, mate, I got a whole thing. Don't even worry about. It. Yeah, so like, innuendo g- galore. Go for it. Well, weirdly, uh, talking okay. of sex, weirdly the and I don't know why I know this fact. I must have read it on IMDb um, or listened to a commentary or something years ago. But apparently, the lights, the you know, the fluorescent tubes that they used to see in the dark. Yeah. They they didn't have any. They realised, oh my god, that's a prop we haven't got, and they bought them from a sex shop. 
Yeah, they did. Almost a sex shop sell those. I mean, I, I can mean, imagine what they might do with them. But... Summers and we never sold neon lights. I'm telling you, like, I don't know. That's a... I don't know why you would need those. No. My, my next note actually says slip into little hole, nice yeah. and tight. Brilliant. Can I um, just very quickly just touch back on what Dan was saying about the rules and stuff? So what's quite funny, uh, quite interesting with the... Um, <laughs> just always got to try and make it rude, isn't he? That's all right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so on the commentary, we found out that the list of things that they say that, that can go wrong is everything that goes wrong and in order in which it happens. Ah, so you have like dehydration, disorientation, claustrophobia, panic attacks, paranoia, hallucinations, and vis- visual and aural... Aural, yeah, aural... Uh, deterioration. Not oral. Um, yes, not oral. yes, I get, I understand. Um, and what, um, what's that for? Sorry, what is that the symptoms that's, of? So that's the list of things that they say that can go wrong, but that's exactly what happens to them and the in order of how it happens. What can go wrong? What when you go into sp- yeah, when you areas go like that? Things, yeah, like this. That's, is what, like, okay, like, and the, that's for, uh, how how interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> they find a dead uh, stag. Uh, writing it, I suppose. Just goes yeah. from mild to worse to worse to worse. Mm. Well, exactly, yeah, it just it, it builds up. Um, but yeah, so the a cave entrance was actually called the grave. Um, so this kind of like, so they have this whole thing of like, is this sending into hell and all of this, but also like it, um, it just sort of, because obviously when you go in later on, you have this bone lair, this almost catacomb. Yeah. Um, so it's quite sort of apt that it's called the grave because it looks like a grave opening. Just just a little bit. Have you got the corona? Corona. <laughs> uh, some tea um, went down the wrong out, hole. Actually, sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, God. I was just about to say, they see a dead stag all the way there. And the only reason I wanted to bring that up is because this is where we see that Holly is a keen photographer and mm-hmm. she's got a video camera which comes into play later on. So she yes. likes to document things as well. Um, even when they're putting their legs, friend's leg back together, she likes to film that. What a sicko. Um, well, just documenting it, it all. the light as well, doesn't she? Because they have the night vision, so it ends up less not being so much about recording it but about using the I night suppose. vision to see. Yeah. Um, but what's quite um, funny is that there's... Um, uh these these crows so you can i mean the the dead elk and and the crows are obviously both omens but apparently they had to shoot the crows at a green screen at pinewood studio because they wouldn't behave properly on site um and they also ordered 40 of them but only four arrived so they had to kind of work with what they had um so i forgot to put a zero in there when they were the- <laughs> yeah, yeah, slight uh, difference john, isn't it john you had one job here i told you, you ordered 40 crows I got, what am I going to do with four crows? For fuck's sake, John. So yeah. so these ladies have gone down. They found a little hole snuck in, slipped in it. Really? Then, then they find a tight passage. A bit moist. That's what yeah. we're going to say. Oh, also, um, another bit of tribute. Sorry, I'm going to um, not do this all the way through, I promise. Um, but um, Juno's wetsuit is an homage to Burt Reynolds' wetsuit in Deliverance. Sweet. The thing. Um, and also, Holly's helmet has a peace sign, which is a nod to full metal jacket. Um, and later on as well, we see why? Sam has a smiley. Sorry again. Why? Because why? The, the, the peace symbol is like. Yeah, but I mean, why full metal jacket? Oh, what, what? Well, just I don't know. Just because Neil Marshall's a fan, I don't know. This is what he's Deliverance saying. makes sense. Yeah, but I think it's just because he's a film fan. They've got nods to like um, Alien and um, Star Wars later as well. And like, Alien um, makes but, sense. Star Wars yeah. doesn't. No, or, no, I'm no. going to go through it and just shut you down each time you say something. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, this is what he said. This isn't me interpreting. I'm this joking. is literally what he said I'm on joking. commentary. No, I know. Uh, um, carry on. Yeah, um, they also called, because of her hat that she wears, they called her Indiana Juno. Nice. Huh. Even more yeah. reason to hate her. Yeah, I know. Oh, Dan. <laughs> um, I Bless just wanted to say, cons. guys, and again, this is going to be a spoiler, but when they first come down into the main entrance of that, that huge bit, I heard rumours that you can spot crawlers from that scene in the background, mm-hmm. and you can. So I went through this movie, took me probably twice as long to watch, because I'm sat in a different room now, because I'm working from home because of um, what's happening with the world. So I was able to meticulously study any time um, there was a crawler. And I can, you can see they're all over this movie from this point, in the background you see what you think is a rock and then it will slowly move or they pan yeah. over then pan back and whatever was there is gone yeah yeah shadows and they are everywhere they've done a very good shot 
there was one of them. So um, I didn't notice them at this stage, but um, in a minute when they when they end up going into the big wide, the first proper cave that they get to, there is one in the bottom left. That was actually a crew member who wasn't supposed to be there. Um, and it was just by accident. And so they just changed the lighting on it to sort of overexpose him so he seemed really pale and just left him in. Amazing. Yeah. Interesting. So what's going um, on now? What happens? Let's go, let's go. So they get into the caves. Here we go. We're off. We're in the caves. Gab, yeah. I just wanted to ask you, as someone who is a filmmaker and mm-hmm. as an eye, what do you think about the lighting uh, in, in this? Because uh, it's done as, as well. As uh, you said earlier about the uh, natural lighting, um, yeah, um, I thought it was really well shot, actually, um, for the fact it was... What, it couldn't be natural lighting inside the caves. No. No. So it's like from... Sorry. Um, so it's from, like their torches their headlamps uh, yeah. the fire torch that they get later there are a couple of points where they cheat because otherwise it would just be pitch black um but until i re- um, heard the commentary where they were saying about it i literally wouldn't have even said so it's like later on when they're in the bone lair bit um set was searching through and then a slight glow that highlights just the search bones and her just so you can see what is going on otherwise it would just be pitch black but aside from that it's if it if it wouldn't have happened, it's not in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, I thought it was, I thought it was shot well. Yes. Why? What are you going to ask me? They, they also spot some little finger marks on the wall, don't they? Mm, mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, I was going to say this movie is called The Descent because they are descending into the caves, but also because they are descending into fucking madness. Well, Sarah is anyway. Yeah. She, she I, I, hears um, a little giggle, a little <laughs> child's giggle, a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, one of the first times she hears it is here, and it's. Yeah. Uh, Spooky and it's very claustrophobic. Didn't they find some um, uh, old cave paintings, don't they? Uh, that's a bit later on. That's later yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're trying to find their way out. Which is which is good though because they're in this place I think no one's ever gone into. All of a sudden, they're finding that stuff's good because it's like gives you a sense of ah oh, shit, we're nice. We, we we there's a there's a way out. Hopefully, you know. Yeah. Well, that's how yeah. they get out. So we, we will get to that. Um, uh, is it Sarah? So, she gets <clears> stuck. <throat> Yeah, she's loud. Yeah. She gets stuck. Um, and it starts to panic, and, and, and obviously really a well. horrible, Makes... horrible thing to be. You wouldn't want to be there, would you? Oh god! Makes so this me bit feel... was, yeah, this bit was on the test screening. Um, the audience came back and said that this, out of everything, was the scariest bit because it. You can imagine yourself being there, and it's so. Oh, so full on, and um, they they filmed it. They they um, attached a um, uh, the camera to like a. a piece of wood and just pulled it along with a string in front which is why it's kind of shaky and stuff um but also as well like it kind of just you have um you kind of um subconsciously acknowledge the fact that everything they go through now before they even got to the crawlers really to escape they have to go through again and so you know you have it's just this kind of real sort of shit got real kind of moment um because it's always it's kind of been a fairly light-hearted um so far, apart from obviously the death and stuff at the beginning, with the girls, it's all they've all been laughing and joking and whatever. But from now on, it's all like no, like it, yeah. pretty serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, Beth, it... Beth, Beth goes back for her, and she does tell her a joke. Do you remember what the joke was? Yeah. No. She she says, "How do you make? How do you give a lemon, a lemon an orgasm? You tickle it citrus." <laughs> hey, I, didn't, I missed that. <laughs> and that that yeah. takes Sarah's mind off the claustrophobia for a split second enough that she can breathe in and then wiggle yeah. herself. Out. But that's good though because the cave starts to collapse on them, and that is their entrance in. So they are stuck. They are fucked. Yeah. So they can only go forward. They cannot out, go back. So they must carry on into the deep yeah, dark is, holes. This is where they find <laughs> out about um, Juno being a dick, basically. Yeah. Um, well, this is where we find out that she, uh, they're like, yeah, so, okay, so not nice. So, so that's happened. That's cool. We we can find a way out. Okay, we've got the maps. Oh no, no one's been here before. I thought it'd be cool. What? Yeah. Well, you don't do and that. Not only that, but also mountain rescue don't know where they are. They think yeah. they're at these yeah. caves that they thought they were at. So they have no no backup plan, no nothing. Stupid. Um, I'd have said. I'd have loved it. if should have said, "I I kicked the goddamn map into the river. <laughs> it was useless. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was useless. I screwed it up. I kicked it in the river. <laughs> you oh, screw. You God. throw away the map." She basically does. She says, "Like, oh, there's no point in looking at the book because she didn't bring it with her." Um, and Rebecca lays down some truth nuggets. She goes, "This is an ego trip." 
Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, actual truth. So, so yeah, this um, is a shit situation to be in, um, and they carry shit. on, but then they find another si- shit situation where there's a massive drop, and they've got to get across to the other side. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, and because um, they they have to do it more um, painfully and manually than they would have done because Sarah lost the rope bag. Yeah. Um, when so they've, the only, they've only got a couple of ropes between them rather than and the like huge a, bag. And like one or two carabiners. But obviously you need so much more than that to get across this crevice. But luckily um, Rebecca is a fucking hero because she monkey swings across one arm at a time putting these little... Um, pegs in yeah. uh, and they're attaching a rope her, and you can see like her fingers straining oh and her arms she actually sees that an old mountain climber's peg doesn't like she yeah and I don't know how long that's been there but she uses that luckily to attach the last one and get across so one by one <clears throat> they all start going across now um, yeah it's so tense this for me is this is my most nervousy bit. Oh, yeah. um, I don't know if it's because I have like a fear of <clears throat> heights and stuff or what, but oh my god. I, I really like this part of the film, but especially finding that little clip is sort of bringing an element of mystery of like what happened before yeah. this place. Yeah, I like that as well. Um, it's really nice building up that mystery element without it being too horrific and being more of a thriller. Um, uh, th- there is a side of me which is almost like I like. I wonder if this movie would be better if it didn't have the creatures and it was about those guys being stuck there. And it would be a different movie, but it would still it's be like a really good movie. It's like 127 hours, that, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's what it yeah. Like. Yeah. Um, Well, actually, that, this scene, it's funny that you say like you really love the scene and stuff because it was nearly cut. Um, and Neil Marshall had to fight for it. Um, but they didn't want it for length. Um, and originally, the whole scene was 15 minutes long, so he kind of... Uh, compromise and, and he cut it down some, but um, he it's, eventually went out. It's and I lit it, nicely as well. It's very bright red because of yeah, the flares. Yeah, it's gorgeously lit because they look like a flare, don't they? But yeah. also when you look at when you when Juno goes across um, and you're looking down at her, they put um, black velvet underneath her because obviously it's not actually a drop. They put black velvet underneath her, so it's just dense darkness. You I know? was hoping, I was just hoping she'd fall the whole time. <laughs> well, she does later. So. Yeah, she does. Um, yeah. Uh, also, good. as well, when they're making these, when they're going across and they're crying out in pain, apparently the uh, cast kept laughing because it sounded a little orgasmic. <laughs> <laughs> well, she does, yeah. So, um, what happens? She, I oh, know that that's a bit later on. She does that. Sorry, but they Juno all get does across, don't they? Bit, but yeah, they all get across. Uh, and Holly, that this is where they find the cave painting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and this is where they discover, look, there's two entrances to the mountain. Which is Brilliant. Quite, yeah, because they're like, oh, great, no, don't waste a fucking light on that. It's like, well, no, let's have a look. And it's like, ah, oh, that's a good idea. But then she <laughs> goes and falls in a hole and hurts her leg, doesn't she? Yeah, well, she gets over Zella, she sees a light and she thinks it's daylight. So um, basically they're fucked. The they're fucked at this but, point. They're fucked. Yeah, yeah, completely. Absolutely um, and fucked. She, and yeah, we have another... Uh, like bone protrusion just like Suspiria 2018 yeah there's actually um, a lot of I won't go into it there's actually a lot of similarities between these movies coincidentally there's also um, uh, the score changes at this point and is very reminiscent of The Thing John Carter yeah boom, boom. very just another movie about boom, boom. isolation being trapped yeah. somewhere boom, boom. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, also like. <laughs> as well I just want to just because this happens to be where my notes are for this so um, this is what I was going to say, Dan, about Juno. So what I've noticed that is that how every time Juno tries to apparently do something for others, so the trip, um, she retrieves, is rather than just using the rope to get along like the others, she actually goes back and mirrors Rebecca's journey to retrieve all of the equipment and, um, you know, find the corners and all of that. It actually benefits herself in some way and always, without fail, ends up causing some kind of pain for somebody else. Because, you know, when she's climbing across, the rope <laughs> drops and Rebecca's hand gets sliced oh, open with a rope. Yeah. Um, you know, and obviously the fact that she wanted to go to, and she wanted to do it for them and for Sarah. Oh no, except that you you, you fucked it up and now they're all trapped there. And like, literally, like every time she, like if you watch it again, every time she tries to do something for somebody else, she ends up causing pain. And it just is a reflection, I think, of like just her toxicity as a friend, a person. Um, and for me, one of the reasons why I really hate Juno in this is she is just a representation of, of the trope of women pulling like pulling down women and then 
causing pain for other women just based on personal gain or some sort of sexual agenda or you're, you're, you know. you're building a good case i'm glad we're not in court and i was uh, uh gonna defend juno because I was, <laughs> when, juno, when juno gets what happens to her later on i thought to myself i don't think that's validated uh you you guys are just there proving is. me wrong so i'll be looking at her saying you're fucked <laughs> i'm not defending so you anymore love sorry and um, what's quite funny as well is that sarah is you know she starts off this journey being quite um sort of unsure and anxious and all of this and who ultimately she ends up being like the strongest one there and i mean but like you know she is a fighter by the end of it um and she is the one person out of all of the group who uh, generally is is more associated with those sort of softer roles that women take on a wife a mother um you know and juno is kind of the the opposite of the anti-sarah you know so um it's quite poetic how they almost have a, a role reversal in mm. this and she kind of bites her oppressor for lack of a, a better thing but anyway yes carry on you sorry. often hear about um just sort of a side note talking of uh, women in horror as is the theme you often hear about that within groups of women where there's usually um almost bullying but not like we talked about earlier there's all there's they they bring and the women bring each other down generally, like, sometimes you hear that, Yeah, don't you? No, it is. It's true. I mean, if you think about, like, you know, you have magazines like Heat magazine and whatever, and you're... I mean, I don't, I don't know now, because it's been about 10 years since I ever picked one of those up, but um, I remember just, you know, late teens, whatever, reading them, and the front page would be like, such and such as cellulite, such and such as put on weight, and, like, yeah. just really just horrible things, and, and focusing on you know these quote unquote flaws and and flaunting it for the public and and that's just that's just an exaggerated sort of example but it happens you know the women will go along the street and just be like oh my god have you seen what she's wearing have you seen it? and it's just and it's not cool it's not cool uh, it's not cool it's a really sad thing it's one of the things that men i don't think really do that women do and i think but but encountering that i think that's only part of the society that we have been brought up in is that women have to look a particular way and we see these magazine covers where women are airbrushed to shit and you know and that's the sort of standard that's set for us and so we make ourselves feel better about our own flaws by pointing out somebody else's and it's just it's all toxic and it's all crap and yeah. you know it's, it's very common it's probably not so common like something you guys would pick up on because you're not women um but yeah it's definitely something that is apparent and it's, it's very interesting though isn't it it's uh it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, Anyways. Well, going back to Holly, she her acting here is brilliant. Um, oh, her name yeah. is Nora Jane Doon. When she's broken her leg, because she doesn't quite realise it's broken initially, and she says, ah, I've fallen, I've fallen. Oh, and then she sits up, and then she sees the yeah. bone sticking out, and my God, you can imagine oh. the pain and the shock yeah. of seeing that. So they all have to go down and fashion a splint for her out of one of the little axe uh, pick things. Yeah. Chicks with picks. Um <laughs> So, yes, they they fashion this, and while that's happening, Sarah finds an old helmet. Mm. Um, so she she sort of walks off and looks at that, and she spots a crawler drinking. She does, she does. Uh, um, it's very subtle initially. Like You're like, what am I looking at? Because it's right near the uh, lens, isn't it? Yeah, uh, but this is one of the things where it goes back, it, it shows it, and then it goes back again, and it's not there. And then... Um... She and then she hears the kind of the clicking, doesn't she? Um, yeah. And then and then we have this sort of jump scare where she turns around and Juno. This is uh, something that happened earlier as well. Juno is just suddenly there. Um, and oh, it, she's it, annoying. Kind of, yeah, but it's, it's the thing is what I found about this movie is that there's a lot of these jump scares that have been done time and time again, but it just it works. Like I don't know why it. Is so effective, but it just—it kind of—it just is. Um, it's one of those. Um, it's okay. It's gone now. Yeah, yeah. It's like a, it's it like does a, it all the time. Yeah, it's, it's the old bathroom off, mirror but... trick, isn't it? The old bathroom mirror yeah, trick. No. They shut the bathroom mirror. There's nothing in it. Yeah. And then they turn around and the creature's behind them or something. Yeah. You know? it's, or they open up the cabinet and then they close it again. Boom! There's something behind them in the, yeah. in the reflection. But what's quite um, interesting is that. Um, the helmet. So first off, that's the Star Wars reference. The um, is the position of it is similar how we see Darth Vader's helmet um, at one point in Star Wars, but also um, Oswald is written on there. Now this is the so according to the director commentary, I know Neil what Marshall will always but... include Oswald, um, and it's 
the guy in Dog Soldiers that they tell the story about who has the tattoo of the devil on his ass and he blows up, but everything is burnt apart from his uh-huh. skin with the tattoo. So that's the kind of little nod back to um, Dog Soldiers as well. Oh, I thought Oswald was I'm probably <laughs> incorrect here. In the Goonies, when they find that skeleton um, of the yeah. guy that went in, I thought that was the name of the guy, Oswald something or other, Copper Pot or something? I don't know. Yeah, maybe, I, like maybe I'm wrong. Chester Copper Pot. Also, Oswald Chester, is in No, you're right, it's Chester. Um, Oswald is the in, is in the second descent, and he's the one who baits them. Ah. Um, so it's all kind of yeah, it's all. Well, um, we we now no one believes her. No one believes her that she saw a crawler, but it's fine. Mm-hmm. They carry on and they find they find the biggest collection of bones lying around. Yeah. And this is one of my favourite. And I, I don't say this lightly. This is one of my favourite moments in horror. Full stop. Very clever. Very original. Is when she <laughs> uses the um, infrared, and she zooms around the girls because they've heard a noise. And then that crawler's just stood behind wh- whoever it is and just. And Jesus like Christ, man! The whole cinema. When I was in the cinema, I watched this. The whole cinema erupted with that man. That was just absolutely oh, frightening. Do you know uh, as well? So they um, they toyed with sort of different ideas of having like an arm reaching out and stuff like that, but they thought that him just standing there, part of the group almost, was sort of more effective. But the reactions of Beth and of Holly, who initially see it, um, and then obviously all the others react to them reacting, um, but they were those genuine reactions because um, they kept the the actors who played the crawlers hidden from the uh, the cast. So when they first saw them that was them first seeing them oh. so their reactions are genuine um and i think possibly it's one of the reasons why it just is it works so well because it it's genuine it's not it's not well active. you don't spot him initially do you? you just think he is just one of the group and then you suddenly yeah. realize that is a naked skinny weird mm. bat, bat head face oh bro. fucking shit a brick every so, time every time so their situation is what doors <laughs> is but this new threat's come into it making it even worse and yeah. they, they say that then we find out there's more than that one as well because then she says it's circling us but then they hear a couple of noises so mm. it's not just the one of them either is um, it Holly gets bitten and dragged away uh, no, yeah so this happens in a bit so they first off the, so there's this bit so this is where we can talk about like phallic stuff um, because there's this bit where they light a flare and it lights up the whole cave. And there's this awesome shot where each of them are all still listening, tense, you know, and they all have these like various sort of tense poses, but all at different levels. And they're all it, I, like, I don't know if you remember what I'm on about, but it's just such a cool yeah. setup and the way that it's staged. Mm-hmm. And you have everywhere coming from the bottom the top you have these stalactites and stalagmites i don't know which way around it is but um, stalactites i can answer that stalactites are the ones that come down from the ceiling um because they and the reason i know that is because they have to i always remember it as a kid they have to hold on tight oh otherwise they're full so stalactites stalagmites come up there we go there's your answer um thank you very much (laughs) um so this is where Emma Cleesby of Dog Soldiers said to Neil Marshall that it's like a horror porn movie um, because you have, you know, these tunnels that could be representative of vaginas, these stalactites, stalactites that look like penises, and they do as well. Like they do kind of look like actual penises. Um, they're not like they're not like pointed at the end. They're like rounded off. Um, yeah. And um, <laughs> you know, you could sort of say it's, it's females. <laughs> females are like sort of trapped in a, in this threatening environment surrounded by penises and phalluses they're like you know um stuck in vaginas which could represent women are often disadvantaged just because they're women um they're you know disadvantaged by their own femininity and gender identity and stuff stuck uh, in your own vagina stuck, stuck in. in your own vagina better than being stuck up your ass so <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, but yeah, so um, it's quite. Although it's kind of like ha ha Venus, it also is kind of um, it's kind of a cool thing for what it could represent as well. That's really cool. Um, but yeah, so then they, so yeah, so Holly then gets jumped by a crawler and she, he bites this chunk out of her throat. So yeah. what I thought was quite interesting was how. So the original design was based off Nosferatu. Okay, yeah. it's one of the, obviously aside from Dracula, the most um, famous vampire in pop culture. And after Angel, after Angel, well, I was going to say, Shut right, the fuck so up. I don't know if you thought of this, <laughs> but it reminds me of like a mixture of um, the Master, the master from Buffy yeah. and also um, 
Null, the demon, who is a skin-eating demon who lives in caves in Buffy in season seven. Oh. Do you remember the one who like peels off Willow's skin and she's yeah, yeah? Oh, and she's invisible. Um, and um, also reminded me of um, Blade Two. They remind me of yeah, yeah. Um, but they have like this sort of vampire imagery, um, which I just thought was quite quite interesting and the fact that they always tend to go for the neck um and and all of this and they live in the dark and whatever is sort of quite quite cool I as just, a buffy nerd i just took it as animalistic that the next than what you do to kill them or something yeah, there's yeah, that. yeah it's yeah, the quickest exactly. way to kill isn't it so, that's um, how you get yeah, it gab you just go straight for the throat don't you gab when you kill someone yeah it's just the way it's it me in general really isn't it just go for the throat go for the juggler. <laughs> yeah um but yeah, so I, I thought that's kind of cool. And oh, really this cool. fight between them, it wasn't choreographed at all. Like they were just like, just have at it. They would get like instructions like go for the throat or try and fight him off. But that was it. And they just, because they wanted it to just be very raw, realistic See, and this, scrappy, this is, you know. They, this this is interesting because this bit here, all of this and the, uh, the editing and stuff is actually quite fine. It doesn't yeah. have what the, my issue is later on. Um <laughs> But anyway, yeah, Holly's being bitten and dragged away, and you've got Juno's trying to hold her back. Um, oh. It's a bit of a game of a uh, fucking tug. Uh, she she looks yeah. like she wall. could handle herself, but she's actually not that good, Juno. She she does. Well, she she accidentally, does right. accidentally kills her mate, so she's definitely well, not very good, is she? This is it. She <laughs> kills Beth with an axe. She does. And that and... is probably one of the most shocking scenes oh, in the film, actually. It really is. Um, you um, do not expect that. And also, you suddenly think... What would you do if you were in that situation? If you accidentally killed your friend, you would feel... Well, do what Juno does and just leave her to fucking die on her own. Yeah, exactly. It really gets my wick. But, um, fucking but yeah, it's, um, it's quite... It's kind of understandable... Not understandable, but she's so pumped and she is just, at this point, just pure instinct, fighting left, right and centre at these callers coming at her. And she just... She reacts before she sees. And it's just, bam, pick through the neck. And... There's this really cool um, bit where the uh, the cameras sort of cut between the two expressions, um, and they they kind of evoke the same sort of thing, but obviously opposite ends of each other's experiences. So Juno is looking at absolute horror and kind of slight confusion and disbelief at what she's done, and Beth is looking at her in absolute horror and slightly confusion and disbelief at what she's done, um, and it's just this kind of. This, uh, this unspoken communication between these women of what the actual fuck just oh, happened. Of course, oh, of course. Um, it's just, I think it's just done so well. Uh, Sarah comes to and uses a video camera and we start to go into found footage Ooh. territory almost. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool. It's cool. Um, this is where she realises that they, they can't see her. Um, they use, like, touch and smell and, and almost sonar, like yeah. about... Um, exactly, which it makes yeah, sense because you've just evolved for uh, your, where you live, your habitat. So unfortunately, unfortunately, exactly, yeah. Unfortunately, one of the first things she sees when she <laughs> looks through the camera is Holly being eaten by the crawler, and she's like, "Which isn't great." Yeah, it's just like, "Oh, okay, great." There's my mate getting eaten there. That's yeah, awful. Um, we also, as well, we see a wolf's head, which is actually the werewolf prop from Dog, Dog Soldiers. Oh yeah. shit, they're nice. Yeah. Um, also, as well, the actress who played Polly took the uh, prosthetic head home and put it in her mum's fridge as a prank. <laughs> what, of herself? Yeah. Oh, my God. That's so mean. Her mum's fridge. Hello, mum. And her mum's freaked hell. out to shit, apparently. Well, you might just see your daughter's decapitated head in a fridge. I can't now. Oh, yeah. Oh, I Silly that. girl. Silly girl. <laughs> um, so Sarah's turning now. She starts turning quite uh, Ripley at this point. I've put yeah. Ripley, Connor. You know, she, she's she's got she's kind of like those. She's getting a bit grubby. She's she's having to really think on her feet. Um, she uses a. She's got the pickaxe for the weapon here. Um, mm -hmm. I also put though, although Juno does also go full on Amazonian, Amazonian at this point as well. She she yeah. goes beast mode, <laughs> as, as the kids would say. Um, Sarah okay. does manage to light a, a flame torch, hmm. which gives yeah. us another type of lighting to play with, which is cool. Yeah. Really flickery it's shadows. Really and make you think so of the thing. It does. Yes, it really does. And also, um, around here, the music changes again, and it kind of has this drawn out, sort of unsettling, off key notes. It kind of reminds me of The Shining. It's sort of this, and it kind of like evokes the insanity that she's kind of tapping into at this point. And what I kind of really um, like is when she, so she has this, um, she has this sort of like, 
tor- this fire torch um and and her pick as well and it's yeah it's like you say like very amazonian and later on she has this stance when she's just killed a crawler and we'll kind of go into it later but she has a stance where she's covered in blood and she's just looking like bad absolute fucking badass she looks and it just it reminds me of like sort of if tomb raider (laughs) met summer from the end of serenity you know after um summer does that incredible fight sequence yeah and the door's open she's just there with her weapons and it just really reminds me of that if like that sort of like meets tomb raider kind of style and it's just so fucking cool and if she went to the but if if that person then went to the same prom as carrie yeah yeah (laughs) and that's like that again it's all intentional like it's um they throw a margin here left like, huge carry it, it did look it, it did look very uh good and very um like something really you could cool. remember and uh you know pop culture type sort of thing a look almost which you could have repeated or something um but this is the action scene sequences here which uh i just cut really shitly but this um, is gab's main issue with it Kate. It's, 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 it's the only issue really with yeah. the film for him yeah. is this scenes aren't edited together very well the action scenes towards the end where the girls are fighting them off at the, the latter part. You don't so, get to see uh, stuff. It's not like watching, is. say, The Raid. Do you know what I mean? Where, where it's yeah, just like, no. okay, let's just watch what happens. And I would like that a bit more. I don't mind it being tighter in, just not cut so quick. Go on then, Kate. Yeah, well, why, I, mean, why why I was going to say, like, actually, it's all kind of post, because in that final fight scene, um, apparently, normally, for, like, say, you know, a Hollywood movie was being made, that level of fight scene would be done over six weeks. They got told they had two days, and in the end, they only had one day to shoot it. So, I don't know, maybe it's to do with that. Like, I don't know. Maybe they maybe they edited it to be confusing so they could reuse some footage and stuff. Yeah, maybe, yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, also, so in this meantime as well, like Sam and Rebecca, the sisters, um, yeah, they're, they hiding, have, aren't they? they're hiding and they have this bit where one of the crawlers, so this is like the main crawler, he's called Scar, um, and he crawls sort of over them and they have to be like really it's really quiet and still and it's so tense and they've at this point, they've sort of established that they're blind um, and they have this really cool, there's so many close-ups of eyes um, and you see his eye and it's all cataracted and pale and just really gross and it's so cool um and then he eventually he kind of moves over them and because this was the real first time they were up close with one of them like they were genuinely like the person who played rebecca was genuinely really scared um being in that close proximity to something that just looked so horrible and anyway, so he crawls away, and then all of a sudden, beep, 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 beep. Yeah, the fucking um, alarm goes off. Watch goes off. Um, and there's this bit, and it comes back, but they kind of they stop motion it almost. They kind of speed it up, um, and it just builds on that tension um, of like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, just get the watch off, get the watch off, get the watch off. And um, and she does eventually, but it's just it's it's again, it's very simple, but it's just done really effectively. I love it. Um, yeah, no, it's great. Juno it's breaks cool. a crawler's neck. Does she badass. snaps that bad boy's neck there? Yeah, well, this um, is saving Rebecca and Sarah, isn't it? So they kind of come across another one, and we have another jump scare where he comes down from the top. Um, and he sort of like so Sam's gone through the little doorway almost, and then he's there hiding, and he comes down and he, he kind of attacks Rebecca. And we don't see who saves Rebecca at first, and then it's Juno kind of comes out, and she, uh, yeah, she does sort of, yeah, and she's like, okay, I don't like Juno, but she does get some really kind of cool badass moments where she's got like you know it's close to her face and she's like glaring she's very bed. she's very lara croft at this point isn't she very Lara. she's got croft, that look yeah. she's got the dark hair you know she's very lara yeah. croft at this point and, which they, isn't yeah, bad and, thing. and this is part of you know like <clears throat> neck breaking you would associate that with more of a masculine kind of fighting action you know and it's yeah it's done by this very petite woman <laughs> um and then sam spits on it as well and they kick yeah, it. i know i love that she spits on it kicks yeah it's just like she's like hell. done nothing like sam does the <laughs> least amount of fighting I ever but she's like yeah fuck you <laughs> <laughs> um wow we got a shocker coming up here because sarah finds beth and beth is actually just about alive yes yeah. tells her not to trust juno oh she says it was it's... juno don't yeah. trust her and but, she says, but no, to be I fair be. as juo's defense lawyer to be fair mm-hmm. i feel that she did that in shock uh and and uh it was an accidental manslaughter or for the episode the woman slaughter I, I think um you're right um it was an accident but fuck her she's a dick I so, think like 
you could still, you know, wait with your friend. Do you know what I mean? That is your friend. Yeah. She left us like, to bleed out in a dark cave with crawlers running yeah, around. She yeah, was, she horrible. was a bit of a dick at that. I, I, I yes. This, she, uh, she finds Paul's necklace, and she did say earlier on when they were toasting, she did say, "Love each day." And everyone yeah, something it. that's. She said that's something Paul used to say. Um, mm. Don't worry about it. And on yeah. the necklace that Juno's been wearing, it says, "Love, Love each, each day. day." So this whole scene, like to me, I just. It's one of my favourite scenes. Um, Very nice writing. It's well, the scene was rewritten in the pub the night before <laughs> um, on knit paper napkins by the two actresses and oh, um, and Neil Marshall because they all three of them kind of felt that there was too much emphasis on Juno's portrayal of Sarah by being with her husband uh, and not enough on the the more prominent in the moment issue of Beth's dying so they went out and rewrote it at the pub and apparently the producers got wind that they did a rewrite last minute and they got in trouble but um it all came out okay because they did agree that it was indeed better um but also as well like it's just it's such an emotionally driven scene like it, the acting in it is just amazing and even though you don't really see Beth's face in it because it's dark and she's covered in blood and all the rest of it you still get this this just emotion from her and obviously Sarah not only oh my god poor Sarah in this five minutes she comes across one of her best friends who is dying finds out her other best friend did it to her finds out that said best friend had an affair with her husband oh and on top of that she has to kill her best friend with a rock out of mercy well, um, well, rock. well st stuck in the dark with weird well, things with coming after her I mean Jesus I would lose my mind too um, and uh, Neil Marshall in the scene could specifically chose to because i mean if you think about it, this is a very gory movie you know you've got eyes being gouged out and throats being slit and all kinds of shit but they didn't show the death specifically of beth because yeah. they didn't want it to be exploitable or you know um uh just over the top or anything you know they wanted to really respect this moment and it be about sarah's reactions and her t turmoil and just the music as well is really slow and, and emotive. It doesn't pull away from anything. And um, it's just, I, a... when I watch this, it's just when I just, I kind of almost forget about everything else. It's just literally about the emotional truth and journey of these two women. Um, and, and just the, yeah, just, just this strength. And, and for me as well, like Beth, I feel has always been Sarah's protector. Um, you know, she comforts her when she's in the hospital. She's the one who has a go at Juno for like, you know, this is supposed to be for Sarah. You fucked this up. And every time it's Beth who is looking out for Sarah, checking on her, making sure she's OK. She and although it's an awful thing to do, she reveals the truth about Juno and what she did, um, you know, and it's just all the time she's looking after her. So I do feel like out of all of the girls, Beth is probably Sarah's actual best friend. And yeah, so I agree. I for agree. them to have this moment is just, it's heartbreaking. Like it really is. Uh, and it's great what they <laughs> do here is um, that horrible thing she's just had to do, kill her best friend, yeah. is followed up within split second of her being attacked by a crawler. She then kills that crawler. The yeah. two acts combined switch her over into that beast mode I talked about. It's That's it now. She's, something's yeah. changed yeah 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 oh also can we just talk about again i'm gonna i'm sorry but i'm also not sorry um when she says uh when she's just about to kill her and she says close her eyes close your eyes yeah. reminds me of buffy saying it to angel before she kills her it just breaks my heart i don't know what the fuck you're talking about well if you was <laughs> buffy you would so <laughs> um but yeah no exactly and um there's this really kind of cool sort of mum versus mother kind of mother versus mother thing because this crawler attacks her, but it's we realise it's, it's a kid crawler. It's, well, it's, a, it's a kid crawler at first, and then she just she has no mercy though. She just kicks this kid to death. Yeah. Um. And then all of a sudden, this what we assume is the the kid's mum. Um. And I know she's a monster, but this I feel bad for her. You know, like I don't know if it's <laughs> I'm a mum. No, but right. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you for why. Oh, I never thought that I'd hear you defending one of the crawlers in the descent. Yes. I felt really bad yeah. for that crawler. You just yeah. killed its child. It is because even though they hunt and eat humans, like okay, so this is their way of life. Okay, they clearly have some sort of family of sort, and this is their home. And suddenly it's been invaded, and then these invaders are killing them. 
and you know you can argue that they're only defending their home and then one of them kills your kid and like right <laughs> I, you know you could even draw a comparison like okay so for us and for the group it's for it's like a monster movie but for the crawlers it's like a home invasion movie yeah that's true actually that's a good you know, when she frightens her son, she whimpers. She's in pain, you know? And Imagine in that doing moment, a movie from the other way around. Imagine yeah, if Yeah, like, like the Tuck and Dale stuff. That's like what I was just saying. I was about to say, can we flip every movie? Like, <laughs> Halloween, basically Michael Myers was quite happy in there. Then one night, the fucking yeah. uh, the electric all went, and he got let out, and he's like, I just want to fucking go back in my cell, and they just won't leave me yeah. alone. You know, let's flip everything. There's a whole thing on one of the other um, podcasts that I listen to, um, and they just done a whole thing about how Texas Chainsaw Massacre, how Leatherface is massively misunderstood. Um, well, Jules, Jules, Jules just, just wants to eat. Too. Jules just wants to eat food. Yeah, cool you know. it is. Um, but we kind of quickly switched from. So I mean, this is a moment that I like, and I think it's because I'm a mum and I empathise. Um, or not that other people are uncap- incapable of empathising at losing a kid, but anyway. Um, so. This is over pretty quickly because she immediately senses Sarah. Like she smells her her kid's body, and I think she can smell him on Sarah. Yeah. And she, because she, like you would think she's just looking at her. The way that her head just turns is like boom, directly at Sarah. And then like she shrieks and chases Sarah, complete full rage. And there's this really creepy moment because. Sarah like runs and she um and they're battling and she falls into the um into this blood pool basically. Yeah, it's like a big gunky red blood. Yeah, it's like viscera and all this. And there's this there's right, so because I'm a nerd, timed it. She is underneath for a good ten seconds. And in that ten seconds you're like, Oh my god, is she dead? What's happening? What's going on? And then she comes up and these little bubbles come up and she thinks she's safe and she goes over and like she starts crawling out of the bank and then the the mama crawler, as I call her, mama crawler, she um oh and I also call in my notes the kid one, kid rock. Kid rock. <laughs> Fuck it now. Um, so anyways, yeah, and so and she crawls out and then the mama crawler just comes at her. But what is really weird is that if you look back on when you rewatch it, the mama crawler is there all the time and you see the top of her head, but you think it's a rock and it's not and it's her and ah, she goes for it. And it's so she was over. waiting for her. She's uh, waiting. She, when she comes out, she she's, goes a bit Arnie out of Predator, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah. defo. She um, gouges out the mama crawler's <laughs> eyes with her thumbs, doesn't she? No, no, that's later on. Um, oh, is that later? She, yeah, no, so... Um, so Mama Crawler grabs her and she's trying to bite him and Sarah's doing that classic thing of just pushing her head away with the palm of her hand. Oh, and way. she's like, let's get out of my face, get God. Get off. Yeah, get off. Um, and she reaches out for this bone. It looks like a shoulder bone. Oh, uh, yes. And then she, and then, but yeah, she slams it into her eye. So yeah, there was an eye thing. And it's so squelchy and yeah. satisfying. Um, and then she just gets <laughs> off. Like that, it yeah? is. It's, I love a bit of gross gore. Um, and then oh. she, and then yeah, so she goes off and she's killed and she's victorious. But then, this is the thing with this movie, it doesn't let up ever. Another crawler comes and yeah. she flattens herself down. And this is where we get um, the really cool stance where she looks like Summer from Serenity. And she, because um, she, she grabs for this bone, like this long, like a, not the same as before, but like a, another one, a longer one. And she uses that plus her um, pick. Um, and she saves the torch as well. Sarah's amazing. Um, like a and, character in a video game who's collecting items. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, God knows where you put it all, but apparently you do. Um, and yeah, and then she um, smashes them over the head. But what makes me laugh every time is that the crawler kind of, first off, he kicks her in the head, which turns out was an accident by the actor, um, which just really? makes me laugh every time now. And then he looks to go away, but then he hears her reaching for this big long bone. And he hey. rolls his eyes. Hey. He rolls his eyes. He almost does this like, oh, for fuck's sake, kind of like eye roll, like fuck my life kind of thing. And he kind of just turns around like, what? You know? <laughs> and, and I don't also, know if anyone else thinks that, but I think that every time and it always makes me laugh. What I do like about that scene is that Sarah, not only is all this happening to her and all this terrible stuff and people dying and she's had to kill one of her friends, she now gets tea bagged by a dribbling... Um, yeah, kind of squats right over her face. Oh, nothing. She's left there thinking, is, could this, could my day get any? Is this dangly basket word? in her face? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's horrible. And then he dribbles on her head a bit and then crawls off into the. Is, little that, is it like that? Oh no! <laughs> <It's just laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you guys can't see what Gav is doing right now. Um, he's doing. Better, he's not actually he's doing. doing. He's doing it with his hand in case. He's doing it with his hand, but it's pretty gross. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then, um, and also, there's this again a really cool shot of the what I call the dribbler because he's the one that kind of dribbles all the time. The tea, and he's like the teabagger, please. The teabagger. Uh, oh, okay. The teabagger, lovely. Um, and he, you see this like it's just his silhouette. The forefront of the shot is Sarah in the background, and it's just silhouetted out. And again, I, I could put that on my wall, and it'd be a piece of art. It's fucking lush. Mm. Um, but yeah. So and then she 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 doesn't she after she kills him and she's like, fucking hell, kind of thing, and she screams. And it's like a catharsis, a war cry, that kind of level. And then we cut to Juno, Rebecca and Sam, and they're startled by a crawler cry. And it merges the two, sort of hinting like she's descending into crawler territory. Was it Sarah? Was it a crawler? Ooh, Ooh. yeah. Um, So, yeah, so uh, that was kind of cool. And, uh, yeah, so um, someone else talk now. (laughs) (laughs) So, of course... And that then beckons the, the two two cries. We get to see just how many crawlers there are. Um, and they're all getting chased at this point now. It gets a little bit yeah. crazy. Sam gets her throat cut by a crawler. Um, mm-hmm. And she ends up just hanging limp from the rope. Um, I believe that's Scar. Is it Scar, is it? Or... I think so, yeah. Just based off stuff they were saying in the commentary. Uh, Becca gets dragged off and she gets eaten, we assume. Yeah. Uh, I don't really Yeah, no, she does, because they, they rip open her stomach. And it's oh, like, yeah, it's a bit it's of like a... It's like Dylan in uh, Shaun of the Dead kind of style. Yeah. Like, pull her open and she's screaming. And Juno leaves her again, although I will yep. admit, in this moment, she was lunged at by a crawler and honestly, Rebecca could not be saved. But still, though. Juno does have to fight um, a, a <coughs> crawler underwater for a little bit and she does she win. Does. So well done yeah. to her for that. Yeah, yeah. But we get the face off now. Sarah and Juno, they bump into each other and she yeah. says, Juno says, look, so and so's dead, so and so's dead. And she says, what about Beth? Yeah. Yeah, yeah she's dead. Like she tests yeah. her, doesn't she? Um, because she goes, she goes, oh, um, what about Beth? And then Juno goes, oh, she, so she doesn't flat out lie. She says she didn't make it. She says she doesn't make it. And then she's like, you saw her die. And then she does lie and she nods. And that's like Sarah's like, uh-huh. And it kind of just cements Juno's um, sort of deception for her. And she yep. does this really great kind of snarl, smile. But she doesn't do anything about it yet. She kind of bites no, she, she stores that as ammo for later. Oh, she does. And there's no, after this scene, there's no dialogue left after the, for the rest of the movie. None. And yep. um, Neil Marshall, the director, thought it was really, like he wanted to kind of, he was inspired by the way that they do it in Last of the Mohicans. Yeah. Um, so he kind of wanted it to be kind of that sort of similar vibe for the last act. Um, and also as well, a funny bit of trivia is that the same wall, um, the bit of wall behind them was the same wall and they just swapped places to film it. Yeah, because they didn't have as many caves, did they, in the studio? So they just kept changing the... They just reused them, yeah. yeah. And the water pools, as they're going through the tunnels, the water pools are, are done by baths. They got they just have baths in there, fill it up with water and then put all of the scenery around it. So, yeah. Brilliant. That's okay. It's fun, isn't it? I recommend you guys listen to the commentaries. There's tons of shit. I have it on DVD and I would have done years ago <laughs> when it first came out because back then I used to have time to be able to... to I used to watch obsessively every commentary and every bit of bit behind the scenes. I don't always have the time to do that now, but I do remember some of that from the commentary. Now, yeah, it's pretty fucking cool. And she, she crawls out and escapes, etc., etc. Et well, hang on, not yet. <laughs> Go on, then. We have the uh, what I call the final smackdown. It is the it's the it's the bitch smackdown right now. The, the two really bad is. bitches are going to kick each other's asses. But um, first, oh, this is as well the thing kind of score comes back in as our dun 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 dun, um, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> how it goes. Um, dum, dum. And so, so yeah, so um, Juno has a flare and she has a pick and Sarah has her fire torch and this big long bone. Um, <laughs> and they come into this cavern and they realise that they are surrounded. There's a lot of them. Everywhere. There's some um, bad CGI here, unfortunately. There's a couple of crawlers that look a bit, that they probably weren't there and they just CGI'd one or two. Yeah, in. they did have to do it a little bit. Um, which is a shame, but it doesn't matter. It kind of reminds me of uh, Jurassic Park with the uh, velociraptor like clever girls, you know, like it's 
it seems like they they do have some intelligence not only yeah. emotionally from earlier but they work as a, they can work individually but also they can work as a team and you know they've got them here and they've surrounded them and stuff and and yeah it's just kind of reminded like i just thought clever girls when i watched it well this unfortunately is where gav is not a fan of the editing because this is where they have a big and you said this no, that was a bit earlier on. That was another battle. This is the final battle. We don't need to bring it up again. It's just, yeah. Well, well, you know, unless it's just this, this one, film, then. Gav, that's up to you. No, it's probably just this one, then. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it. I don't need to go through it again, yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously, I, I don't make movies, so I don't notice. No, it's, it's, nothing to, it's, it's, it's nothing to do with making movies. I just, I, I just want to be able to it's see the like action. It. That's all it is. There's some good like um, deaths here now. They, they get skulls crushed against walls, oh, rocks, so ripped, good. throats getting ripped out. Someone gets a, yeah. the crawlers gets a flare shoved in its mouth. Um, yeah, no one does that. So we have, so it's, again, it's quite, um, you have these sort of polar opposites between Sarah and Gino because Sarah, I mean, they're both full primal instincts at this point. Oh, yeah. Um, but like, um, it's quite funny because Gino is attacked straight off the bat but no one attacks sarah until they bat out her fire torch um and then it's um it's quite funny you said about the editing because i thought actually the editing was kind of cool because it sort of makes for fast pace and excitement just the way it's quick cuts and lighting well, that, well, and that, well that's why also that's the style uh, for that reason yeah so um cool. but also so you have so all the way through juno is screaming and screeching and all this whereas sarah is completely silent yeah um Sarah takes out several of them. Junior only really takes out one, um, and it's on nowhere near the level of savagery that Sarah is. I mean, and Sarah is... spends ages gouging out these eyes, and it's squelching. Oh, and so Sarah, good. this is partly because Sarah is planning what she's about to do. She's mm. she's not just gone savage. She's gone too far now and she wants a bit of justice and a bit of revenge so yeah. she's doing all this planning you know i'm i'm i know what i'm doing I, i'm gonna kill just enough of them um she shows she's quite vindictive she sh- they win for now and she shows juno the necklace it's literally uh, like the penny drops the, the pendant drops <laughs> oh really? and then of course she slices her in the leg with the axe yeah she does she doesn't kill her because she doesn't want her to die that quickly. She wants her to be slowly torn to pieces and digested by all the little creepy crawlers. Also, she technically wouldn't kill her then. Like, if she just lopped off her head or something, then she's committed murder. She's Whereas just as bad as her. Yeah. She's not done it. Um, and also, I mean, that whole bit is so cool. Like, obviously, I have to say, they don't speak. It's just, oh, man, like, just no words are needed. It's I've, all I've written the... that scene. I've written savage as fuck. It's so savage. I've written all the badass awards go to Sarah in this episode. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I've written, it's a truly, oh shit moment. Um, <laughs> and like, again, everything is very kind of stripped back. The music score is very simple. It's just tension. Like what's going to happen now while they're just staring? Like, what are you going to do? And, we don't, and then we don't, hear, we don't see her die. We just hear Juno <laughs> die, screaming, yeah. you know, in the distance. And again, when she dro- when Sarah drops this, the pendant and it's like, again, you, nothing needs to be explained. This whole kind of realization dawns on Juno and Sarah does this, again, this really awesome, like, yeah, got you, bitch, kind of smile. Yes. Um, and it's just, I don't know, I just fucking love it. Maybe because I hate Juno so much, but I fucking love it. <laughs> uh, um, and again, it's another Carrie moment, the wide eyes in amongst all the blood and her hair linked to her face and all of this kind of thing. Um, and the hand, example. the hand coming out the ground is very Carrie, which comes up in I a second. Yeah. Always reminds you of Carrie that bit. And that's mm. quite, maybe a bit too obvious, but I think that is a, must be a nod to Carrie oh, as well. Absolutely. I think for this, from what I picked up on the commentary, and all, I mean, there's a, a few other bits that I've not said because it's not important, but um, I think if there is something in here that reminds you of another film, chances are that's done on purpose. Yeah. Like the way it's done. So um, this yeah. is this is great. She's escaped. She's she's going away. She, she gets she in the car. Is, she's in shock. Well, I feel like going back away. to Syria, she is reborn because she kind of comes out of this hole in the in, mm. the, in the earth. It's almost like she's reborn, <laughs> covered in blood. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's generally what it is. Yeah, and then and like. Also- Sorry. I was going to say, then we go into the car, and then she's in the car, and she's all traumatic. She's driving away, then she pulls over, all in shock. Then, what the fuck? 
Yeah, she's not escaped, Why? Joe. At this point, I was like, fucking end the movie. Oh, I don't give a just... shit about going back to the fucking dark hole again. For fuck's sake, you've just got me out oh. of there. What the fuck? So, Why? In America, they cut it there. They cut it when Juno's in the car and just it. Because yeah. um, the general kind of feeling on it was that um, they wanted a happier ending. Um, I love this ending. Because I prefer this ending. I, da- it's just I don't like being tricked. Punch. I love it. I don't like being no, tricked. So you don't like the ending, Gab. Sorry, Kate. So you don't like the ending of The Descent? I'd rather um, she's in the car and goes insane and pulled over. I like the fact that she's got to live with all that pain. Okay. But the thing is, though, is that, like, but this is what, this is exactly what Neil Marshall was saying. He actually didn't mind the fact that they cut um, the the last minute or whatever off because he was like, just because, like, again, like, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, just because you escape like does that really mean that you've got a happy ending like it doesn't exactly. really trauma the suffering the loss yeah um the actual like mental um deterioration that you've suffered but what i quite like about the fact that she goes back is that so this whole so the as she's climbing out again it's wonderfully shot it's just all black and all you have is this one light coming down and just highlights the top of this bone pile that she's yeah. climbing clambering up and it's just, it looks gorgeous, but also it's, um again, it's, a, it's an homage to Jacob's Ladder, how she's gone through all of this and she comes out and she thinks she's okay and then only to be dragged back and it's all a dream kind of thing, you know, like, it's I really not... love, um, and I never noticed it before, but I really love the fact that the, the really casual, like really slow, subtle transition of the birthday cake and then as it pans around, someone must have whipped that out from underneath her and replaced it with the fire. Yeah. And the, light, the lighting doesn't change at all. And then you realise that it's not a birthday cake. It's not her daughter. She's yeah. in the cave on her own. And that's just her torch in front of her. And yeah. she is just in hell. Oh. And she, yeah. And, and I think it's so, I've written here, like, there's a lot, again, there's, it's one of these movies where, like, nothing's necessarily confirmed as such. You're free to make your own um, ideas about it. Um, for me, I think that, uh, you know, she has she has lost her mind. She is envisioning her daughter being there as, like, a, like a, oh, um, like a defense mechanism um and she so she creates a solution of her daughter um which is a symbol of not only like the family that she's lost but also like that familiar warmth and happiness that came from her friends um and innocence that she'll and a civility that she'll never get back um and a past that she can she can never reclaim basically um children obviously also like represent life and new beginnings um again it's something that sarah will probably never have even if she gets out um like she'll never really have that sort of chance again um and the birthday cake obviously as i said earlier it's they're talking about her birthday um which kind of sets all this thing in motion um and it's a representation i think of her not only her emotional trauma of that but also her survivor's guilt now not only because of her family but also now she's the only survivor left of her friends um and it's just this link to her daughter um and and the start of all of this um and i just think like it's just this really kind of, cool, as you say, yeah, this kind of realization of like, she has just lost it. Um, her, you know, the cake isn't there, it's the torch and all of this kind of stuff. My, um, really my cool. opinion, my theory about <laughs> the end it was has changed. Years ago, I used to think she did get out, but that end scene of her in oh. in the caves is actually what's her trapped in, in her own mind. She's, Ooh. and that's what I used to think. But now I think she actually. As soon as the cave-in happened, I think she just started killing everyone. I think something happened then when she got trapped in that cave. The claustrophobia got to her. As soon as she told that that her Beth told the lemon joke, mm-hmm. she, I think I think she was going around killing them all, and there weren't any crawlers in the cave. I think she just Im- imagined all of that, and she was actually going savage and seeing that all this stuff happened to her as yeah, she descended. Yeah. That's what I think happened now. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, and this is it again like you can have like so many theories and not some people watching. think that she never even went cave in some people think she remained in a catatonic state after her husband and daughter died and yeah that she never even went to that cave with those girls i think she, i've heard this as well because again it's that whole kind of descent to hell and at the end it's almost like she get, almost gets to heaven almost kind of gets that but then she comes back down and all of this and um and that's why the opening looks like a grave because it's all associated with her death and all of this kind of gab what's your thoughts on the end like in terms of have you got a theory no <laughs> I love it. Gav, I love you. This is brilliant. Oh. Kate and I with our extensive theories. Gav, you? No. No. 
<laughs> I've now got a fairy on it. Uh, but you're, you're disappointed. You'd rather she just ended in the car and you get a bit of de- definition. I know, I quite like that. It's just oh, I thought that was going to be the ending. I was just a bit like, oh, back here again. I'll tell you what sake. I really, really yeah. like is the the credits going over that photo that they did of a selfie of the wall. Um, yeah. It added a real sense of realism, almost. Like, yeah. you felt, oh, my God, all these people are dead now. Oh, oh no, they're, they're just actresses. It. It's fine. They did that actually um, later on because uh, Supernatural came out uh, same year actually as this. But um, later on in Supernatural, they do that. There's um, this big battle, and beforehand they take a, a photo of them all, and then at the end when pretty much all of them have died, like um, they they have they show the photo and it fades to, to black and white, and it's um, it's really effective and it just yeah it's very like emotive and just oh heartbreaking really. Um, it's quite funny actually. Oh, there was one bit actually. I don't know if anyone else thought this. Um, way, 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 way at the beginning. The bit where Sarah wakes up from a nightmare just before the pole kind of goes into her face um, in a dream. Um, there's this bit where, to me, she just looks exactly like Rebecca Ferguson, uh, who uh... played Rose the Hat in Doctor Sleep. Um, I don't know if that, like, but yeah. But you are obsessed great. with Rebecca Ferguson, so. I am also, yeah, I'm obsessed with Gav quite liked her as well, actually. Yeah, she's all right. Oh, yeah. happy, happy <laughs> in Doctor Sleep. Like, happy, she's just so awesome. Um, but in this photo, Sarah actually looks like my old IT teacher. Ah, was um, her name Sarah? No, it was Claire. Oh, um, shame. But yeah, she just sort of reminded me of her and that. Um, but yeah, it was quite funny though, a bit of a link between the two besides some other stuff, which I won't go into, don't worry. Um, but Neil Marshall said that when this um, uh, aired at the Venice International Film Festival, which is where Suspiria 2018 had its premiere in 2018, that he was inspired by entire in horror movies of the past, particularly um, directed ones directed by Fulci and Argento. Ah. So and that's quite cool, kidding. In in the uh, the uh, cast and crew, there was uh, the catering assistant was a uh, Stella Fluff Dyke. <laughs> oh my god! What I can't speak for terrible last names. My last name is awful, but Pollock. God damn. Yeah, but I'm damn bone. Come on, yeah. I'm whore. Come on. Whore, oh, bone, God. Pollock. bone, whore, Jesus, and Pollock. Jesus Christ. Wow. Well, it's better than Fluff Dyke, anyway. Oh, yeah. That's all um, right. The, the yeah. Descent 2 is actually <coughs> quite a good movie. I, I don't remember surprised. it in the slightest, actually, so maybe mm. I should check that out. Uh, you've got a couple of the actresses come back movie. again. Um, okay. Uh, and, yeah, it, well, I believe it's on UK Net right now. Yeah, it is. They um, always put the sequel stuff on there. You totally yeah, it's so annoying. Up and... Like, can you put the first one on as well? Then we can like watch both. But I hadn't seen it before um, a couple of weeks ago when I watched it, sort of in prep for this. And um, I was delighted to see the guy who plays Prince Charming in Once Upon a Time TV show in it. And it's hilarious because he plays <laughs> Prince Charming in Once Upon a Time, and in this he's all like swearing a bit of a dick, and it's quite funny for me. So, um, is it a thumbs up or thumbs down for the descent? Yeah, thumbs I actually up. give it a th- bigger thumbs up than I used to. I, I've grown; it's grown <laughs> on me even more. I give it a thumbs up. Uh, it's uh, I feel the same the last time I watched it. So right. it's <laughs> it's right? good. I I do I prefer it to Dog Soldiers. It's a better. I prefer movie. Dog Soldiers. I haven't watched Dog Soldiers in ages. Um, actually, to maybe I will. No, to, quite a Dog Soldiers fan. Um, um, Dan, as uh, as someone who's got a last name of Bone in Dog Soldiers, how do you feel when they use Bone as derogatory? Like I was totally born. It's it was weird, um, but it didn't bother me that much because oh, okay. uh, my nickname at school was Boner for about fifteen years. So, of course oh it was. god, yeah, I don't think of course it was. I didn't know what it meant until I was about twelve, and then I realised that a nickname for an erection was also Boner. And I thought, have I just been getting called? Half- <laughs> I've been trolling you, Stiffy. <laughs> can can we see if Bill Murray's around? Yeah, I think um, we need to go to the World of the Strange. Bill? Bill? Can we... Bill? Bill? Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. Hey, Here we are, World of the Strange. 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 Well, actually, um, the world is fucking strange at the moment um, because of what's going on with the lockdown, people getting shut in, the coronavirus. So rather than find a strange story, because the world is a strange story right now, I thought, let's do something to help everybody who's potentially doing isolation. A lot of people are. And let's have a chat, just a very quick chat about some movies that 
are themed with isolation and being lonely and uh, you know on, on your own out in the mirror, wherever you are and i thought we could all just have a quick chat about some of our favorites i've got a little list kate's got a little list gav's got a little list should we go for our little list yeah i was gonna, I was gonna say very quickly the world is strange being strange right now the other day the other evening no uh, evening yeah early <laughs> evening i was walking a dog with my eldest and all you could hear was the wind rustling the leaves across the road. Nothing. No cars. Weird. No aeroplanes. Yeah. No nothing. It's like, this is strange. It was I weird have... not seeing a single plane because we're in a flight pla- path where I live. And it's kind of weird not seeing a single plane go over yeah, for, for days and days and days. Yeah. Um, uh, and no jet trails in the sky or anything yeah. like that. We we're just by the airport and um, yeah, you hear it all the time and it's been nothing. The other night I went out to take the rubbish out and um, in our it's a very kind of um, family orientated area where I am. So you, you um, and also a little bit of a druggy area. I'm not gonna lie. Um, and so you'll generally like hear people out in the street or you'll hear dogs barking or you'll hear. And I took the rubbish out and it was nothing. Yeah, it was weird. just be on silent and it was and it was a really clear night with all of the stars and everything and it was actually kind of nice just to have utter silence with the stars out but at the same time it was just like fuck this is yeah this is weird it is weird it is strange so we're going to run through some titles um, so who, who wants to go first what do you guys should we do ladies first? Because it's uh, a, the episode about women. Should we just sort uh, of go through the titles, not really talk about too much? It's funny enough, yeah. we're stuck oh, in God, isolation, but, through... uh, but I have to run. Isn't that weird? Yeah. And um, when we go through the titles, and then anyone that we've got the same of, we could talk a little bit more about. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. All right, okay, I'll go first then. So um, this isn't any in real particular order, but we've got number one, The Shining. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. on my list. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, number two, The Thing. Yeah, yep, that's on my list, of course. Uh, number three, <laughs> I've got... Well, I put down Aliens because I feel like that was more... But then I was like, we have to have Alien as well. So I've got that as a twofer. Okay. okay. Um, I've got buried. Alien 1. I didn't... Buried, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. I haven't got Aliens, but I did put Alien 1. Okay. Definitely. Buried, definitely. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Next one, Buried. Uh, five, uh, The Hole. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Yeah, I've seen that. Versions. I didn't think about um, that one, actually. Yeah, I love it. Um, Gravity, a bit of a sci-fi, not horror, but... Yeah. Um, uh, misery. That's on my list, definitely. Um, the Martian. I did think about that one. You can't get much more solitude than I've that. I've not Just... seen it because I don't really like uh... Matt Damon. Matt Damon. Matt Damon. Oh, I fucking love Matt Damon uh, as an actor. Um, and then I've got The Mist. Okay. Um, because it wasn't... I, that's why it's lower down. I actually love The Mist more than some of the other ones but because where it's not like one person or something on their own. It's like within a people. But... Uh, within a shopping uh, shop. <laughs> Sorry, shopping shop. <laughs> shopping shop. Um, one of them. Um, and, and obviously they can't get out and they can't reach their loved ones and stuff. I thought it was still relevant. And, oh, that ending. Oh. Um, and then last but not least um, is I Am Legend. Yeah. Bit of Will um, Smith in there. There were so many others I could have put in, but I just really only had could do 10. But just some special mentions, things like Triangle, Castaway, which the only one I didn't put on there is because I watched it once at the cinema and I didn't like it. Um, even Old Boy to an extent, Panic Room. Yeah, there's tons. Yeah. Hateful Eight. Nice. Yeah, that's another one, isn't it? Hateful Eight. Isolated in a cabin. Oh, yeah, yeah, nice yeah. Song. Cabin Fever. Sword of the Dead. Um, sort of Sword of the Dead. So Cabin in the Woods, even, you could argue as yeah, well. Like yeah, like Cabin Fever. Even possibly even <laughs> Dead. It, it depends, really, how well, tight you want to get it. Two, Evil Dead 2 is on my list, so I'll, I, I won't mention that because that is on my list, Evil Dead 2. I feel like... For the most part, Ash is on his own in that. Mm. Yeah. Any more, Gav? No, not really. Okay. Well, you've done most of my list. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple, couple, I would say, is... And I don't really know if it counts, but Rear Window, I feel like that yeah, is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good film. Stuck in. Oh, so no, yeah, no, that, yes. That's yeah, a nice that summer's happen. evening movie, is Rear Window. Mm. It is. The Descent is on my list. I do feel like that is one hell of a great movie when it comes to being isolated and alone and trapped. Um, one of, You mentioned I Am Legend. That was not on my list, but I do have a bit of a two-for-one. The Omega Man, 1971, which 
I Am Legend is a remake of. Yeah. But in turn, Vincent Price's Last Man on Earth, which is Omega the original. Is a yeah. Remake of. Yeah. So those two um, are on my list. Uh, fantastic Whoa. movies. Silent Running, which not many people have seen, with Bruce not, Dern. Not Cool of, Runnings. No, not Cool Runnings. Running. So the toboggan could be the, the isolated place. <laughs> but Silent Running is the one where he has... Um, a forest in a dome in space and he has who he do in uh, Louis as little robots that help him just do gardening and it's amazing such a great movie um, last cute. two um, I was going to put Cast Away but then I thought if I want a beardy loner I'm probably going to go for Revenant so I actually put Revenant in the end because I really liked that movie I thought it was brilliant and last, oh, that was not, and last but not least, but my favourite Christmas movie of all time, which is the epitome of being Home Alone. Oh, and that's yeah. Home Alone. Oh, I thought you could say Gremlins. <laughs> it's not isolation. I don't think. <laughs> and it's... Shut Jules 4. But um, anyway, the world is a bit too strange at the moment. Um, so let's not talk about strange things because it's too strange anyway it's so well, weird there's a, few, yeah. a few suggestions if you want to get in the spirit of isolation there guys yeah uh, but that's it more and let us know what yes. you're watching let us know what you're doing as well if you're making things creating things watching yeah. things and listening to, to us things. because it's hard um, so we can't talk to you guys but we can talk on Facebook so please yeah. continue to keep Facebook going because it's important that we keep communicating with each other while all this is going on. And stay, People, in, and stay in the house. Stay inside. Stay in watch horror films. It's fucking perfect for us. Let's stoners and gamers. They're in heaven. Oh yeah. And re and readers. And readers. Yes. And and, and, and film fans. So yeah. Uh, luckily yeah, we have things like done. Netflix and stuff. I'm going through really my list it. to tell you. Bang bang on there and watch that comp or watch that thing and watch and watch this stuff going. That's actually pretty good. Why have I put it off watching that? You know. Yeah, I have over 180 titles on my Netflix watch list, um, so I'll be fine. Um, but I think that's definitely like um, a really important thing is to just try to keep yourselves busy and to try to focus on the good things that you, even if it's rubbish and you can't go out and all this, like, go, well, I've got Netflix, or, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm with my partner, or I don't know, whatever. We can um, video Skype people and, you know. Sure. Mm. It is, it is. It's a strange world. Strange world. Uh, Bill, do you want to take us out? Bill, please. please. That's all the time we've got for this week on World of Strange. Next week, though, give me Ira. Hairless pets. Weird. <laughs> and we're back. Well, that was uh, episode 87. Uh, 87. It's been a pleasure having you here, Kate. Thank you so Thanks, much guys. for Thank joining much. us. Did you enjoy yourself? I had a great time. I absolutely loved it. Thank you so much again for, for having me. And um, thank you to the listeners for putting up with me. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, and I, I say I might post some links of stuff of stuff. Um, but yeah, hopefully you found all the bits that I said interesting and not uh, <laughs> earthly dull. Um, but no, I had a great time. Thanks so much, both of you. And thank you for, um, you know, opening our, our ears and our minds and eyes to uh, a woman's point of view and a lot of things and the trouble you know, is Kate makes us look really unresearchery ish now <laughs> I think We're you'll find that I just basically there. cemented myself as the biggest nerd like it's not <laughs> it's, it's definitely a reflection on me and not you guys don't worry <laughs> my notes are dark deep moist hole you know things like that so it's better yeah. that you to break it down my a notes, more I've just Through written I have yeah. I've just written I hate Juno a hundred times on a bit of paper. That was my notes for the descent. I hate yeah, mine's well, just Juno. fuck off, Juno. Just fuck off. Uh, so yeah. um, fantastic. There we go. Uh, as we keep saying throughout the episode, stay safe, guys. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks as always for listening. We will try and put out a few more regular ones. Obviously, it's difficult at the moment. Um, some of us are very busy and some of us aren't and it's just all of that the way it goes but um, next episode is episode 88 and it's my birthday episode and I know we keep changing the schedule but obviously we didn't realise it was going to be a pandemic but the episode 88 is going to be because uh, it's my birthday I've picked two Rob Reiner directed Stephen King movies there can only be two and that is Stand By Me and Misery and not the virus films we were going to do we're 
gonna yeah we're gonna push back 28 days later just because it might seem a little poor taste for now so we will cover that again and very soon but i think we're just gonna try and keep things nice and light for the next few episodes as much as we can mm -hmm. um so that everybody can feel happy staying inside <laughs> so that's next episode i can't i don't really want to confirm anything after that so definitely next episode is my birthday that's what we're doing stephen king rob reiner gonna be good kate you're excited about that one aren't you very excited huge stephen king fan and um love those movies um so yeah very excited cool i'll just do the little bit of admin and credits and then we can say our goodbyes then guys all right all right so as always the podcast on haunted hill is a proud member of legion podcasts you can find us on legionpodcast.com um, we're most active on facebook though if you just search the podcast on haunted hill that's where you can join our family of weirdos and talk to us all online all day long about what you're watching what you aren't watching what you love what you hate and everything else in between um you can also go to the legion pod, uh, pod facebook page as well and that will t help you to find a million other podcasts all related to horror or not some of them are related to uh, mental health music um pop pop culture a million a million honestly there's you broke up it said you it sounded like you said men's health mental health men, men's health test yeah. t checking your testes <laughs> um, we are also we can be found in most places podknife.com the pod being at the podcast addict app itunes or whatever it's called now i keep forgetting that what it's called twitter you can find us on at Haunted Podcast. We're also um, on Spotify and YouTube, excitingly. Um, and as always, we're on Patreon. And we always want to thank our two patrons, RJ McCready and Lemmy Out, for helping. If you want thank to you join Connie. Thank you, Connie. Patreon and you want to donate even just a pound a month, it would really help us. You don't have to, though. We don't like asking for money. But any of everything any of this will help so there we go and you can help legion if you want to generally just help legion you across the board legion they've too. also got their patron as well yes because we thank so, them obviously for putting putting us up and putting up so with us legion mm. and bow always thank you to bow yes always oh, bow is good egg so there we go guys uh anything else you want to say before we say it's a good night from god who's it good night from no for once i have nothing to say well, I'd like to say it's a fuck off from Juno. Oh. It's uh, a goodbye from vagina chest. Oh, God. Goodbye from moist holes. <laughs> goodbye from phallic rock phallic tights. Phallic tights? <laughs> yeah. Phallic tights. Did phallic you say tights. phallic tights? I like that. I like that. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. You well, win, Kate. Well done. Wordplay. Uh... Um, there we go. Cool. Uh, all right. Well, it's a good night from me. And it's a good night from me. That's a good night from me. Stay Brilliant. safe, people. Um, uh, yeah. That's, stay safe. <laughs> Send in lots of virtual hugs and love and stay safe, everybody, please. See you soon. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you for listening to the podcast on Haunted Hill. We will be back again real soon.